Welcome back to the Belgian roller coaster for the second consecutive weekend here on the iRacing service. The summer of GT3 action continues here on RaceBot TV as for the very first time, the Virtual Racing School and the Sports Car Open teams team up for a 24 hours of spa with $10,000 in prize money on the line. My name is Arjuna Kankipati, delighted to be joined by the other voices in the SCO Sprint Challenge competition, Lewis McLeod and Samuel Aurora, as we get set for 24 hours where drivers will be fighting for their lives. Delighted that we can go here, Lewis, because it's been a very fun summer of action so far. Three weeks of the Sprint Masters and Sprint Challenge series are done. We get a slight summer break, but it's by no mean a off season for the drivers. No, that's it. It's all, all to play for. In that championship, they, like I say, they've, they've done three weeks back to back. They're going to get ready to do another three weeks back to back later on in the season. But like you say, that off season, they are still racing hard right here, right now. A day of racing. We are here at Spa. It's going to be a good one. And Samal, I mean, it, it's such a great track. We saw the 24 hours of Spa on the iRacing official service last time around, but a lot of these teams sat out that one, focusing on this, because let's be honest, two 24-hour races in consecutive weekends is, is hard on the body, hard on the mind, and these drivers need to be on top of their games with the level of competition we have here today. 100% Arjuna, so many teams skipping that one, but there are so many teams who have also done the double and I can only wonder what it's going to be like for them. Most of them say, well, it's not too bad if you get to sleep schedules right. That's going to be a major factor. Plus, here, the grid, the quality of the teams and drivers up ahead, I can't wait to see how they stack up. And let's talk a little bit about the BOP. I mean, that's always a, a talking point when it comes to a competition like this. The team at SCO have done so much work trying to get these cars balanced correctly so that we have a fair competition among the six manufacturers represented and ultimately Lewis. We've seen it be a rather interesting task in the Sprint Masters. I think here today, though, uh, drivers, they always love to complain, but the team have done a pretty good job. The Ferrari and the Porsche, they seem to be two of the strongest cars, though, even with all of this work. Well, the thing is, with the, when it comes to, to balance performance, it's it's easier to balance for a sprint series, for something where you're talking of uh, 40 minutes, hour-long races, something like that, where uh, if your car's a couple of tenths off a lap, then whilst it's bad, it's not the end of the day. When you think of it in a 24-hour race, though, you've got a car that's two tenths a lap slower, two tenths a lap faster, whichever way you're on it, that gap becomes uh, exponentially large towards the end of the race. Of course, you know, you're talking laps difference once we reach the checkered flag tomorrow. Uh, and that's why some of the teams will be complaining. But, you know, that, that is, it is what it is. You know, you've made your bed, you lay in it, you get on with it. We're, we're, that's, that's what we sign up for. And what are these drivers fighting for? Well, $10,000, it is great to have a major prize pool in addition to the $25,000 in the six rounds of the SCO Sprint Masters and ultimately some more $3,000 to our race winner. It does have to be split amongst the drivers, whether that be three or four, but we know there's a lot on the line here today. There absolutely is, and not just in terms of the prize money, which is quite a fair bit when you compare to all the other sim racing competitions, but also in terms of the pride, Arjuna. Just take a look at the grid right here. It is literally an all-star race. Just to get one up over the others, how big of a win is that psychologically as well? We've got the likes of Team Redline joining in the fun. Uh, lots of your regular SEO Sprint Masters competition as well. And ultimately, it is a, a, a championship where uh, over the course of three races so far, Lewis, we have seen the grid be exceptionally close. The question I have for you is, can anyone stop VRS Coanda? Because the two major teams that we've seen are the 91 and the 93 in the SEO Sprint Masters. They're teaming up now. It's going to be interesting to see just how quick they are. We get to see Redline out in action today, so I'm sure we'll see some sort of uh, difference to the normal blend that we have. But, I mean, what has been one of the trends of the season so far? Whether we're going to see it again today, we'll have to wait and see. But you know, we've spoken about the, the starting from seconds always good. But the main one we've talked about is about car team-to-team -team contact. We have seen that time and time again. Are we going to see that today between the commander guys? And well, let's also talk about Redline. It's great to have them in the competition. No Max Verstappen, uh, who was competing in the official iRacing 24 last weekend. Unfortunately, he's got this pesky commitment called Formula One and uh, a certain Grand Prix they have. There's a look at the Ferrari. They are currently the fastest in this practice session. A, a 218-486, almost two tenths clear of the rest of the field. So it's gonna be interesting. They've also got the team Redline Blue Machine 
that we'll be seeing in action. One thing that we should talk about a little bit, there's no LEGO giveaway this time around for this 24-hour race, but just a reminder that over the course of the summer, you've been able to win one of these wonderful LEGO Technic 911 RSR kits. There will be three more to be given away in the final three rounds. Here you can see Lewis and I had a little bit of a build-off. It is really a big, big toy. It's a lot of fun to build as well. Lewis did win the build-off despite all the uh, shenanigans that maybe I was putting his way. But I tell you what, we had the opportunity, just like we did in the SEO Sprint Masters, to get around this track with one of our competitors. Let's go take a look at Spa Franco Shop with Mac Backham. Welcome to the VRS Circuit Walk for the VRS SEO 24 Hours of Spa. I am VRS driver and coach Mac Buckham. I am driving the number 92 LEGO Technic Esports car this weekend in the Porsche 911 GT3 R. Ethic Spa is a circuit that really needs no introduction. It's the home of such a multitude of different racing disciplines. Uh, it has such a unique layout that it gives amazing racing ability. Um, it allows for so many different setup options to work just because of the layout. And it really has its own fair share of legendary corners in motorsport. So let's take a dive uh, into a lap and I'll show you around, see what we're going to be dealing with uh, in the coming 24 hours. Okay, so we start off the lap with a really good passing opportunity in La Source. A uh, sharp right hander, you can dive up the inside of someone here, but at the same time you can also kind of sit behind them a little bit longer, uh, get a run on the exit, get their slipstream, and then pass them in the full throttle section coming up ahead. Out of the source, we're going to start uh, to head for Arouge, one of the most famous, if not the most famous, corners in all of motorsports, um, and then kind of sidestepping the confusion of what is Arouge and Radion. I think the lore of this corner uh, speaks for itself. Full throttle, as you can see in the GT3 cars, however, when you have dirty air, um, you can be pushed a little bit wide, you're coming in a little bit hotter, it might not be as easy. Out of Eau Rouge, onto the Camel Straight, we go into Le Combe, also one of the best sections of the track. Really provides good racing. Uh, once you're on the inside of someone here, uh, you're going to be on the outside for the next corner and vice versa, of course. So you're constantly switching between advantage and disadvantage, uh, which makes for really good side-by-side -side racing. Now going into the final section of the track, uh, first is Tavolo that's coming up right here. Really important, we want to take this full throttle right away um, because this uh, leads us onto another full throttle section because the next right-hander here is also going to be uh, full throttle. So after Stavolo, we have to do no more braking. We want to set cars up for a run here. You can slowly crawl up to another car in front here. Passing in Blanchimont is kind of a no-go. Uh, this is almost never going to work. Um, so you really want to make sure that you're really close to someone here in Blanchimont stick as close as possible through the corner and then set them up for the run on the exit here heading into the bus stop another really good passing opportunity especially on the last lap uh, both inside and outside works here especially on the last lap when you don't have to worry too much about the exit here um, you can really go on the outside of the initial braking zone and set people up uh, for a run to the start finish line so now let's have a look at an onboard lap around spa in our number 92 lego technic esports porsche 911 gt3r Okay, so starting our lap here, we want to make sure that we get a good run um, onto the start-finish straight. Positioning our car on the left-hand side of the track for braking, really hard braking zone, really tricky first gear corner. Um, tricky to get the exit right because we're kind of traction limited in first gear, but we do need to get a lot of power down on the exit to carry that with us uh, onto the long full throttle section coming up ahead. Going into Arouche, uh, we position ourselves on the right-hand side of the track here, making sure that we kind of open up the entry of Arouche, clip uh, the curb on the inside, Really extend the entry as much as possible and then carry uh, in the straight as possible line through our roof to really maximize the speeds uh, in the mid and the exit of the corner to carry that onto the camel straight here. Then we're going to be heading into Lacombe. Car on the left hand side of the track, you can either brake on top of the curb or you stay off it uh, and then clip the curb on the inside here. Third gear, make sure that you climb on both curbs, on both the right and the left hander. And then for all corners, you want to be on the outside of the track when turning in. So you really set every single corner up here uh, by taking the previous corner a little bit easier. Rivage, tricky downhill, uh, very understeery, second gear, uh, hook the car to the insides and keep it rather tight on the exit. No name, left-hander, clip the curb on the in uh, entry here on the inside and then on exit, uh, all of the curb as well, but be careful for the grass on the outside. Wuhan, you can climb on top of the curb on the outside as well or not. Uh, both lines work and carry a lot of speed on the entry. And then it's really tricky to kind of get the car uh, stable and balanced through the mid corner. I think this is called Pith Path. Third gear again. You want to make sure that we stick to the right side curb um, to open up the left hander here. And you climb on top of both curbs again. So very similar to Lacombe in a way, just slightly faster. 
Stavolo, important to climb on top of the curb on the left hand side, uh, turn onto the apex and then focus on getting the power down as soon as possible because we're going to be full throttle as soon as we exit uh, that right hander so good exit there is vital. Small little breather now as we go uh, into Blanchimont we're going to position our car completely on the right hand side of the track very tight section of the track but also high speed so we go on the right to maximize the entry of the corner six gear little bit of a lift and then climb on top of the curb on the exit setting our run up into the bus stop braking really hard a little bit off the di diagonal line flip the apex on the inside uh, both kind of laid apexes here on both apexes of the bus stop and then set yourself up for a good run onto the start finish line and that is a lap at spa francorchamps thanks for watching this edition of the vrs circuit walk for the vrs seo 24 hours of spa uh, I think it's going to be a really great race, and I think with $10,000 on the line, we're going to have some of the best in the world duke it out for 24 hours long. And uh, thanks for tuning in, and I hope to see you guys this weekend. It is man versus machine versus the clock itself. Let's go trackside here from Spa Francochamps to take a look at our starting grid for the VRS SCO 24 Hours of Spa. And on pole, it's the man himself, Joshua Rogers, the king of qualifying, Puts it on the front row. Charlie Collins, the young Welshman, lines up on his outside. Two of your championship favorites in the SEO Sprint Masters. Maximilian Beneke qualifies for Team Redline in third position, alongside Alejandro Sanchez for the MSI Esports squad. Luke Akita for Bela Racing Euronics. They've had a difficult season in the Sprint Masters. What can they do here for 24 hours in Spa? Urano Esports in the 94, they'll complete row number three. With seventh position going to Roman Grosjean's team, Vlad Kimichev will take them to the starting grid in their Porsche. Logitech Gialtas in the 43 in eighth position with Moreno Sarika for Williams and MSI, the second of their cars on the edge of the top 10. It's a difficult qualifying session for the Apex Racing Team Lamborghini. Kevin Ellis Jr. will line up in 11th with Chris Lollum in the second of the Red Line Ferraris, sharing that row in 12th. Ross McFarlane, Pure Sims Esports, 13th position with Ben Deval in 14th. Five Star Motorsports make a debut in SEO competition from 15th position with DV1 Triton Racing rounding out row number eight. Logitech Gialtas in 17th with Fuga Simsport in 18th, making the step up to this level of competition with Core Sim Racing and Porsche Sport on the edge of the top 20. Bavano Sim Racing Impulse, 21st and 22nd with Pure Sims and ERT in 24th. 38 cars to make our way through and the cars are already rolling. So Arnage Competition, Beeler Racing Team, Euronics 25th and 26th with 5 Star Motorsport, a second one of their cars, and MB Racing Nordic in 27th and 28th. Pure Sims Orion, they round out the top 30 cars with ASR with Abel in 31st, an all-Canadian crew, P1 Esports in 32nd, Chaos Ladding Gamers, and Phoenix Racing Esports in row number 17, Satellite Racing. Great to see them in today's competition with Volante sharing a row with them, with the final row being Race Clutch and Carbon Simsport. We don't have much time, so Lewis, it's time for one of your famous predictions. Let's get one from you very quickly. Second place looks good, the Logitech Technic Esports team, but I'm actually going one behind that. I'm going the 71 team red line red car. I think that's going to come out on top today. And what about you, Samuel? Very quickly here. MSI, it's been a while since I've seen them win. I want to see them do something special here today. Should be fun. Here we go, out of last source. Turn number one will be a rouge for today's race. And what a sight that should be with 38 cars ready to rumble at the Belgian roller coaster. We are racing for the VRS SEO 24 hours of spa. And already there's almost four wide in the background. Meanwhile, out front, the two teammates trying to get themselves single file. But look, Maximilian Bedeke is menacingly in the rear view mirrors. And that second MSI Ferrari trying to make some headway as well. Down the Camel straight, we will fly. And here comes the move from that Ferrari. Ferrari. They are side by side in front of the Urano Esports Audi. As look at this, Beneke tries to split the difference. Nothing doing there. The teammates will still continue to be side by side, but look at MSI full of confidence and Beneke down to fourth position. Very clean start there, I believe, Lewis. We're now working our way into this middle sector at Spa.
Yeah, Sanchez did a really, really good job there just to take advantage of Beneke not really uh, firing it into the Coanda bunch. The top two, obviously, running cleanly, running side by side and halting the progress, uh, progress of everyone behind. Uh, Yannick Lapchan's done a decent job on the start in that Lamborghini, by the way, for Logic Gialtas Esports was going side by side with Vlad Kimichev uh, coming through Malmody as well. So pretty tight all the way through. And you can see even here on the run down the pool, plenty of side by side in the mid pack. In some incredible squeezing going on. It's very early, and of course, a 24-hour race is much easier to lose the race than it is to win at this point in time. But they are getting the elbows out, and look at this action, Sommel. I mean, some of these drivers do need to remember 24 hours with no safety cars. You can't afford to lose too much time to your race leaders at this point in time. 100%, but they are the best of the best on the iRacing Road service, so I have no doubt that they will be able to keep it clean. The intensity has been there, but so has been the cleanliness, and so far it has been quite the start. I didn't get enough time to give my prediction, so I'm going to go a bit different to what the other two guys have said. I'm going Redline and Beneke, of course, very strong uh, just a week ago in that official uh, 24 hours of spa put on by the iRacing team. But to complete lap number one, it is a Kawanda one and two. Joshua Rogers leads his teammate Charlie Collins. MSI and Alejandro Sanchez able to get onto that final step of the podium. There's still some further side-by-side -side action just behind the Logitech G uh, Altus Audi. That's five-star motorsport squeezing core sim race onto some alternate track limits as oh there's a car already coming down on towards pit road not sure if there's potentially a penalty from that start but some incredible action i think some three wide down into eau rouge and radion we are starting 24 hours of action here today and this is the big bit here because watch the slipstream from uh, i mean to be fair from everyone but most uh, importantly the likes of msi esports up and over the top as we'll see the carbon lamborghini into the pit lane already i think might be an uh, issue with that jumps up but this is where it gets tight, tight and tense. It's about weighing up whether you're going on the attack or whether you're just consolidating your current position and saving fuel. Can give an update that it was actually a penalty for not setting a time in the grid setting session, of course, because there's no manual gridding as MSI down the inside almost of that Lego Technic Porsche. Oh, Charlie Collins wasn't having any of it for that point in time, but the Carbon Simsport Lamborghini was required to set a manual time in order to grid up the field. No manual grids for team sessions here on the iRacing service. So a very early penalty is going to make the next 23 hours and 55 minutes very, very difficult. Sommel, it is interesting to come here to Spa because for so many years, as oh, look at this, too wide, too deep, coming in towards Speaker's Corner, the scene of many an off-track yesterday. And that's Pure Sims potentially losing a position to... I'm not exactly sure which car that would be in 21st. That's Mavano and oh, slowdown penalty clearly oh, for Michael man. Evdoka. Yep, cut the corner a little bit, seems like, on the entry, and that is where they get hit. And I love how it, how close everyone is at the start. So even though you make one small error, get one small slowdown penalty, you get swallowed up by five or six cars in an instance. Got to love how competitive things are. And imagine how tricky it is to come back up from that, right? These are such strong teams. Getting back all these six positions might be crazy for them right now. Exactly, and to kind of get to the point that I was trying to get to before we saw that crazy 2 wide 2 deep action, Lewis. For years, Spa has been an off-track magnet, if you will. I've done races where teams have had so many incidents, they've broken the iRacing results page. I think at one point, a team had 2,400 incidents over 24 hours. No longer such a big consideration because the iRacing team has put in a new version of the track limits as fast as lap does go to the man himself, Joshua Rogers, with a 218.931. But they put in this new system that's a lot more realistic in terms of the track limits at a place like Spa. It means you have a little bit more leeway, but you still have to be careful in today's race. 200 incidents does get you a drive through penalty. Yeah, it's more uh, consistent car to car. Let's go with that. It's uh, a, a lot more when you cut. And it always used to be a thing around here where you, you'd go off track, you get a 1X, you think that wasn't a 1X, whereas now it's a bit more like, ah, yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, by the way, they're quite tight up the front with that top four. We saw them coming off uh, uh, Radion there pretty tight. And MSI Esports are going for second position at the moment, going down the inside of the LEGO Technic Esports team ahead of this for second position. But Team Redline will be a part of this as well. Watch Beneke on the cutback on that run down to Rivage out of Malmody. No uh, decent exit, though, between the two Ferraris. And they'll hold third and fourth between them. Will say, by the way, biggest loser on the start, uh, Sven Hasser did not catch what happened uh, to the Bela Ray racing team Euronix 4 car but they are all the way down in 31st place at the moment wow I'm 
I'm pretty sure they started from pit lane, just being a bit safe and cautious on the start. So we'll try and get an update on the Beeler Racing Team, of course. The four rings synonymous with a place like this and trying to get a win in this Evo car that runs in the real world. I think it's the only one of the Audis that has not won at this historic race. Of course, the real world race is taking place this weekend, so we're glad that you're choosing to spend at least part of your weekend watching experience with us. Look at Moreno Sarika in the Williams Esports BMW. We've seen them in a Porsche in the SCO Sprint Masters, but making the switch to uh, what is a very stable car. It's getting a run around and testing in the real world this weekend. Not in competition just yet, but we'll see them in action in 2022. This BMW M4 Sommel, it's such yeah. a fun car to drive in some ways. I know a lot of people aren't a fan of it, but it gives you a lot of stability. It gives you the confidence to really rag it around a racetrack. You're absolutely right. For, for drivers like me, who are not quite the best in the world, it's easy to get on with the M4 in comparison to the other cars. As, and you're absolutely right with that. It inspires a lot of confidence out of you. And even at the top level as well, Arjuna, we saw recently that the M4 can be quite competitive. Here today, teams are, well, they haven't quite been able to make it work perfectly fine. And, and a part of it can be credited to BOP, but I think it can potentially come in later on. We've got to wait and watch, to be honest. Can't say as things are right now. And of course, this is a race, it's not a sprint race like we've been seeing in the SEO Sprint Masters where two one-hour races over the course of each weekend does mean that it's a slightly different consideration when it comes to the cars. Here you'll have double stinting on the tires and things like that, so it's very important to make sure that you keep control of your car and you're looking at the side-by-side. -side. I can tell you out front, this time around, no real opportunity for MSI Esports to try and get the dive done on LEGO Technic, which they've been able to do the last couple of times around. Instead, it's the second of the Team Redline cars making it look very easy down the inside of Le Combs, Lewis. Yeah, that was a pretty nice move from Chris Lullen to get by the Williams Esports. They've had a good uh, couple of weeks, uh, to be perfectly honest, of Williams Esports. I believe they were the... Oh, as there's three wide running into Lake Coma. Get back to that with Volante getting down the inside on a Ferrari and a Lamborghini. That was tight. That's uh, not normally... Oh, I guess it's not normally where we see three wide. We do see plenty of it there, but not normally where we see them all depart the corner. And you can see not very happy behind the wheel of, uh, of the Volante car was uh, Michael Pedersen. Uh, clearly that weaving is like, yeah, let's not do that again, shall we? I think there may have been a little bit of bumper-to-bumper -bumper contact between the Pure Sims, a Ferrari, and that Volante car. This is on the edge of the top 30, so just an indication of how strong this field is. As continuing to drop down the order, I think, is the MB Racing Esport Nordic car. I've seen a Jarl Tien, who, of course, had an interesting flip at the Circuit de Barcelona Catalunya when they went three wide, and, well, that ended in tears for at least a Jarl and Jack Cedric. Meanwhile, left-hand side of your screen, coming up the hill out of Stavolo, and now through the curve, Paul Fred. This is that long run all the way into Blanchemont, one of the toughest, I shouldn't say toughest, but a confidence sample that you need a corner that you need confidence to get through consistently over 24 hours it is almost flat in a gt3 car it literally is it is such a hard and such a fast corner and it's so so difficult to nail the entry to Blanchimont as well sometimes. You, you, you've got to be so aware of how the car is feeling and how much speed you can carry into it. And just to let you know about the margins, a slight error and boom, you could have a crash at what? 200 kilometers per hour over there or maybe even more. Oscari Rene, we jump on board with the core sim racing number 30. Interesting to see how some of these cars have switched around from their regular season entries. Of course, core sim racing have two Ferraris and a Mercedes in the Sprint Masters, but they've made their way into the Lamborghini and really does bring up one of the fun things that we're seeing here, Lewis, is that the grid is not chock-a-block with the same manufacturer like we sometimes see in official events. Just like we have for the Sprint Masters, there is a limited allocation of each manufacturer available, and it meant that during the pre-qualifying process, you did have to decide which car you wanted to commit to. Yeah, there was another one. Uh, Logitech Gialtas Esports. We've seen them run uh, very nicely indeed in the BMW M4. They've taken the Lamborghini and an Audi uh, for this, which is a bit different for them, but uh, clearly working with it quite well. See so a little bit of progress uh, that needs to be made, but still running around in 7th and 15th uh, for, for them, which is 
you know, at, the, at this point in the race, that's fine. Although there is one thing that might be a bit of a concern. Obviously, we're very, very early in the race, so I doubt it in an extreme way. But we have got a breakaway here. The two Coanda cars of the VRS Coanda Simsport and the uh, Lego Technic Esports car, the MSI Esports Blue, who, by the way, did very well right now, and Team Red Line Red, as we see uh, the Pure Sims car. That's going to be a hefty crash from the barrier. There we go. Uh, those those four have pulled away to about two seconds in the first 10 minutes of the race to the, the chasing pack. That's quite a big margin at this point. It really is, especially with the margins as fine as, well, I, I have a feeling there was more three wide action down into Lacombe and, well, ended in tears this time around, at least for the Pure Sims Ferrari. Significant damage to the front end of Michael Evdoka, and you'd have to assume that the number 17 will be down onto pit road to get some sort of, of damage repairs. Now look, though, as the second of the Team Redline cars, it's Chris Lollum lurking menacingly in the rear view mirror of Yannick Lapchin. I think a little bit too far behind to make a move. And in fact, in front of him, it's RHG in their Porsche trying to get fifth position away from Urano and Nick Schulte with some and nothing doing, at least for now. But really, if these guys want to fight and to try and get up the grid, they're just going to lose a little bit more time to that group in front of them. So will we'll make the job a little bit harder to close the gap down. 100%. And when you give some sort of room to drivers like Josh Rogers or Charlie Collins, they will run away with it. There's no way you're going to get that back that easily. So it's only smarter for them right now to play the long game, play it a bit more calm. And yeah, that could mean slightly less overtakes. But in the broader sense, we will see the battle elongated for longer. And that's what we all want to see right here. Taking a look at the protest sheet. I have a feeling there's already three different incidents about stuff that's happened and potentially a team Redline trying to get a, a protest done on your race leaders as there goes Redline Blue, there goes RAG as well. Swap for fifth position. It's now the Porsche in front has the hard work to try and chase down the cars in front. That gap is almost three full seconds as Vlad Kimichev will get to work now, Lewis. Yeah, he will, but you've got to keep your eye on the third car in this train, uh, that being Chris Lullen for Team Redline Blue. We know the Redline car is pretty quick. It's running in fourth position at the moment and has the fastest lap of the race, of course, in a very healthy amount of slipstream as well. But you know that 72 car has been charging. Didn't qualify very well, qualified in 12th position, so uh, comfortably outside of the top 10, all things considered. And they are making progress and showing that they are they are a car with decent pace to, to fire up, potentially even into podium contention. But that is a long long way off right now. Right now, it's about making as much progress, about not being held up. And the Urano Esports HP car just hasn't looked like it's had the aggressive speed that all of the others, they're not attacking this like a, like a sprint race. They're attacking it like an endurance race, which sounds like the right thing to do. But right now, you do need to attack it like a sprint race. We talk about it every single time we go endurance racing these days, where you've got to treat it as if it is a sprint race. You've got to attack the track. You've got to attack everyone else's. Oh, that's, uh, that's not very good for your time. No, and it's just, I think, a self-mistake there. Losing the rear end, maybe getting on the grass. Now down seven positions from where the Inex, uh, not the Inex team, excuse me, MB Racing Esport Nordic are uh, started this race. Of course, Tian is competing with Inex Racing as there goes Kevin Ellis Jr. down the inside of Moreno Sarika. Long way around the bus stop chicane, but you can get it done in towards La Source. Sarika slams the door shut, runs a little bit wide and forces Kevin Ellis to wait for the time being. But the Apex Racing Team didn't have the best of qualifying performances, Sommel, and Kevin was a bit disappointed by his own recognition coming onto social media and just saying he didn't nail the lap, but they've been quick this season. That Lamborghini will be trying to charge his way through the field. Yeah, indeed, in the sports car uh, SCO Master Series, Kevin Ellis Jr. and the Apex Team, well, they've shown promise constantly. That That's always been there with the Lamborghini. They've had a few decent race results, but it's not always been where they actually want to Quality pace is there according to them. They just are not able to convert it into races. We see a move here. Nice. That's red line blue making it so easy. It just looks like a little bit more top end grunt to the Ferrari, at least for now. And I do wonder if it makes sense for the RAG Porsche to let that red line blue car go to be able to close in the gap to the cars in the front because it's still three seconds. And if anything, it might start to elongate as we've also seen MSI lose that position to Redline for third spot. So all sorts of change arounds. These Redline cars really on the move. Yeah, they're good in a straight line. That's it. And uh, so important off of that run from La Source uh, down into Le Com and having that run through Malmedy as well. Uh, the Ferraris look pretty pacey in a straight line. It's kind of what we'd expect from them. But uh, realistically speaking, I was more considering Boneca there was 
was quite close to sending it down the inside of Charlie Collins as well. Got actually partially alongside the Porsche uh, for good measure. So, uh, again, they're not waiting around. They are wanting to get on with this race right now. You know the, the likes of, of Josh Rogers is just... I'm not saying he's in cruise mode right now, but I'd suggest there's probably a little bit more time in that Porsche should he need it and is just driving comfortably within the limit right now and trying to keep the train at bay because if he was to accelerate, if he was to, to, to go and attack the track even more than he is now, uh, which will probably be only to the tune of a couple of tenths, by the way, I'm not saying he's going to go a second faster, but the slipstream from the cars behind will be enough to keep them well within contention anyway. So it's almost like there's no real incentive to try and pull away right now. Well, and I, I think what this also does mean is that you get the draft for the cars behind. That means they can save a little bit of fuel. Yeah. Maybe Rogers is trying to do the same thing out front, just extend the stint. There's the look in the Coanda team house. The look of focus on the face of Rogers. He's always so calm under pressure. Sometimes does get a little bit heated, it's it's fair to say, especially when uh, he's got the contact that we've seen sometimes between him and Beneke, for example, in the World Championship Series. But... Philip Stan will be in his ear, just making sure that all things are calm and collected as maybe we'll see Redline up the hill through Radion, trying to get the move done here. Can that Ferrari use the prancing horse to pull alongside, looking rearwards from Rogers? It's actually Collins that's closing up on the race leader. Is the move coming? Nope, he's gonna lift off the throttle and they stay in line for now. Side by side, they are for fifth position. It's that Redline blue machine trying to get around the inside and there he goes. It's now two red line cars into the top five trying to challenge the might of Coanda. Let's see how this thing plays out because now that gap is almost four and a bit seconds, Sommel. Lots of work for Chris Lollum to do. Yeah, indeed, and lots of work on the defending side as well. Right now, you're not seeing RAG and Urano and the likes. Just, just be very aggressive, and they shouldn't be at this stage as well. But maybe later, that's when all the trouble begins. So right now, I think for this train, it's all about just driving as fast as they can and closing up with the others, because once you give them that room, once you give them that leeway, it, it will be so hard to catch up strategy-wise. I mean, what can you do different here? I think right now it's just let the race play out to you. Don't try and force things and, and be too aggressive because, again, I said at the start, it's much easier to lose the race than to win it at this point in time. So you've got that four-car breakaway. You've got a slightly smaller group of cars now from about fifth through 11th positions. They're about two seconds clear of Pearsons and 16 of Ross McFarlane with DV1 Triton Racing being brought along with them. In terms of manufacturers, You've got Porsche in the top two positions. Then you've got three Ferraris, third through fifth. You've got another Porsche before we get to the first Audi of Urano Esports. Then the Lamborghini of Logitech Gialtis Esports. That's the 43 car. You do have a BMW up there in the top 10. I don't think the one car we're having too much of a strong performance though here today is that Mercedes, and we've seen it be fairly quick at times, especially on the start, Lewis, where we've seen some start coordination between the Coanda teammates. But no Mercedes really up there in the top 20. You have to look all the way back to 19th and Fuga Simsport to find the first Mercedes. Yeah, they're just not quite matching the track right now. But, you know, it, it, it's a long race. You just keep plucking away, keep getting on with it and, and just see what you can grab. It does seem at the moment, at least from a, my moderately untrained eye, that the Ferraris are actually seeming like uh, they're very, very comfortable right now. By the way, I think uh, Team Red Line Red, speaking of how raceable they are, they are going to be trying to take second position right now from LEGO Technic Esports. Look at that straight line speed. Might even be able to take the lead as well from VRS Coanda has gone alongside and into second position but that speed almost looked enough to pull him alongside that Coanda car that's leading the way of Josh Rogers. That is impressive. And now, oh, this, this, this is the bit that we look forward to, isn't it? We get to see a battle between Josh Rogers and Max Beneke. And I would suspect that maybe that move is not too far away, given how strong the straight line grunt of the Ferrari is. It is no longer 10K Beneke, by the way. He's officially re returned to the status of 11K Beneke, which just doesn't have the no, same ring, if we're being completely honest. Uh, so, such a strong com uh, field that we've got here. The top four drivers, top five drivers, all above 8,000 I rating, and it really just illustrates how competitive uh, this grid really is. Talking of news, by the way, we are approaching the start of another World uh, Championship qualifying season with the Porsche Tagore Esports Super Cup about to head in towards what is a two-stage qualifying process. 
and I'm not sure. I, I should have probably tried to get some confirmation from the Coanda team house, but my Coanda source, aka Hugo Luis, uh, was unable to confirm for me, Somo. But Charlie Collins, he joined up with the Coanda team last year at the conclusion of the World Championship qualifiers. Mm -hmm. There's another Collins that has now joined the ranks of the Kowanda Juniors, Bryn Collins. I have a feeling that potentially a family member of Charlie. It's great to see <laughs> continued young blood coming to Sim Racing's top level of competition. We'll be watching those qualifiers with keen interest. Oh, 100%. And speaking of Kowanda and their younger drivers, I was astounded in the Sim Racing Grand Prix Championship that we had on Racesport TV to see the amount of young Norwegian youngsters that are part of the Kowanda Junior team. You've got Benjamin Vogelsang, of course, was the star of that lot. And the way they were able to compete with all the other top drivers as well was just insane. And, and I'll tell you their age. Vogelsang is just 13. And at the age of 13, he was able to have such composure in his driving, such measuredness in the way he drove and his race craft. That was just outstanding to watch. And honestly, I can't wait to watch how they perform in the qualifiers that are going to come up right now. So many big names to watch out for. Watch out for this though, Beneke, can he get the move done? Side by side, they will come down the Camel straight. That Ferrari, look at the grunt MSI. They're trying to rob the Technic car of third uh -huh. position. It is now Ferrari one and three. Kawanda has some work to do to try and reclaim their stranglehold at the front of this field. But for now, it's Beneke, the mine in charge. You can see some disappointment on Collins' face. I don't think, Lewis, he expected the late dive from Sanchez there. No, but you've got to expect those kind of things. You've got a car coming very, very quickly onto the rear end of you into the comp when straight line speed from that Ferrari's looking, like I say, it's looking pokey. I think he might be more disappointed that that move has allowed the top two to build a bigger gap. That would be the real proper shake of the head. Right now, it's not panic stations for VRS Commander. Yes, they have lost the lead. Yes, the fastest lap is in the hands of Team Redline, blah, 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 blah. That Ferrari has hit the front. But now, you brought it up earlier about fuel. Now it is Rogers' time to just save a little bit of fuel, to roll it down a little bit, to, to comfortably sit in the slipstream of that Ferrari. As long as it doesn't pull away, you're a happy man. And I will say as well, it would be a lot more interesting in today's race if we had uh, rain and weather cycles in, in the competition. And well, if you're not aware, the iRacing team have teamed up with uh, the National MS Society here in the U.S. to put on a four-hour race at Charlotte. And, well, Steve Myers, one of the executives at iRacing, put the challenge out that donate and I'll answer all of your questions. And I can inform you that Greg Hill has been spilling some secrets that weather and indeed potentially rain is coming sooner than I think we expected to the iRacing service. That would just mean, Sommel, that the rear engine Porsche would have a little bit more of an advantage. We've always seen those Porsches be very, very strong as fast as lap goes to Beneke at 218.674. Yep, Beneke is just piling things on, but you're absolutely right. If the rain comes in, I can't imagine any other car from the Porsche having that much. Maybe the Mercedes, because of how stable it is at times, but yeah, imagine, imagine if the rain actually comes in. But the, but the topic remains all the way the same. Even if high racing takes time with it, it's not like we're all dying for it, right? We can certainly wait for it. But when it just comes in, it just has to make sure that it is quite a good simulation. There's no need for some hurried projections of that. We, we don't want something that's not too good. I, just, I think they should just, uh, I've, I've always said this before, I was having a chat with friends and whatnot is that they should just introduce the weather into iRacing without telling anyone and then just randomly <laughs> switch it on in a race. That would really kill some people, exactly. wouldn't it? Uh, hopefully not in a public race, Lewis, let's be honest. We, we don't what need about that this sort one? of chaos thing. Oh, I think in a field like this, you could very <laughs> much do that. And that would be a lot of fun, but, but maybe not in some of those public races. Because, uh, I, for example, this track spa, I've got a, me and my team have a pretty torrid record of getting to the end of these races. I don't think we need any sort of, of other issues to try and affect anything in, in that regard. Uh, talking of the gap out front, by the way, that move from MSI really did open up the gap between the top two and the chasing cars behind. It's now almost a full second between Redline and MSI. And the second Redline car, Lewis, has not been able to really close the gap just yet. If you give it a little bit more time, I would not be surprised to see the 72 challenging for podium contention. Yeah, uh, they they need to just make a bit more progress, need to find a bit more speed. But I think this is it, though. Once the, the other red line car, the 71s, hit the front, now we're seeing them start to turn it up just a little bit. And then that gap, which had already built out to four seconds, whilst uh, they had to, the 72 had to work their way to the front of that field. It's, it's just now starting to build once again. It's out to, like you say, about four seconds now. 
Uh, it was around about that point, but they're just not. I was more expecting them to match the 71 speed more so than everything else. We'll say, by the way, the uh, we were you, you said that there was a bit of a report and uh, you know race control had to look at some stuff uh, in consideration to the 91, uh, and I believe uh, it's a bit of a spelling error, but we'll go with it. Uh, a warning for the 91 exceeding what I'm going to assume is the speed limit before the green flag. So uh, just a warning. But still, you know, you're already, you've got the eyes of race control on you. That's uh, not, the, not the way you wanted to start a 24-hour race. It's great to have live race control. And indeed, it was uh, exceeding the, the 60 kilometer an hour, uh, what do you want to call it here? Uh, speed limit coming out of La Source down into the starting zone. And well, I think the only mitigating factor was the fact that Joshua Rogers realized in time back that car off. And, now means we are treated to this wonderful fight for the race lead. I don't think the move is coming. Rogers knows what endurance racing is about. Might even give a bit of a bump draft to the car in front at some point in time. But he knows, Samuel, that he's much better off saving fuel at this point in time, not allowing the cars behind to close back up and to just try and see what he can do on strategy. Because that red line car is really looking strong out front. It absolutely is the Ferrari. Well, the Branson horse does seem pretty well fed here this weekend. But no, coming back to the point of endurance racing, unlike the World Championships, when we normally end up seeing Redline versus Coanda, where we normally end up seeing Beneke versus Rogers, here the race is not 24 minutes long, it's 24 hours long. So you've got to measure your strategy properly in this case. And that's what Rogers was doing right now. He could have gotten past Beneke right now on the back stretch. But yeah, he started to wait now, he started to go for the long game. And I think. That has to be the smartest move right now. But even still, even though they're saving, watch how much of a gap they've pulled out to all the others as well in the background. It's now five seconds between the red line counterpart. So, yeah, that gap has extended. And if anything, over the last lap or so, the 72 car has been unable to close on these top four cars. And MSI has done a great job to just try and close that gap in as they run very wide through the second part of Stavlo, looking rearwards from your race leader, Max Pineke as we climb up the hill in towards Blanchemont. It's a fun corner and the slightest of lifts as you throw yourself down onto the inside apex and you can see different lines being taken very slightly from the Porsche versus Ferrari, but now it's still only a tenth of a second between these two cars as MSI and Alejandro Sanchez continues to close that gap. Watch out for the Spaniards down the hill in towards Lacombe. Oh, this is going to be a pass soon, and I'm not talking about the 91 and the 71. I'm talking about the 47 fastest lap of the race on nice. the previous lap. That is half an hour into this stint. And Alejandro Sanchez, after getting by the Lego Technic Esports car, a bit of a shake of the head from Charlie Collins, but he's dragged them back into the mix. So uh, incredible lap times coming in from that MSI Esports Ferrari. So, I mean, this is what you were talking about, someone as well, how, how strong they are looking as a team and uh, it's why they are right up in contention of the race on board look i think he might be just a, a little bit too far behind this time around but that fastest lap does indicate the pace is there you can see the gap between Kowanda and redline is literally nothing maybe it's some of that bump drafting i was talking about just about seven kilometers ago but 30 minutes into this race it is a four-way fight for the race lead and it could be anyone's game because again we're not trying to just repeat it for the sake of repeating it but 23 hours and 30 minutes to go. It's much easier to lose this race than to win it at this point in time. And all of these drivers do know that the, the three drivers out front, all world championship competitors and for someone like Alejandro Sanchez, it's been a rocket of the last couple of years. MSI Esports team working with Apex Racing in 2020, that propelled him to third place in the championship with three wins in 2020. A bit more of a dip, difficult run for Sanchez in 2021, just 12th in the standings. He will be locked into the 2022 edition of the Porsche Tag or Esports Super Cup. Top four separated by just one second now, Samuel. These guys are really putting on a show. But if you're Charlie Collins, how do you approach this point of the race? Watch and wait. I think they've got enough pace in the back to just keep up with this pack. And that's what they need to do, to stay within one second. Because if you're not within that one second, you don't get the draft. And that is going to be the major factor. I mean... There's no difference if you, I mean, of course there is, but there's no difference if you're, say, a second and a half behind this pack or you're the one leading. Essentially, you don't get any fuel saving, any tire saving done in that case. So for Charlie Collins, just stay where he is right now. I think it's not a very bad position to be in. And as we all, as we have mentioned constantly, no need to attack Alejandro Sanchez. But Alejandro Sanchez is the need to attack right now. He's getting ever so close. 
One more look on board with the Spaniard as we climb up across the start finish line and take a look at what will happen here down the hill out of La Source. This is such an important traction zone down the hill you can sometimes just light up the rear tires and we have seen cars spin around out of this turn number one but here we go it's only three tenths of a second between second and third and i think the ferrari is going to make this one look rather easy of course i must also point out by the way after starting on pit lane sven Halsa has done a really impressive job in the 46 car already up to 23rd position still potential i would say for maybe a top 15 if not a top 10 finish for the Bela racing team 46 though here comes sanchez here comes the draft down the camel straight rogers i think is already on the brakes just to let msi through and there goes the 47 now challenging for the race lead Oh, that was close. That was uh, uh, nearly a proposition. That's exactly what I was talking about a bit earlier with uh, Max Bonecker when he was made the move on this very car that we're on board with. Nearly actually made a dive on one of the Porsches. So we had a Porsche 1 2 earlier. Now we've got a Ferrari 1 2. MSI Esports are up into second spot, and I don't think they're going to be waiting around in the same way that Josh Rogers was. Uh, I think they are looking to take the lead in the early stages. We're you know, just over around about halfway through the first stint of the race, though. So we are getting into to the, the, the nitty gritty, the meaty point of this race, uh, or this, uh, this stint. And, and so now it's the decision as to who's been saving fuel. We know that Josh Rogers has been, so I'm expecting him to go a lap, a, a lap further than maybe the initial expectation. So uh, a, again, you cannot rule, I mean, you can't rule anyone out, obviously, it's just the early stages, but especially of this uh, quartet here, everyone is wildly in contention. I tell you what, Soma, let's have some more fighting between these top fours because that will drag in the likes of Redline, RHG, and Urano into this fight as well. That gap has been holding fairly steady, only five seconds between the two Redline cars. I would be very excited to see what happens if this four-car breakaway becomes, well, a 12-car breakaway. <laughs> that would be wild, won't it? And that's what normally you would expect to see, but so far these four cars have just been on it from the very beginning. And the others, well, they haven't quite taken the same approach, which is a bit surprising considering the quality of all those drivers. But hey, maybe they're going through the longer game, so they've got to wait and watch, and you can't count anyone out at this stage. But I see Rogers be a little more fun this time. Maybe he's inside for a second, too far off this time again. But a word on Alejandro Sanchez, a word on MSI. I said at the start that they're going to be my pick for this race and I think it's been a while since we've seen MSI Esports actually compete in such a top level endurance race and win it. Imagine what sort of result it would be for them after, as you mentioned Arjun, a difficult year in the World Championships. Lewis, correct me if I'm wrong because I know you have a pretty good memory, yeah. but your first ever broadcast on RaceBot TV was earlier this year at the 24 Hours of Daytona. We saw MSI embroiled with a fight with, with Redline for the GTE over, uh, victory in class that time around. But I, if I recall, just at the end of our stint, as we were winding up the first six hours of what we can call a rain delayed race now, I guess, uh, MSI had some sort of technical issue or, or some sort of incident that dropped them down the field. They are always strong in these endurance races, but sometimes you just need luck to go your way. Yeah, I mean, I can't exactly remember what happened. I do remember them being right up there racing hard. The, the, the thing is, with these kind of races, I wouldn't want to say it's easy. I'll roll off that one a little bit wide there at, uh, at speakers. Uh, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's almost easy to come out of the blocks early and, and contend early but it's hard to make that last for the 23 and a half hours left to go. And I know that sounds like a really obvious point, but execution in a race like this is king. More so than ever else. You know that someone on this race, in the, in, on the track right now, is going to have a near perfect race. Who that is going to be, we do not know. Whether it's only one team, two teams, we'll have to wait and see. But everyone at some point you would expect will have some form of issue, whether it's an issue with drivers, whether it's an issue with uh, an incident on track, with uh, track excursions, whatever it is, there will be some form of issue. And it's those teams that avoid that as best as possible, avoid being in the pit lane for longer than, than, than necessary. Those are the ones that always come out on top. And I know it sounds like a, such a silly and obvious point, but it is always, every single time, without shadow of a doubt, the deciding factor in every single endurance race. 
something else that is is crucial at a place like Spa with such a long pit lane, of course, not just this right-hand side, the F1 pits that are, are being used, but down the hill, you go through this hairpin and still have to work your way all the way to the bottom of Eau Rouge before you can get off the speed limiter and get yourself back up to racing speed. You want to minimize your time on pit lane, and so that's where fuel saving can sort of become very, very important with the picture not necessarily being known until the closing stages of this race. It does look like oh. we've got two retirements from this race so far. Michael Abdoka in that Pearsons Ferrari, we, we saw a big incident with him down through Lacombe, the front end of that Ferrari completely missing. A second retirement, I think race clutch in their Porsche 911, some sort of technical issue for them has forced them to drop from the field. Lewis, I think you saw something, because I heard you say, uh, uh, just say something there. Yeah, a little bit concerned there with the line over the top of Radion from MSI Esports, and a little bit concerned by that line from Team Redline out of Malmody. Uh, and I get it, they're pushing their track limits to, to the very edge. But the problem is, with, with if you run over Radion, if you're running this quite aggressive line over the curbs, whilst you can make it work you know, a good few times in a row, one time it will bite you. It'll lift the rears off the road and you'll go for a spin. And it's it's such a high-speed crash that there is nothing you can do. And someone will uh, will come a cropper to that, I can assure you of it. It's just who it's going to be. And again, in, the, in this group, I get it, you know, early stages, you want to run hard, but that's a level of risk that I would not be taking right now. Well, again, I, we say it a lot, Lewis. There's a reason why we're commentating and not driving yeah. when it comes to some of these drivers. So I would say I, I got a bit concerned, but I, I also think that especially in that Ferrari, as long as you're managing your, your inputs correctly, it's a car that very much, if you get the weight transfer wrong, it will, like you say, bite you and, and, and spin you around. But it is looking strong at this point, the Ferrari, and those guys very much have a, a hyper ship, I would think, underneath them. And, and really, a race like this, you just need to settle into the race, not let... Your emotions get the better of you. You can see running a bit wide through Blanchemont, but no off tracks there. Rogers peeking a nose to the inside, but I think he's going to be patient. Maybe what we will see, Sommel, is the nighttime hours shake things around because we will see the track temperatures drop from 38 degrees Celsius right now to anywhere from 20 to 24 degrees Celsius. And once you get into those nighttime hours as well, Spa is not a track where you have much, if, if any, external illumination. You get lit yep. around the track by your headlights and your headlights alone. Absolutely, and one might say, well, it's the night time, so the temperatures are colder, so the grip levels might be higher, so the lap times are faster. And that's not how it works, really, because so many times the apexes of your corners are hidden by all the darkness. So it becomes quite a hard task for all of these drivers to execute those perfect lap times. And, and I wonder, are we are we good enough to go triple stint? I doubt, but here we are going for a big move here. Alejandro Sanchez wants the race lead and Beneke is happy to concede it to him. The Spaniards are out front. The Spaniards are now in control. And I tell you what, Alejandro Sanchez has looked oh so impressive in the opening stages of this race. If anything though, the Ferraris are looking menacingly here, Lewis, as we almost are at the conclusion of our number one. Yeah, it's the, it comes down to uh, fuel mileage, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, between these drivers to, to see who's going to be making the distance when it comes to that stint. We'll, we'll get a better indication as this rolls on. And you are quite right, Somo, about uh, how hard you're pushing the tyres. You can see, you, you know, we know this from Commander at the moment, that they're not pushing to the, the highest extent of the car. They're saving a little bit of fuel. They're you know, kind of entering the race in a fairly relaxed manner where they've got a good gap to the cars behind where they can control things, yes, from third, but they're still well within touch and distance of the leaders. And once we come into the first pit stop window and the second pit stop window, are we going to see double stinning? Are we going to see triple stinning? What are we going to see uh, from these, these drivers? And when you're looking after it like that, it, if you're well within contention, it, it almost makes it so much easier to even find that little bit extra to gain, that little bit, you know, uh, uh, more fuel, that more tire percentage, that more car looking after whatever it is you just you can balance it better i will say as well this is a track where seven kilometers give or take sometimes you you would think 17 18 laps makes a stint no 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 at some other tracks of course uh, many more laps you get to this is the type of track Samo, where you only get if you're doing a double stint so many opportunities to make mistakes in the corners but by the same token if you're just not feeling comfortable as sanchez with the fastest lap powered by atvo at 218.515 if you're not feeling necessarily comfortable at one point in the track it becomes difficult over the course of your two-hour run to really get yourself 
feeling that extra bit comfortable to get that pace that you need in a race like this. I mean, you're so spot on with that. Take, take the Brussel corner, case in point, the long sweeping right hander that is turn number 10. It's a place that can be a tire killer if you don't get it correctly. And, and it's happened so many times to me, right? I mean, racing right here, not feeling confident with the car and just not taking that one corner correctly can just literally drag the life out of your tire. So the flow is what's so important here at Spa, just getting in that rhythm, just constantly driving, hitting the same markers and in the same turning in points again and again and again just being at one with the car if you're not really sparking chew it on and you're right double stint then becomes so hard and it might not be possible here today with the heat update from race control we saw that contact between volante racing and the pure sims esports ferrari volante racing have a 15 second time penalty to be served they have until 542 in the sim to serve it so that does give them a about an hour and a half, give or take, to actually come down and serve that penalty. Meanwhile, we've been focusing on the gap out front, but let's look at this gap before a gap for sixth and seventh. RHG in their Porsche breaking away very slightly from the Urano Esports Audi. And Lewis, you did mention that the Urano car doesn't necessarily look the most comfortable, but they were strong in qualifying. Who knows when the race will come towards these guys? Yeah, it's like you say, with all these drivers that are a little bit further back uh, in this pack. You can't rule them out right now. You've got to think that they are playing uh, their own longer game. And when that pit stop sequence comes in, we'll see some of these move forward. Which ones? Some, some will move backwards, some will move forwards. I mean, uh, take, for example, moving up from the back of the grid, the uh, Beeler Racing Team Euronix. So you said starting from pit lane, uh, Sven Haas, by the way, did get a warning a bit earlier. As to the other Beeler Racing Club, we'll ignore that for now. Uh, starting from the pit lane, you, you have to kind of assume that when they're going on the attack that hard, they are saving absolutely nothing. They're putting it all out there, trying to, to push this as hard as they can. Whereas some of these drivers, one or two of them are, are, are cruising a little bit more. Urano Esports HP here, they struggled for pace in the earlier stages. Now you can maybe put part of that down to the car, you can maybe put part of that down to, to, the, to the driver, to the team, whatever. You could also put it down to a little bit of strategy as well. Are they taking their foot off the, the gas a little bit, so to speak? Are they controlling things and uh, will come back a bit stronger later on? I'm not so sure. Uh, they were passed fairly easily by, by Quala and that gap has built uh, a fair amount to the red line blue and R8G cars ahead, but they've not exactly disappeared off the rear end of that train, so there's still hope. Meanwhile, out front, down the Kemmel straight, those Porsches are starting to lose ground to the Ferraris, but under braking, that's where Rogers and Collins are able to close the gap. So as we take a look back at the race leaders for just the time being, you can see seven tenths of a second separating four cars. And we're, we're 45 minutes into this one, so hopefully this continues long into this race, into those nighttime hours when things get very, very difficult. It already looks like the lights are on for all of these competitors. It's an automatic thing from iRacing, so officially I guess you can call it sunset, or at least getting uh, towards sunset as we work our way down the double gauche, as they now call it. We're going to call it Puon, because let's be honest, that's the, that's the proper corner name. Uh, this is a track summer where corner names have undergone so many different evolutions uh, that I can remember, and it's always interesting when uh, you talk to various commentators. I remember a conversation between Paul Smith and Martin Haven last year during uh, the Porsche Tag or Esports Super Cup, but they were agreeing on what co uh, corner names they wanted to use on the broadcast, so it's always something where you just try and figure out exactly how you're calling these corners. <laughs> exactly. No, I think I think we have some sort of an agreement here on the broadcast. It's it's not double gauche. It is Puhan. It's it is no name corner as well. It's not X, is it? I mean, that just I mean, of course, Jackie X is a wonderful racing <laughs> driver, one of the greats of the sports car racing world. But no name. It's just become iconic now. Maybe you're going to get yourself in trouble, mate. <laughs> I well, am. Well, I, I've sl slightly been referring to it as Speaker's Corner as uh, Logitech G Altus Esports That's down the inside that? of Urano. And now I think maybe going to be swarmed from the Williams BMW behind. Lots of lights flashing as they dive their way in towards La Source. Can also see the RHG Porsche was getting a slightly better line in towards this turn number one to try and get the move done on the red line Ferrari in front. Down the hill they plunge. The potential moving coming here. Watch out for Lamborghinis to try and get something done on this BMW. 
Yeah, there's uh, plenty of pace though. Yeah, that that M4 is pokey enough. You've said it's quite quite a consistent car to drive. It uh, you know it bounces off the curbs really nicely. It just it, it, it drives in a way that is is fairly predictable, but it also has a decent amount of straight line speed, and that's going to keep that Lamborghini at bay. I was, I'll go back to my point, by the way, if I can very quickly on Williams Esports, because uh, I said before they've they've had a good few uh, uh, a good few rounds uh, recently in various other championships. Of course, uh, for anyone who who followed the Olympic Virtual Series. Uh, champion came from the Williams Esports camp, the uh, Valerio Gallo. Uh, they've also won with Martin Stefanko in the RCCO World X uh, Championship, uh, one of the rounds uh, a few days ago. They are a, they're a team that are, are spread out across sim racing as a whole, not just in one place. And they're, you know, so, sometimes they, they struggle for success across the board. Other times they, they start to succeed everywhere. And it's kind of one of those things that I, I think is really, really important. You know, speaking of the Olympics and stuff, obviously, on at the moment, uh, and you, you hear from some of the people, some of the athletes in that, where they say that success from someone else, a part of your, your country, some of your compatriots, does make you perform better because you think, well, they're succeeding. I also want to succeed for, for, for the country. And it's in a similar sense in teams. If you're seeing success elsewhere in sim racing, it does boost you uh, wherever else. You think, oh, well, the team's done this, the team's won that. I also want to be a part of that glory. Mm. And it contributes to that team atmosphere as well, because in today's world where everyone is so connected, right? Anyone's success within the team really does permeate, like you say, to the rest of the organization and the outfit. Of course, Lewis, uh, uh, you, do you remember the, the charge that Daniel Lafuente had at Hockenheim in that race yeah. number two as well? That was, well, what can you say, barnstorming? Crazy? I think it was about 15 positions gained in about four or five laps. I did wonder if the uh, if they were going to make a bit of a charge in this one as well. So, you know, this is the thing with these kind of championships and stuff. Uh, obviously, where it's a solo race today, uh, that you, you have that chance to go on the attack. It's where people approach endurance races in different ways, and Williams are a team that can absolutely go on the attack. They can fire up the order, you know, if and when they need to. Right now, running in ninth spot, I think they've they've made, a, a, I was going to say, a little bit of progress. They started in ninth. They're currently in ninth. But uh, at the moment, this is this is good. This is comfortable. This is, a, I wouldn't say it's running exactly to plan, but it's not far off. Got a question then for the both of you. And let's start with Samuel here. We've got, of course, a wide array of GT3 machines on the iRacing service right now. Uh, for those who watched the official iRacing 24 hours of Spa just seven days ago, you would have seen a, a, a Ford GT, uh, infamous Ford GT yep. at this point in time, uh, part of the action as well. But we've got this new wave. We've got the Lamborghini. We've got the BMW. We've got the so many new faces. The Porsche, for example coming to the service, what would you want added in terms of the next step? Do you want an update to the oh. Audi or the Mercedes, get the Evo packed in? Would you rather have a Bentley or something like that? There's so many different options and hopefully the iRacing team is listening, not just to all the requests for rain and stuff like that that continue to go on from the four hours of Charlotte, but here as well. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, I think we'd be a bit too greedy to ask for more right now because we've just got the Porsche and the BMW. But if we could, if, if we could be that naughty child on Christmas who wants a little bit more all the time, I think the BMW, not the BMW, I mean to say the Bentley would be a very, very interesting addition to the field, by the way. Or maybe a better looking car, maybe a slimmer car. How about, how about a McLaren? Wait, wait, wait. I, I think we're going to have to have words after this one. The Bentley, despite being a Boatley, does look uh, resp resplendent at times, I must say. Really does it look does. good. Not like the McLaren. The, the, the McLaren feels like a supercar. The Bentley, it feels like a, a footballer's car, right? Doesn't it? A tank, exactly. Yeah. What's wrong with a tank? That's all I have to say. Sorry, Lewis. No, no, no. I, I always like a Bentley because you can start bullying other people. Mm. Exactly. Uh, exactly. By the way, leaders have a bit of lap traffic, just as a, as a slight FYI, which will sure be uh, putting a bit of pressure onto Alejandro Sanchez as Mike Dam for Orion's going to go a lap down here so at the moment the head of the uh, head of this train uh, as it were but I'm sure we'll hop out of the way coming through the camel curve and we'll allow the uh, four leaders to, to pass before they hit Lake Om. Uh, for me, it's a bit tight. Uh, for me, by the way, I, I mean, I said it before, and I will say it again, obviously, you know, you've, you've got the likes of the McLarens, you've got this, but I always like a bit of a left field option. That's why I said, and I said it before, and I will continue with this, the Callaway. Oh, yes, the Callaway Corvette. We, we, must, we would be remiss, though, in, in saying, Lewis, that 
indications do point to a potential official Corvette GT3 car, not in 2022, Ooh, unfortunately, yes. but 2023 on, and onwards, potentially an actual official Corvette GT3 car. Y you are definitely right there. I'll go a little bit oddball as well. I'd like to see the Nissan, uh, the Nismo oh. GT3 Ooh, potentially yeah. as well. There's so many different options that you could pick here. I mean, a GT3 is such an interesting class, and now with the GTEs maybe taking a step backwards in terms of top-level <laughs> competition, who knows what other manufacturers are going to make their way to the top echelon of GT racing, especially when it comes to some of the historic races. Of course, you've got the four big ones. You've got the likes of Bathurst, the Nürburgring Spa, and I'm forgetting the fourth one, uh, but <laughs> some very big races Daytona? that I think... Ah, there we go, Daytona. That some manufacturers will want to be a part of. Up the hill, these guys will go. That gap between Redline and MSI did come down as a result of that lap traffic. But really, the gap behind to the, the, the chasing pack, the peloton, if you will, we're riding on board with Kevin Ellis well and truly inside that peloton. It's starting to open itself up once more. Let's see what we can have in terms of battles. Almost one hour done with this race, Sommel, and at this point in time, MSI, Redline, and Kawanda looking very, very comfortable. Indeed they are. Things are just all right, according to plan for MSI and Redline, which is amazing. Quite a few people in the chat as well wondering, well, how has all of a sudden the Ferraris looked so strong? Well, they've just been, dare I say, buffed up a little bit, but yeah, the, the competition would be a lot fairer than what, you, uh, what we saw a week ago in the iRacing Spa 24 hours. But the Ferraris, they look well fed. They finally feel like they have a mission and a purpose in relation to what we saw just a week ago when nobody selected them in the top split. But yeah, finally MSI and Redline just easing off right now. They realize there's no need to do anything special. And ideally, they would be in the pits in around 10 minutes, won't they? I think you want to try and go as long beyond the hour as you can to potentially cut a full pit stop away. It's going to be a long, long trip down pit road. We'll say as well, we talked about that penalty for Volante, the, the additional time penalty that they had. It's not like what we see in, in a normal type of a race, uh, Lewis. In, in SEO in the past, you've always served your penalties in your pit box instead. Instead, We've got a penalty box that drivers are going to have to make their way to. So a separate place to serve that penalty. It does mean that you don't have to serve an additional penalty that the iRacing service will put down on you, where if you serve penalty while taking service, you'll get an extra 25 or so seconds added to your total time. Now it's going to be a little bit more dynamic like that, but it does mean you have to remember to make your way down into the penalty box. Yes, yeah, so, uh, trying to make it uh, essentially a bit smoother, a bit, bit oh, sorry, but more so a, a bit more control. Uh, from, from outside to, to make sure that, that penalties are fair because obviously sometimes you know, you've got this whole penalty to fit the crime and we won't go into uh, Silverstone, don't worry. Uh, but so I'm not going into it, don't worry. Uh, just got to you know, drop, drop a little bit in there. Uh, the, the thing is with uh, uh, this kind of uh, racing and stuff, uh, if you're, you've got to be a little bit careful with those penalties because, say for example, you give someone a drive-through penalty for, for a bit of contact, a drive through penalty around here is so incredibly harsh because uh, it's such a long pit lane sequence, so you're going to lose best part of the minute because uh, it's such a long pit lane. You've got to have the options from, from race control just to make things a little bit smoother, a little bit calmer, uh, and, and essentially not completely ruin someone's race for, for some innocuous bit of contact. For sure, and I mean, Talking of drama, for those who uh, want to see some more drama, just head to RaceBot TV. You can subscribe to us and hit the bell. I was commentating in a race on Wednesday where I literally lost my voice and my mind at the checkered flag. But highly recommend you continue to stick around because lots of action coming in the second half of this year. You saw, by the way, the charge from Beela Racing Team Euronix and Sven Hasa continues to con just charge through the field. Now up into 18th position after starting down on pit lane. I said a top 15 might be on the car. The top 10 is definitely still potentially there for Hasa, who is now behind his teammate Lubomir Schweitz. And guess who joined the session? Frank Bieler himself is here to watch his team get along. It's great to see them make their way back into the Audi. They've been campaigning in that Lamborghini as of recently since it's joined the iRacing service. But Frank Bieler, the four rings, is there anything more synonymous when it comes to racing? Great, great to see them back in there. You know, like I say, it's, it's, it's like a bit, bit of a bit of a coming home uh, uh, type thing. You, sometimes you've got to try something different to try and make it work. Switch between the two teammates as Sven Harsen will get by uh, Schweitz. Again, pretty easy move. They're not going to fight that one hard, are they? That, that's that's pretty smart. Haas on an 
absolute send right now. Uh, again, started from uh, from pit lane. Qualify this car did start for or was qualified uh, for fifth spot, so it's, well, it, we know it's got good pace. And uh, realistically speaking, right now is is absolutely showing it. And of course, it's always great to see those liveries. We've seen some special ones over the course of this year. Uh, when we went to Bathurst, the Bela team had kangaroos on their car. Yep. And I think then at Sebring, they had the Stars and Stripes. Who knows what they have here? Uh, always great to see the interesting things that the Bela racing team put onto their cars. The gap out front continues to extend, by the way, to the chasing pack. So you're looking at Hasa, who is now up into 17th position, 20 seconds adrift from the race leaders. and. It's about 10 seconds adrift from that chasing pack in front of him. Now Yannick Lapchan at the head of the queue with Nick Schulter Wisserman behind him as we look rearwards from Sven Haas. He's got a couple of cars behind him. Wonder if Lubomir Schweitz is going to have to deal with Yele Walters and the Fuga Simsport Mercedes as well. For Fuga Simsport, Sommel, this is a race where I think one of their first chances to show their strength at the top level of sim racing competition. I've seen them over the years competing in all sorts of competitions, including ones I've organized, but it's great to see that 99 car now being strong in a field like this. Yeah, Fuga have always been there, thereabouts in top events here and there. And to see them compete so strongly, to see them be so consistent in this race is quite a big one. And yeah, you might be saying, well, P20 isn't the biggest thing in the world. You can be fighting for top five as well. But it's not every team of the same size. It's not every team of the same pedigree. Quite a few of them are on the up. Say a team like Kwanda and Redline, they're already right up there. But a team like Fuga, a team like, say, Five Star Motorsport, that's the car in front of them. They are on the rise in leagues like this one. So it's good to see Fuga actually come up right here and compete at such a top level. But speaking of competition, there's a little bit going on there. Not much, just a little. It's half a second separating the top four. I mean, they are very much bumper to bumper at this point in uh, time, almost like peak rush hour traffic wherever you are in the world. Coming to the end of this first hour, and I tell you what, Lewis, those Porsches are looking very strong when it comes to some of these twisty bits. I wonder what's happening in terms of tire life here. Yeah, they've got. I, I would suggest that the Porsches are probably looking after it quite nicely right now. We know what Commander are like. I don't even think Redline are particularly aggressive on their tyres. It was more, as well as saying in the early stages of uh, uh, when seeing some of these, uh, I wouldn't say mistakes, but pushing hard uh, from Alejandro Sanchez. This is what we're about to see. So we're, you're going to see Max Benecke get to the inside and get basically fully alongside by the first apex of uh, Le Com. So the first time they've tried to attack for the race lead against uh, the MSI Esports car. I mean, good attempt, but. You, you've got to send it a bit harder than that. Uh, obviously, there's no need to at this point. They're waiting until that first pit stop sequence, which is coming up very, very shortly indeed. But right now, I'd, I'd be a bit more concerned about the tyres on the MSI Esports Ferrari than I would be about any of the other cars in the top four. They've been pushing hard, but we'll have to wait and see because with about two and a half minutes to go until the top of the hour, the pit stop window will begin to open as they will come across the line to complete lap number 25, an estimated 624 laps in today's action. Of course, no safety car is going to come to your aid. You have to make sure you keep it clean, you keep it fast as well. Down the hill, that gap has opened up very slightly. I think Beneke is just setting up the run now, Sommel, in towards La Source. Could be coming in, and we could be seeing something special here from Max Beneke. Once we come up the hill, but no, I think he's just fallen back a little bit. I think they've realized that there's no need to push for it. And I think that might just be the order until the end of this particular stint. Or it might not, because the draft can be so powerful. Here we go. Snaking, trying to break the draft, at least for a moment, was Sanchez. I think Beneke is a bit too far behind. Some indecision there, or maybe just a little bit of safe, uh, safety trying to defend from Rogers behind. But... The Kawanda lockout on the front row hasn't necessarily progressed like we expected here, Lewis. I'll, I'll be honest, I kind of thought they'd kind of break away from the draft in the early stages of this race. And it's great to see this BOP. The Ferrari for so long has been kind of a, a problem child, if you will, on the GT3 side of things. Never really in contention unless you went somewhere like uh, the Norschleifer where it's ability to get up to its top speed at a track where top speed, despite the fact that I think a lot of people think uh, downforce is king. No, it, it, so many long runs that you have to make sure you have as much speed as you can find. The Ferrari has always been good there. And not always been strong here in, in years past. It's definitely been an Audi sort of a race, but now it's Porsche and Ferrari out front.
Well, that's the thing with uh, with Spa. It's one of those open tracks. We talk about it when we come in, uh, you know, open wheelers and uh, other sorts of racing where it's this uh, a juxtaposition of setup where you're trying to make a car that goes to the corners really nicely whilst also making it a bullet in a straight line and which one works out best. I mean, here we've got Porsches fighting Ferraris. So we do have, uh, in a sense, as close to polar opposites as we can get. You've got the Porsches, which run really nicely through that middle sector and the outright straight line speed of that Ferrari. And they're close. They're separated by very, very little. Uh, it, it's it's more akin to the uh, the rise of, or the returned rise, rather, of the Mercedes. We've spoken about quite a few times uh, in the SEO Sprint Masters, where uh, we, we, you know, it, it's that discussion that the Mercedes are, are coming back towards the front there. They're becoming a stronger car again uh, on the iRacing service. In this sense, uh, here at the, the 24 Hours of Spa, it's seeming that the Ferraris are the one with that ride. It's got a few drivers into the pit lane, though. Urano Esports, Logitech G Altus Esports with DV1 trying as well, I believe. So here we go. The first hour is complete, and I think some of these cars just trying to split it into equal hour-long stints. But if anything, that's not what you want to do. You want to extend it and, and try and see what you can do. Here's a replay of something that happened to Vendaval Sim Racing, just getting onto that Astro turf on the outside. We saw a similar thing happen to Jarl Tien in the Ferrari, and the number nine car then had to park himself and wait for an opportunity to rejoin the race for the race lead. These guys extending with this stint. It'll be interesting now, if anything, Sommel, to see if the two Porsches behind can maybe get a little bit better fuel mileage and extend this stint maybe one or two laps longer than the cars in front. Yeah, we've got to wait and watch. And that's the best part of the endurance racing. You can't quite tell early on. And it's good to see that the top pack are actually able to pull out this specific thing from their hand about going a lap longer. Question is, how much longer? Thing is, in the last uh, Spa 24 hours that we have, which is a bit odd to say, but we had last week, by the mid part of the race, there were teams that are pitting in with 30 minutes left to go in the hour when the normal stop is just at the hour mark. That is how much they gained by constantly extending their stop. So there's a lot to play upon longer, my dear. Do these cars go up on the jacks for tyres? I would not think so, at least later in this race. But of course, with the track temperatures still above, 35 degrees Celsius, you, you might want those fresh rubber to take you through these early portions of the race. Looks like full tanks of fuel for sure, as Schulter Wisserman in the Urano 94 is still in pit road at 40 seconds and counting. There he goes, up on the jack, so we will see tires taken at least by some of these cars, Ooh. but the name of the game once we get into the nighttime hours, Lewis, will be double stinting not just your driver, but the tires as well. Yeah, it's, uh, we, we do expect doubles later. I mean, to be fair, we do expect doubles really at this point. The temperature's dropped a couple of degrees. It's down to 36 on track at present. Uh, is MSI going to dive into pit lane? Yes, they are. Redline's going to continue. Uh, Coanda and the Lego Technic car also jump into the pit lane. I was wondering this with uh, Brunecker, by the way, who... I, I will say it would have been a 100% pass into Lacombe that time by the, the previous lap if he would choose to do so. Lifted out massively, almost just out of the Kemmel curve. Uh, it was that early just to make sure that, you know, not making that move, saving fuel. But that's really, really interesting that the DRS Miranda bunch have also followed into the pit lane, the MSI car. And there you saw just for a brief moment the hairpin that you have in pit road. and. Well, I can tell you for sure because I've done it myself. Uh, you can hit the walls and you can yeah. damage your car. So you do need to be a little bit careful. And sometimes causes a bit of a stack up as well. So just watch out for cars behind you, maybe running into your rear end. Interesting call then for the red line red car to be able to extend the gap. A bit surprised, Sommel, that the Coanda duo, of course, of Rogers and Charlie Collins, unable to extend that stint further. Yep, a bit absurd. Normally the Porsche is not the most fuel efficient car in the world as well, but again, neither is the Ferrari. So we've got to wait and watch and see how things are going to go in the long run with that. There you can see Team Volante serving their penalty in that big box next to the bushes right there. But yeah, this will be fun. I think they will be taking their tires, but I can only wonder how has Ben Neke been able to pull out another extra lap when for some part of the race, he was actually the one leading. Yeah, I'm really surprised that, especially Charlie Collins, who was tucked up behind those cars, yeah. uh, basically the entirety of the stint, unable to go a lap longer. You can see pit road is, well, busy. Busy, busy, busy. Almost 20 cars stationary now. They will release themselves. You see those green cones. That's when you can get off the speed limiter and back up to racing speed, but you have to rejoin in rather careful fashion. Of course, Kevin Estre had a big, big incident coming 
back onto the track. Almost three wide they were, and really is a high-speed rejoin where cars are on that line that you are exiting because Eau Rouge and Raddy on such a fast corner, you're trying to just take as much speed as you can. Speaking of speed, here comes Max Beneke all by himself for the race lead. He will be coming down this time around, surely, Lewis. Yeah, by the way, uh, losing out in that pit lane sequence, the number 91. So we've got Team Redline down into pit lane. 91's lost out to both the LEGO Technic Esports and MSI Esports. There was tyres for them. Not sure how many or, or what they were doing, but they did switch some form of tyres as Logitech Gialtas Esports leave the pit lane. And also, that's the other big thing, is that that pit lane sequence nearly lost them a lap. They're just going into lane on now considering where that car is that is how much time you lose in the pit lane so this is what you're talking about going a lap further if you go a lap further every single stint maybe even over the night if you can try and uh, shrink some things down on tires etc etc if you could try and remove a pit stop from this race it is a bigger gain than on any other track that we could possibly go to it is insane how much time you gain if you can go a, a, a stint shorter I mean, we're talking pit stops here of what, almost, uh, pit lane times, I should say, of almost 130 seconds. Yeah. So it is a long, long time. You spend almost a full minute just rolling yourself through the pit road itself, regardless of the time you spend in the box. It was a couple of seconds quicker for Charlie Collins in the 92. I think maybe just explains how he was able to leapfrog both the MSI and the 91 VRS Kawanda car in terms of just maybe having saved a little bit less fuel, or more fuel, I should say, less fuel going into his car. The only driver that has tried something different in terms of strategy in the top 10 is the man who's on the move, Sven Haas, 55 seconds stationary. I would suspect, Sommel, he's only taken two tires in this pit cycle. Could very well be. It's a tactic that Beeler Racing Team Euronix used to perfection in, in another top endurance racing lead that happens on iRacing which was amazing, the competitive, and Bieler were the champions of that. They, they actually used that two-tier strategy so, so prominently, again, with the Audi right there. They feel the most comfortable in that very car using that very strategy. And if it works, well, we're only going to find out how well it works. So far, Haas has been superb behind the wheel of that car. Down the hill, this is, though, going to be the time to watch for as There goes Beneke, already rolling but full steam ahead for these three cars. Beneke will have potentially a char challenge from Charlie Collins in the 92 car, but he's got a bit of an advantage. Might not have to look in his rear view mirrors. That's the rejoin I'm talking about. Over the crest of the hill comes the chasing trio, and that gap, Lewis, is almost two full seconds. That is one lap extra further into the race. That is a fantastic sequence from Team Redline. That is insane how much they've gained there. Whether it was just because of a, uh, a slightly shortened uh, a pit stop or, or whatever, it's not. I think they've taken the same amount of tyres as those behind us. We've got the Logitech GRC Sports car and Urano going past on Williams, who are fresh out of the pit lane. Going to leave it side by side with the Audi on the apex into Lacom. But yeah, Redline, what was half a second at one point between the top four now changes to a 3.6 second lead. I think there are a few drivers or rather a few teams that have swapped around drivers because I'm say, seeing Moreno Sorica is out of the Williams Esports car and Daniel Lafuente, the man behind the charge we were mentioning at Hockenheim has jumped behind the wheel so because you take tires and fuel it does mean there's some opportunity to do a driver swap but usually we will see double stints when it comes first to the drivers and then to the tires. Gap out front is now 3.6 seconds. It's going to be hard, I think, for that gap to be closed at this point, Samo. It really is. It is just a clear example of how good and how important strategy is in George Racing. You just can't keep on driving and driving and driving and expect a good result. Redline, oh, well, they have kept on driving, but they have done something special in terms of fuel saving, and that is why they've gained 3.5 seconds in one shot. Imagine, how hard is it to gain 3.5 seconds just with your driving on the track? Too, too hard to do in this case when the competition is so tight. It was 2.6 seconds in the pit road, quicker for the 71 car at least compared to Charlie Collins, 2.06.3 for Beneke, 2.08.9 for Charlie Collins. And now the hard work will have to go on for someone like Sanchez, leading the race coming into the pit cycle. Lots of work to do to get back to the front. It's now a four-car fight, by the way, for ninth on back. This is interesting to note that 
uh, the Apex Racing team able to kind of leapfrog these guys through the cycle. I wonder, Lewis, if there was a bit of slowdown in pit road. I mentioned the checkup that sometimes happens through the hairpin. Not necessarily seeing too much on the timing screen that would indicate that, but Ellis, it's closer to the cars in front than the cars behind. It's one of those things where you, you don't think you need to practice that much. Because, you know, if you're, if so, say, for example, you join a session by yourself, right? You're always going to be in one of those pit stops down at the bottom of the hill. Uh, you know, you'll always be the first one. If you're in with a, a, a small group, you're practicing with just a team, you're always going to be at the bottom of the hill, which means when you're departing pit lane, you're not doing that hairpin very much. You know, if you were in a full session, then you'd be doing that hairpin quite a few times just to at least get used to it somewhat. Uh, and those drivers that haven't practiced will come into pit lane, and as much as you're on the pit limiter, you're not going to gain that much time, are you? You do. If you know how to take it just right, you can get it absolutely spot on. Alejandro Sanchez, though, gains second position back, though, for MSI Esports, getting by Charlie Collins. Pretty easy move. I think one driver we also need to keep our eye on is Sven Haase, who set the fastest lap of the race later on in that stint on the 24th lap and 18-2, putting uh, fuel back into the car. Comparatively to everyone else who's running in the mid-18s, uh, ran a 19.2 on the previous lap, which was the first yes. time lap of this stint. So they are running uh, a bit slower, uh, but they are keeping in contention with the Team Redline blue car. But looking backwards in the pack, it's not necessarily that slow, at least in terms of some of the cars behind. Uh, the Altus car at 219.6, uh, the other Altus car at 219.9, of course, still probably getting themselves back up to racing speed. Other cars that have been out there a couple of laps longer, uh, Fuga Simsport did a 19.7, so if Haase can can use this time and the, the, the draft in front of him to just extend once more this run, might be looking like after starting on pit road, top 10 finish, it might be a top five finish. Across the start finish line though, that gap, 4.4 seconds. But Neke is a man on a mission. He's trying to extend this gap bit by bit. Oh, and he's just at 83. That time, by the way, he's gone. Incredible. I'm seeing, by the way, a penalty has come down for the number nine car. That would be the Vendaval machine that we saw have a bit of a spin around by itself. I'm, and it's it's related to that little incident that we saw, Sommel. It was a unsafe rejoin. I did mention that they were waiting quite patiently, but apparently not patient enough because, well, that's going to be another penalty served by the Vendaval Sim Racing red car. Man, that... That just sucks, to be honest. There's no other way to put it. That just sucks. Uh, you've had a spin. It it often gets to you. And, and I can't blame it at times because once you've had a spin, there's a certain intensity within you. Right, I've got to correct my wrong. I've got to get back on track as soon as possible. But sometimes your, uh, your eagerness just gets over you. I mean, I've had that incident so many times. And you end up just having an unsafe reach on it. And race control never, ever takes a very bright look off that. So, of course, the penalty... Uh, I didn't quite get an idea if we had an unsafe reach on the replay that we saw because we only saw the spin. But again, if race controller said that there was an unsafe reach on, there probably must have been a pretty hairy moment right there. So, yeah, really for Wendeval, all about putting their head down and seeing what they can salvage from this 24 hour race right now because already a spin plus a penalty, things don't look on the sunny side right now for them. And, and with no safety cars, Lewis, my suspicion is that just like what we see in the official side of things by the time we get to the conclusion of 24 hours uh, there are going to be cars that are that, that are several laps down at the end of this because the pace out front is unrelenting from Beneke he is going to be consistent and he's got some quick teammates to back him up See, this was kind of what I was expecting from Coanda. I said before about um, Rogers and how when he was leading earlier, I don't think this is this is peak Rogers that we were talking about. And it was the same for Beneke. He was waiting, was waiting for the right moment. You go a lap longer, you know that you're then going to be by yourself. So what do you do? Hammer time. You go for it. You abs you turn up everything that you can. And I don't mean in the car. I mean mentally. You apply a level of focus which you reserve for these very specific parts of the race. And that is exactly what he's doing right now. He's waited for this moment. And to give you his lap time, I said before it was an 18-3 uh, on the previous lap when we were talking about uh, Sven Haas's 19 to was slightly less relevant in the sense of the time differential. But it was an 18-304. That lap just completed was an 18-342. It's just metronomic consistency. In comparison to Sanchez, it was an 18-4 and an 18-6. Uh, Collins as well, a 19-5, obviously, when he lost the position. An 18-6 to Rogers, uh, 18-7s. 
that is how fast that red line Ferrari is going right now. Insane. And the gap is extending. His teammate, by the way, is up into fifth after just getting past the RHG Porsche who had swapped around in the pit stop cycle. So red line with two cars still in the top five, but that 72 car with Chris Lollum at the wheel is starting to be very much dropped from the race winning equation unless something drastic was to happen to the 71 car. But of course, Sonnel, uh, uh, Beneke and his team are, are familiar with drama when it comes to this race. As uh, those who are longtime sim racing fans will know, Max Verstappen was piloting the red line car back in the day. I think it was 2018, the 24 hours of Spa coming into the closing stages. And then, well, a brake failure, uh, rather dramatic fashion, meant that he had to stop the car using the barriers on the outside of Malmedy, reset himself back onto pit road. Fortunately, they had such an insurmountable gap that even that drama couldn't stop Redline from taking victory. It couldn't, and that gave us one of the most iconic sim racing moments of all time, without a doubt, but Will Winston just nailing it on the commentary. That just reminded you of how intense and how big the race like the Spa 24 hour generally is and, and full crest the red line the way they handled that situation was spot on and eventually went on to win the race right there as well but i doubt that something similar could happen right here i think after that race every single one of those teams and drivers competing at spa has done a double check of their pedals of their wheels of, of their internet connections but only recently i think last week in the Spa 24 hours did dion fialo of vendevalt sim racing had his internet connection drop out and apparently it's not the worst thing that's happened to him for once before, in another endurance race, I don't remember which one, he had a flood all of a sudden in his basement. Oh, you no. Imagine that. You're in the race. You know, I can actually imagine that because <laughs> I know someone else that that's happened to. Uh, I was racing in an eight hours of Interlagos a good few years ago, uh, and, and someone, I think it was Adam Taylor, uh, of a, uh, one of the teams that was racing in there that was competing in the GT category, uh, and he took a photograph of uh, his computer rig, which wasn't in a great state. Uh, it was moderately underwater, uh, and, and so uh, uh, couldn't couldn't take part in the race. And that car got disqualified because they couldn't get their other dr like the the the, um, the the they breached the driving. There's only two of them in the car, and so they breached. It. And it was like it's 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 one of those things. It's like such an unfair disqualification but you know rules the rules but still it's like oh, a bit rough yeah I, i'm just now thinking about the prospect of being midway through a race potentially even leading and then suddenly <laughs> uh, your, your computer dies and you're like what and then you realize you've been sitting in water for the last 10 minutes yeah, or something. Yeah. No, not necessarily <laughs> the way that you want things to go as we're now 15 minutes through this second hour of the brs sco 24 hours of spa it's team redline out front with msi esports in second and the commander duo, the Lego Technic car, leading the number 91 with Joshua Rogers in third and fourth. Red line in fifth, RHG six with the Apex Racing Team have just gotten past the Beeler Racing Team, Euronics number 46. Rounding out the top 10, we've got this Alters Lamborghini being chased down by Daniel Lafuente. Of course, a lot of these BMW teams, Lewis, weren't necessarily the most thrilled when it came to the BOP. And in fact, talking to uh, the Apex Racing team in the build-up to this one. They weren't thrilled about the BOP on the Lamborghini either. They were saying that they just threw a random setup onto the Audi and suddenly they found about two tenths of the second. But at the end of the day, no matter what they said, everyone likes to complain about BOP, let's be completely honest. That Lamborghini is still going faster than the Audi behind. I was say there, at least at the moment, looks uh, looks fine. The thing is, with this kind of stuff, you, you, say, you said it absolutely right, is that you're always going to complain about BOP. I'm sure even if you ask them to a certain degree, Coanda are going to complain about the Porsche Redline and can complain somewhat about the Ferrari. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're right up there because all, none of these cars are perfect. And that's the point, is that they aren't mm. the greatest all round. They're, they're good at going in a straight line really fast. They're good at taking a corner really fast. They're good at predictability, at fuel mileage, at tyre strategy. They're good at all of these little things, but no one car uh, ha has the ace at all of those things. It's, it's just about finding a car that works best for you. And I'm sure in this sense that there is a team out there that can wrestle a car which maybe shouldn't be at the front to the front just because it somehow magically matches the setup knowledge they have and the, the, the driving ability uh, and, and style of those teams. That's why we do GT racing because there is choice, there is that balance and you know, yeah sure the BOP may not work, get, work in your favour on, on occasion but that's how it is.
also I've just been catching up on on social media and all the news that's coming in from this wonderful four hours of Charlotte that the iRacing team is putting on with the National MS Society here in the US and well we had talked about rain being confirmed potentially before the end of this year so the the, the landscape on. of endurance racing here on the iRacing service might look very <laughs> very different in a couple of months time and we at RaceBot get to cover so many different special events. Samuel, so well, can you imagine what something like Daytona, which is known for rain, really mixing things up, is going to be like if we get actual rain in 2022? Daytona, can you imagine what Nürburgring will be like with dynamic weather? Simulated according to the time period of when we actually have the 24-hour race. I mean, long train, have to say anything about hail or snow or anything else like that <laughs> as well? Because that's what usually ends up happening right there. No, to be honest, this will be amazing. And again, the fact that it's coming in so early is, is quite a pleasant surprise. And I, and I like iRacing's approach on this one. We got the McLaren very quietly. Now we're getting the rain in only a few months' time. Not a long way to go now. I, I, I quite like this, you know? Don't, don't build it up for too long. Absolutely but, love white racing. Uh, Lewis, the other thing that I'm reading, and again, this is all just speculation because we haven't been able to listen in on Greg Hill's very wonderful insights on that uh, iRacing broadcast, is weather forecasting. Now, I'm, I'm sure there are some closet weather nerds in, in the iRacing service. They're going to have, I'm sure, a treat trying to figure out all the patterns and stuff and trying to figure out what's going to happen. That's going to be a, a very different element. We've talked about how, you know, at the top level of sim racing, teamwork has really become important you don't just have your drivers you have your engineers well now you need a weather expert as well well i mean uh, if uh, if anyone wants to hire the people that do the weather in this area of, uh, of england that would be great because then there is a zero percent accuracy uh, it's fantastic but uh, yeah it's, it's those kind of things that make it interesting now uh, like obviously a uh, weather and an endurance race they go hand in hand because we love seeing those the race how it spices up and stuff uh, you know you, the, the the not knowing of what could happen over the next uh, 23 and a bit hours that's the beautiful thing of endurance racing and finally getting that is uh, is going to be absolutely sweet but the 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 real thing from this and cuz obviously when we think of weather in in real life i mean we we think of these dramatic moments this crazy stuff we also think a little bit more towards red flags right they they happen a lot uh because whether you know it, it has these things whether you can't take off the medical helicopter or visibility is not good enough or whatever uh, or whether it's just too dangerous now with sim racing and stuff we can have the weather and we don't necessarily have to worry about that kind of stuff so we don't have the red flag we just get their racing in these hard conditions and just take it to the limit no delays just go well, I mean, or you have the weather delay that we had this uh, yeah, earlier that was this a bit year different, at Detroit. <laughs> yeah, that was a bit different. I mean, just an indication of, of how popular these iRacing special events really, really are. I mean, just an influx of members in the last 12 months with so many people being stuck inside. Not just the real-world drivers that have made their transitions over to virtual motorsports, but so many new sim racing fans. Gap out front continues to hold relatively steady as we're watching that Altus Esports Lamborghini just trying to pull away from the Williams Esports cars behind. I am curious as to how things are going for Sven Haase with what we think is a two-tire strategy at this point in time. He's lost about a second, a second and a half to the group of cars in front, and Kevin Ellis Jr. is trying to reel in first the RHG Porsche and then the Redline Ferrari for a fifth place spot after qualifying outside of the top 10. Williams Esports almost running into the back of the Altus Lamborghini there. So incredibly tight, I'm right back here. I mean, this is the thing is that like, if you really think about it, how much time it, that there is to the to the cars behind, it's very, very little. I will say, let's talk about gambles and stuff. And let's talk about Bela racing. That gamble they took to take two times, obviously early stages of stint wise, looks to be working out quite nicely considering where they are. They're still, you know, up the eighth position. Yes, they're dropping yeah. backwards, sure. But the, the progress they've made still is, is you know, absolutely spot on. Apex, by the way, speaking of a bit further ahead of this, Apex pick up a position and go into six of RHG. And Kevin Ellis Jr. almost lost control trying to slide through Lacom. Interesting that the Rallycross driver, or I should say the newly minted Rallycross driver, he's trying to make his way into the World Championships there. A multi-discipline driver just getting to getting to grips with how to drift uh, that Lamborghini Huracan GT3 Evo. Might Meanwhile, down the hill, these guys go in towards Bruce Sells. An interesting corner where multiple 
number of lines can be run, but they're all running single file, at least for now. I, I would assume that the more important thing for these guys, Samuel, is to make sure they don't lose too much time to the cars in front of them. Already 24 seconds adrift from your race leader. Yeah, exactly. If you have more hairy moments like what Kevin Ellis Jr. had in this pack, they'll be having quite the tough time right now with Williams Esports, of course, getting closer, getting on the edge to the Altus Lamborghini. And I like this. I like the strength of this battle. I mean, if you just look at it out of context, look at the names of the teams that we have right there. We have got Logitech G Altus, Williams Esports, Urano and MSI. That is literally an all-star battle and it's only right here to be number nine. So this grid is probably stacked right now. I'm intrigued to see which way this battle goes on in the long run here. Right now, they can't afford to fight each other. They're so far back down to all the other teams like RG and Apex. They've just got to work together and climb, 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 climb. That's the only thing that should be on their mind right now. Almost halfway through this second hour of the race, as I think there was almost a move behind from the second of the MSI Ferraris trying to get past. Nick Schulte Wisserman in the Urano Esports HP car. It's been an up and down season for Urano in the Sprint Masters, Lewis. We have seen, especially in race number two, some very, very impressive qualifying performances from the Urano team, not always being met with the race results that they necessarily would have expected. Is this where we do like, the real proper plug that you... If, I mean, let's be, everyone's watching. Surely they are. The SEO Sprint Masters and Sprint Challenge. Fantastic racing that we've seen, yeah. where we're seeing drivers on the, the very limit in all uh, facets of racecraft, whether it's from uh, from qualifying to race starting to race ending. And that's why we're seeing this uh, a thing of drivers coming to the fore in different sessions. And it's teaching drivers more about themselves. And this is where, like, uh, it, it kind of... It does play into endurance racing like this kind of stuff because if you think, if, if you always accepted that you were never the driver to start the race, no, no, I'm never the driver to start the race. I don't want to because uh, confidence or whatever or racecraft or you know the mid pack is dangerous. And then you are, are basically because of the championship format where they're forced to qualify, uh, uh, do the start of the race, do the end of the race uh, between uh, two drivers in each car. Um, you're forced to take on that responsibility uh, in that sense and then hand off to your teammate at least at some point. And so from that, you might find that you're actually quite good at that kind of stuff. And then that, that translates into here as well as a, as a bit of a confidence booster. Just going to say a, a little thing as well, what we're, we're listening in whilst we're watching the, uh, the Lego Technic and VRS Commander car that are lapping quite a bit slow. I mean, two or three tenths slower than the Team Redline. But I'm not suspecting there's going to be a move because I just listened in to Charlie Collins going into uh, the Buster K on the previous lap. He's clutching in from even before, like they come through Blanchemont. When you've got that right-hand kick, it's touching him from that point all the way down. So fuel saving, that, that's what he's looking to do. And it's how he jumped to the front of this queue, but it doesn't seem to be helping him, at least when it comes to the, the context of the race lead, because the pace from Beneke is unrelenting. He's continuing to lap in the 2183. That gap out front has been bouncing around the five second bracket. I saw for a moment it was almost extended up to about six seconds at one point in time, and really looking untouchable at this point in the race got some very strong teammates like I've mentioned Sommel and, and, and for Redline such a strong organization this is I think the race that they would have wanted to have because they've got Beneke, Patrick Holtzman and Jonas Walmar in this red car Johnny Vecchio, Chris Lollum, Jeff Giassi in the blue car they may be looking at a double podium at this race could be could be in the long run we've got to we've got to wait and see how they can manage things out right now it, it's it's a long race this one but that, that certainly could be on the cards right now and I love the fact that Redline comes out all guns blazing in all these major endurance events. We often end up seeing them doing a pretty good job in the iRacing special events. Good to see them finally here in SEO as well. And I think last year too in the prototype category, Redline were among the top teams, weren't they? I, I don't quite remember clearly. Redline is always around the front of whatever they choose to compete in. That's the reality of having superstars like uh, Beneke and Vecchio, let alone the rest of their drivers who are very very quick as well now into this final half hour of the second portion second hour of the race i should say and well i would wonder if beneke has been able to do the same amount of fuel saving as he was able to do in that first St. lewis but even if he's unable to do the same amount of saving he went five minutes beyond the top of the hour when it came to that first pit cycle he's looking in a pretty good position because 
even if they can get a you know a, an, a, an extra lap rather than the two extra laps that we saw the last time around they'll be chipping away bit by bit at the length of that final pit stop they may be able to get one pit stop down by the end of this race. Yeah, I don't think they're saving fuel at the moment at all. They might do once so yeah, the, the gap gets even bigger than what it is. But right now, uh, if he's saving fuel, then I'm very concerned about red line right now because that is mightily impressive. Uh, lap times are very, very consistently a tenth or two faster than the trio that we have on screen at present. Just always building out a little bit here, a little bit there. And uh, like I was saying earlier, it was an 18-3. I'll just say very quickly from this stint, and this, this shows the consistency because they're all 18s around a lap like this. Uh, it is an 18-3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 5, 4, 4, 3, 3 exceptional consistency said, every single one of those lap times is a tenth or two at least faster than sanchez at the front of this group it really is very very impressive uh, and to to speak of the other uh, team redline car which is uh, chris lullen behind this i don't think he's doing enough to close down this group realistically it's a, it's a tenth here and a little bit there but then losing the same amount i would almost argue that based on the lap times they do equalized probably around about the the plus or minus two tenths of a second over the entire uh, previous five six seven laps apologies to those of you watching on the virtual racing school twitch some unfortunate connection issues have meant that you've missed about the last 15 minutes or so of action but we are glad to be back on your screens in this second half of the second hour in action it is still red line that leads now that gap Almost touching the six hours, a six second margin, I should say, with the LEGO Technic Esport crew trying to chase them down. Looking very, very good, I must say. These liveries always looking wonderful when it comes to a grid like this. Now we go side by side to follow along with not just that battle for second, but the train of cars that has formed behind Florian Denard in the Logitech Gialtis Esports number 43. You've got the Williams Esports BMW, then you've got the Urano Esports Audi, MSI Esports in the second of their Ferraris before you get to DV1 Triton Racing, a second down the road, but still well and truly in the in the battle in their Audi. Then Altus, Pure Sims, Core Sim Racing. So 9th through 16th, separated by only a couple of seconds, and Yes, they are about 30 seconds adrift from the race leaders, Salmo, but these guys are still fighting for plenty when it comes to our $10,000 in prize money. Oh, 100%. This is one of the most prestigious events on the iRacing road racing service. So, a lot to play for in that sense. Even though, even though you may be in the midfield, there's still so much to gain by climbing up a few positions here and there. And that is why the intensity is so high. I mean, normally, you wouldn't focus much on a P10 battle, but as it stands, Williams Esports will get $300, while Urano won't get anything in terms of prize money. And think about how big of a factor that can be in terms of all the effort that you've put into preparing on that race. So, Urano are fighting hard for that, MSI 48 are fighting hard for that. The same can be said by the DV1 Triton and the other teams behind. They desperately, desperately want to be in that top 10 to get a bit of that prize money and also to remind everyone that they are one of the best sim racing endurance teams out there because this this grid is stacked and while redline did compete last week it should be noted that they did so in in the bmws rather yeah. than than the ferrari so switching it around to favor what they thought would be the strongest car in today's action but at the same time lewis we did see a number of these teams for example kowanda the apex racing team not taking part last weekend because it is a tough mental challenge, it's a tough physical challenge just around the Ooh. outside. Can MSI make something happen on Schulte Wisserman? Not able to get things done, almost got physical there, but when it comes to two 24-hour races in consecutive weekends, it is a very tough challenge, especially if you do not have drivers from around the globe able to share driving responsibilities. Yeah, the, the thing is, we're, we're in proper spa territory now, and I mean that in the sense of uh, pretty much it's, this happens um, uh, you know, with, with quite a few tracks, Bathurst earlier in the year, where you'll be constantly switching on broadcast. By the way, Logic G out of Esports, the 83, lost time, spinner. and there you go, Spinner, and that is it, down at uh, corner with no name, and rejoins the racetrack, a bit of damage on the left-hand side of it to, as well, losing 
uh, out to the five-star motorsports car as well. So clearly uh, something has happened down there. Uh, but yeah, we're in Spa territory. Every broadcast you switch on in sim racing these days will be basically around Spa. Let's take a look at what happened. I think just losing it on the rear, on the curbing, and away she goes. It's not too bad. That damage, I think, was before. Um, but uh, yeah, with uh, Command not taking part last week, it's not going to really disadvantage them because the information that you gain from there, whilst, okay, you know, it does help a little bit, but this is Command we're talking about. They've got so much data to fall back yeah. on. Um, but also they have to think, if they were, if they did last week's 24-hour race, they've got last week's 24 hours of Spa, they've got this 24 hours of Spa, and I do believe they are racing in a 24 hours of Spa next week as well. You do not want to do three on the bounce. <laughs> I, I don't want to imagine that because our producer Hugo Luis is already tired enough after one and he's going to be doing a marathon stint here today, 18 hours of production behind the scenes. For a moment, I think MSI almost tried something down into the bus stop, but nothing doing. These guys are getting racy as, again, fighting over those final points, uh, prize-paying positions. DV1 Triton Racing will be happy, though, because only now six-tenths adrift from the back of these group of cars. There was an incident, by the way, between the Chaos Knight of Gamers number 10 and the Mirad Satellite E-Stars number 64 car. Uh, this is well out of the top 30. It's been a difficult day for the Mirad Satellite E-Stars team, otherwise known as the VRS Satellite Racing Crew. We'll see a number of their drivers in competition in a couple of hours in the final round of the ISO WC. A slightly different sort of a race when they head to the Brickyard for 500 miles of action in a Dallara IR18. It's always interesting to think about teams that split their times up like that as well, Sommel. I mean, you've got different drivers focusing on different things. It means that you can't necessarily all be working on the same setups yeah. and things like that. It means that you have to be a bit more focused in how you do things. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there's two different ways of going about it, as we see the Chaos Latin Gamers just... Well, Ooh. force a move? That's the most force move I've ever seen in my life. Felipe Ruiz is getting it a bit wrong Ooh. and just pushing the satellite car into the wall. That that was a bizarre one. I don't even know what to say. That was just aggression gone wrong. And well, maybe if there's going to be a penalty, it's likely not to come down on the number yeah. 64 car. So Celia Almeida will be a little bit disappointed at the elbows coming out at that point in time. but not necessarily his responsibility. Uh, yeah, to get back to that point though, Sam, I mean, it, it, it's difficult. I mean, an Indy car and a GT3 car, let's be honest, they're nothing alike. I mean, you, you might think that there's some sort of similarities that you can get to because they're both on the iRacing service, but you know, iRacing does a great job of simulating the various intricacies of both classes of racing and both, you know, types of racing. So for those teams, as Beneke goes faster, even, even though he's out front, no draft, 218207. It's interesting to see how teams take to that challenge. Yeah, no, 100%. Urano Racing having to defend, by the way, from MSI Esports, who go down the inside line, and they will have to better run to the outside. And this is going to be a fun one. More on that point later on, because this battle is spicing up. Williams looking to the inside as well, but MSI has the move done. DV1 tried and racing deep under the brakes. They'll be the next car to try and challenge the 94 Urano Esports HP machine. MSI now one position away from another car making its way into the prize money, but in front you can see the gap is very slightly opened up. Short Pure Sim Racing and Pure Sims, uh, the other of the Pure Sims car, of course, we did see Michael Evdoka having to retire the number 17 after contact early in the race through the comms. We've got three retirements, by the way, it does look like, or maybe I should say just two. The Orion Racing Team are rolling themselves off of pit road right now, so only Pure Sims and Race Clutch are still down on pit road. It's been a bit of a disappointing day, I'm sure, for both outfits who would have been hoping for some better luck, but they'll be watching on from the sidelines and enjoying, I'm sure, what should be a thrilling 22 hours and 22 minutes still to go. It's calmed down, Lewis, since the start of the race. I think these drivers know that now we're getting into those nighttime hours where keeping your car clean, getting to the final three or four hours of the race is going to be important so that you can fight with all your might to the end. 
Yeah, we're in proper endurance racing territory now. We've got past the first hour where it's been uh, all out attack. Now it's about uh, you, you, your goals. You, you get to the six hour mark, you get halfway, you get into the night, you get into the morning when that sun starts to rise again. It's all about those little goals that you get to. Uh, here's a team, DV1 Triton Racing. I'm not sure how much experience they've got in I racing. I know they've got plenty of experience elsewhere as a, a, a Polish team that has plenty of a success winning, uh, I think it's I think it was 2019, I think it was, where they won basically anything of like a, a in, in a sense of a Polish national esports championship in racing. Uh, they were the victors. They are such an incredibly strong team of, of drivers. And uh, Dominic Blyer has been uh, one of them for, for a fair while, who's really taken strength with that team. And DV1 Triton uh, spread themselves out. They're one of these teams that, that's now taken part in quite a lot of places uh, in sim racing. They're, they're spreading their wings a little bit. And to see them taking part here, fantastic effort from them right now running uh, uh, up just outside of the prize money positions we'll focus on that top 10 300 dollars uh, going to the bottom three of that top 10 but three thousand dollars going to the race winner prize money up for offers in a 24-hour race not something we get to speak about too much uh, in sim racing really is brilliant I wonder how you divide that. Do you divide it equally? Do you divide it by the number <laughs> of laps led? Do you divide it by the average lap time? Equal surely. Oh, uh, surely. I mean, especially when it comes to the big teams. But, <laughs> but I, I just like to enjoy, imagine some drama, internal drama when it comes to these teams and the, the ex insane amount of prize money that we have on the line. It's not just $10,000 in this 24-hour race, of course. $25,000 in total prize money on the line in the SCO Sprint Masters. We have a couple of weeks off before we get back to the action there. Three very interesting rounds still to go. You'll see teams like Logitech Dialtus who it took victory after a, what can you say, disappointing start to the season for them. Uh, missing out on round number two, being disqualified for both of the races in the first race weekend. Jordan Caruso and his teammate Cooper Webster being able to bounce back at Zolder very, very well. We'll return on August 14th from Monza for that race. I oh, can't imagine what type of uh, turn one, lap one shenanigans we might expect <laughs> there. Uh, then the week after that, we'll go to the Red Bull Ring, the newly minted Red Bull Ring here on the iRacing service. That will be August 21st before our season finale on the 28th of August. We head to the Nürburgring, but not the traditional GP layout. We'll be racing on the sprint layout for the shortest race of the season. And, and Sommel, I mean, you've been commentating on uh, the sprint challenge, which takes place on the Fridays before the Sprint Masters races, breaking out the GT4 machines. That's been pretty crazy. We saw some three wide action through turn two at the Hockenheim ring. It, we did, we did, as we see Max Benicke go out there and block in another fastest lap, which is mighty impressive. But coming back to the sprint challenge, Lewis and I have been having a gala time over there. That's been a wonderful series. There's a look from Williams on Altus, and they executed to perfection, much like the moves that we can see at Monza in the GT4 category. Finally, we may have a BMW winning, who knows? <laughs> well, we'll have to wait and see. Now here comes MSI. I think maybe the next car to try and get by Florian Denard in the Altus Esports number 43. That was a very well executed move. And now watch for the grunt of the Ferrari to pull it down. A side by side, DV1 Trident Racing looking to the inside of La Source, but superior momentum to Schulte Wisserman in the Urano Esports HP machine will hold off that charge for now. Here we go, thundering up the hill. It's flat out in a GT3 car as he crests over the top of Radion. This is where that drop becomes oh so important. In front of these cars, MSI a little bit too far behind. I think DB1 tried to race it because of that attempted move down the inside. Nothing doing there. Deep under the brakes from MSI. They get past Denard as well. There, into the top 10. Yeah, Mark Perez, that was a decent move. And like you say, door was opened up and uh, by by the Williams car. And they, they thought it was their chance to come through as well. So both MSI cars now inside the top 10, looking good for them. And uh, need to make some more progress at this point. Like I say, the top 10 being the prize money. So they've got themselves into that at the moment. Let's take a look at how that was done. Looks like it's going to be a pretty easy dive down into Lecom on the Lamborghini. Like I say, was fully alongside and wasn't really fought uh, too hard from Denard. Uh, also, so, by the way, from that race that we were talking about with DV1 Triton and Urano, uh, you've got uh, Oscari Rinna in the uh, course in racing Lamborghini, which, by the way, looks pretty, pretty nice in my opinion. 
I do like the course in Racing Room, but I'd love it on a Lambo. That looks fantastic. Uh, they are right involved in that fight now and dragging uh, Ross McFarlane, who's behind the wheel of the Pure Sims Esports at Audi, right into the mix. That's a car I think they're, they're pretty used to that uh, Audi now at Pure Sims, aren't they? They're, 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 I swear they always race in that car. They've been mixing it around a little bit. They did compete <laughs> in the GTC category. Uh, last year, of course, the Endurance, SEO Endurance Championship did bring back GT3 machines in a single main class for the winter season last time around. And some random trivia that one of the uh, administrators, Dominic Engel, has passed down to me about DV1 Trident Racing in GTC category. They were the first team to ever win an SEO race at Spa in this GT3 category. Okay. So there we go. They've got some history when it comes to this track, this car, this competition. We'll see exactly how things shake up for them as they try and work their way into the top 10 in towards the nighttime hours. It is now past 5.15 at the virtual spa. We are 15 minutes away from getting to another pit stop cycle. It will also be uh, the time when Lewis and myself say goodbye, leave you in the very capable hands of Samuel Aurora and Stefan Schlacker. We were talking about rain slightly earlier. Let's bring this up once again, because I have to correct myself on something I was saying. It is not due for public release later in 2021. It will be an internal release. The alpha and beta testers will get their, their very, very lucky hands on the rain. And some wonderful pictures have been released on social media. There you can take a look at uh, one. Thanks to our producer, Hugo Luis, for getting that up on screen. You can see the puddles. You can see the spray. Sommel, this is going to be epic. This is going to kill a few computers. This <laughs> is going to damage a few a few graphic cards in the process as well, but this will be stunning. Can you imagine, right? What we're seeing right now is a Grand Prix car. That's one of the McLarens of the 2015 Formula One season, but can you just imagine once the Nürburgring 24 hours with rain on iRacing? How sick would that be? Now, I can't go, or can you imagine the World Championship races with the IRO1 on the rain? That, yeah. No, wait. I've no, just said I, that they do World Championship with the R01, haven't they? Yes, no, but that, that's public. There's, there's qualifiers going on uh, for that one. Uh, race is <laughs> taking place every Thursday. RHG and Apex Racing Team have been the two strongest competitors in that one. Uh, Martin Van Lusenord, who we, we've talked yeah. about on so many occasions here on RaceBot TV, most recent winner in those qualification Super Session races beating out the Apex Racing duo of Johan Harth and newly minted Apex Racing team member Ben Fuller. You can see MSI has gotten on past Williams as well, so that Ferrari is charging through to the front of this pack. Going back to the rain, though, I, first, I don't want to think about the proposition of, of the, the IRO1s on, on in rain, because it's already chaotic <laughs> enough when it comes to racing in the dry. Don't want to think about what it would be like uh, when you throw rain into the equation as well. What I do want to say is it's going to be interesting, like you said, Samuel, when we go to the Norschleifer once more for our Nürburgring 24 hours, because we might need some, as we'd say in the in the, in the the software world, some, some hard coding, because we need that cycle. We need to go from dry to rain to hail to yes. snow to, to dry to snow. To, we need that sort of chaos to be a, a constant fixture at a race like that. And, and also things like it's raining on one part of the circuit, but it's dry yeah. on the other, which which happens so often at the Nürburgring because it's so long. It, it's it's going to be oh, fun. Man. It's going to be such an interesting <laughs> dynamic changer to how things work here on the iRacing service, and especially if they get mixed into the equa equation on those iRacing special events. So here we go, about 10 minutes away from that pit stop window. The question I have is who's done the best job of saving fuel? That gap out front, we've seen the lap times from Beneke continue to just be rapid, Lewis. The gap, six and a half seconds. Well, obviously on the first in red line went, I mean, for, for anyone who's not joined us since the start of this race and hasn't seen the, the pit lane sequence unfold before, uh, red line saved one extra lap of fuel while sat behind the, uh, the, the trio, or well, it was a quartet at that point, wasn't it? Uh, the trio they were battling with being the MSI Esports and the two VRS Coanda cars, uh, the Lego Technic Esports one as well. Uh, they were they were basically sat there, they were waiting, they were uh, saving fuel, did have a little bit of a dive, did lead a couple of laps, but it was more about trying to extend that mileage, whereas now they've been driving around by themselves. Whether they are almost 
burning that extra lap of fuel again to try and build the gap out an extra couple of seconds here and there and uh, they'll accept uh, coming in uh, on the same lap as everyone else or whether they'll only go the single lap further whether anyone else has been able to save I would suspect and I would be very very surprised I know it's a thirsty car anyway but the surely the Lego Technic car at least them they are going a lap longer on this thing surely they, they if, if they have any aspirations of winning this race i know it's very early stages still they have to go a lap longer kind of a question now for you guys because charlie collins the young welshman uh, we we don't know if, if his family member Bryn collins is also part of the family and now joining up with the brs commander team but i was talking with uh one of my teammates who, who was saying that now at the age of, I think he was saying 45, he feels very, very old in sim racing. What is too old when it comes to sim racing in your mind? Because the one thing that is for sure is sim racing is a an esport where time, just like all esports, if we're being honest, time is the thing that you need. You need time to practice. You need time to talk to your teammates. You need time to work on strategies. What do you think is too old? Because I'll be honest, at, at the ripe old age of 27, sometimes, Samuel, I feel a little bit too old at this point to be competing with some of these guys. Yeah, no, I don't think there's an age per se. I mean, just a reminder, say, from the Arnash competition team that's racing right here, one of their drivers, Ricardo Ferreira, 38 years old from Portugal, he's super fast, and even though he might be slightly older than all the others, he's, he's just as quick. If anything, I think when you get older, when you've got more experience on your side, things can be slightly better. And say, for instance, once you've crossed the mark of 50, once you're done with work and once you can focus more on your hobbies, per se, it can give you more time to practice on sim racing. So I don't think there's, an, there's a real age, per se, unless you're driving the R01, which requires so much of hand-eye coordination, much more than the GT3 cars. But no, I think, I think we're yet to see a driver like Roger Federer in the world of tennis, who has, who has stretched the boundaries, has competed beyond, say, an age of 45 or 50 to do so well. I think, I think we're in to find these sort of discoveries in sim racing in the next few years. Part of that comes from, so to, to use tennis as a good example, actually, because obviously, you know, the likes of Federer and whatnot, uh, you know, you've, uh, you know, Djokovic, Nadal, etc., where they've competed at the, the top level for, for 10 years, for 20 exactly. years. The tennis, though, is, 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 a, is a, a, a game, a sport that doesn't necessarily change that much. It, it remains the same, whereas sim racing is something, and it's like it's a wild leap there to compare the two, but, uh, you know, follow with us here. Yeah? But sim racing is something which has changed so, so much, so dramatically, where uh, uh, having skills that were applicable 20 years ago aren't applicable to the same level as they are now and uh, that's even you know between different simulators and stuff it's uh, more akin to even something like the world of cycling and being uh, good at time trials and not so good on mountains and then uh, the, the 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 world of that will change more to to be in the focus of time trialists or mountainers or sprinters or uh, that kind of stuff and uh, you know with technology movement it's a bit more akin in, in that kind of department that's where you don't tend to see people dominate for for, for 10 years unless uh, in 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 cycling uh, it, it, that's where this kind of comes into it a bit more where we you, you the younger generation coming into sim racing are just more uh, uh, easily able in a sense to adapt to all the things they don't need to fall back on experience quite as much because they just adapt to, to what's ahead of them so so two things to go back to the to the to our to our own ages as well our producer hugo <laughs> luis of course one of the three i racing open wheel world champions going back to of course those days when the the formula one cars were in action uh hugo started sim racing 20 years ago when sommel wasn't even born uh <laughs> in, just crazy. Of course, uh, Hugo has competed on other simulators, not just iRacing. But the second thing I have to say when it comes to, to sim racing, uh, pointed out by David Haynes, our colleague at RaceBot TV, that will take you through the second and fourth stint of today's action, is we broadcast something on, on RaceBot TV, 60 plus racing adventures, where all the drivers are, as, as the name would imply, 60 years of age or older. So not just a young man's game it is very much something that everyone enjoys we've covered stuff like the real racers virtual club where you've got drivers who are very active when it comes to real world motorsports and, and track days and things like that coming to iRacing and trying to hone their craft learn tracks and all sorts of things maybe just at the top level like i said it's that time investment obviously then you've got those mental and, and, and physical uh, capabilities and capacities which 
Obviously, sometimes the younger guys have a little bit of an edge on as well, but not necessarily a, a young man's game, just maybe at the top level of motorsport. Seven minutes to go till the top of the hour. Let's quickly run through how our predictions have been going so far. Let's start with you first, Lewis. Like, I'm going to be honest, I don't exactly remember who we all picked because it's been a crazy opening two hours here so okay. far. But it's been a fun two hours for sure. I picked the red line car, same as you, and uh, uh, Sommel picked the MSI Esports car. You should be more on it, mate. I, I probably should be a bit <laughs> more on it. I've been too busy looking at all of these rain pictures and, and drooling and going, ooh, ah, this is going to be fun. So, okay, I, I mean, all of our picks are then up there in the top two. There's still a long way to go, but the good news, at least, Sommel, is we haven't put the RaceBot TV commentators curse down yes. on any of these guys. Yet. That's a very important word that's mentioned by Lewis right there. Yet. Now, uh, I think we need to come up with some sort of lucky piece or something. People have rabbit's foot or whatnot. Yeah. Luckily, <laughs> we have not been there. And maybe that explains why I just got a wooden table a few months ago <laughs> after after all that we had in another Top and John series on iRacing where we, we actually did end up doing quite a lot of bad luck. I just had to get a wooden table and now it's working quite well. I haven't had a commentator's curse since. since oh, see, now you had to say that. Yeah. November. You You've exactly. literally just opened it up, mate. <laughs> you are literally asking for the, the gods of iRacing to strike you down. I will say, nothing is as bad as our what you and I saw a couple of weeks ago, Lewis, in the ISOWC, where our co-commentator, Lorenzo Bonder, literally could not say something nice yeah. about a driver without them spinning out literally as he was talking. It was <laughs> sensational. He was talking up someone quite, uh, quite highly, and then didn't they hit a... a the the lesser scene and by lesser scene I mean I have genuinely never seen it on a broadcast where they hit um, a, a nothing uh, essentially and exploded it was a landmine uh, and 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 boom away it went it was uh, insane never seen that before on a broadcast I've seen you know you see clips of it because obviously thousands of people uh, do their their laps again and again and again uh, did we pass a record on laps by the way on I race recently that was completed to show how many had been done um, and yeah just just basically went oh they're doing quite oh, boom oh, off he goes. <laughs> uh, and our producer Hugo has, uh, has maybe intimated that there was an SEO race in the past where uh, Will Vincent, of course, who has been off air on a race spot for a while in behind the scenes role, will be looking forward to getting him back on air for some broadcast later this year, hopefully, uh, got kicked out of the server because he was jinxing everyone he's talked about. So I think <laughs> the one standard piece of kit that race spot now needs when it comes to uh, new commentators joining the team is clearly a solid block of mahogany <laughs> or whatever it is to ensure that we can knock on wood at every single time. Or just have the Racebot logo on your car. Bingo. There we go. 20 horsepower per logo you have. Or <laughs> if you prefer, there are alternate logos that can get you uh, some grip hacks, as, as we've commented on the past. Let's do with five minutes left to go. A bit of a roundup in terms of the running order before we get to the pit cycle. It is still red line out front now, though, almost seven seconds clear of the MSI Esports blue car. Alejandro Sanchez still behind the wheel of the 47, trying to chase down Max Beneke, but Beneke has been unrelenting and unstoppable out front. The only car to dip into the 217s his fastest lap, a 9.82. Last time around, only a couple of tenths off that, a 2.18.127. Charlie Collins for the LEGO Technic Esports team, the 92 car there in third with his main championship rival in the SEO Sprint Masters Series, the VRS commander driver of Joshua Rogers in fourth position right behind him. Then you find the team Redline Blue car. Chris Lullum has managed to pull a bit of an advantage over Kevin Ellis Jr. behind, but Kevin Ellis using those rally cross skills he's been honing in those world championship qualifiers drifting around the com to get past msi esports red who find themselves in the uh, sorry not msi esports red rag esports in their porsche who are in seventh and have dropped off the tail of these two cars very harshly not sure where the pace has gone for vlad kimichev in that eight car in eighth position, that strategy gamble for Sven Haase has somewhat paid off after starting down on pit road. Haase in the Beeler Racing Team number 46 car finds himself in eighth, but he might be swarmed by the chasing pack behind. Yeah. First, MSI Esports in the second Ferrari that sits in ninth, and we're riding on board with Daniel Lafuente, the first of the BMWs on the edge of those top 10 positions. As down the inside, there does go Mark Perez, 
Hasa will now have to defend for all of his might as Lafuente with the over-under is going to get the move done. Bila Racing Team dropped out to the 10th position. Florian Denard in the Logitech G Altus number 43 and 11. With DV1 Trident Racing 12th, Urano Esports 13th, Corsim Racing 14th, Pure Sims in 15th. And these, those cars are all in this grouping that is from 8th on backwards. It was an interesting strategy call, Lewis, from the Bila Racing Team car, but let's be honest, it has worked a treat as we work our way into the pit stop cycle. Yeah, I know they've just dropped a couple of positions there, but let's be honest, consider where they were. That's always what you have to do with these risks on strategy. You have to think about uh, where they uh, have been before the pits lane sequence and where they are presently. I mean, uh, Somo, they've been doing so well on uh, on where they've, they've positioned themselves in strategy. They've worked their way up the order, and whilst they may not be in the top 10 once they come into the pit lane sequence quite soon, they've made an awful lot of progress. They absolutely have, but this lap is just going to be super, super essential for them. I was wondering all this while, well, where would Bila end up? They eventually ended up losing some three odd seconds in the last 30 minutes, which is not bad, by the way. But with this potentially being the last lap on this thing for them, they have got to defend for all their life right now, because Bila have got so many other cars that are faster, that have two more fresher wheels. This is going to be an ultimate thrill ride for them. If they can keep their position when they go into the pit lane, there's a lot to gain and they might just lose it, you know? And as we watch that Bila car defending from the Lamborghini behind, just a reminder that if you're enjoying the action here today, plenty more GT3 competition to come over the month of August. Three more rounds in the SEO Sprint Masters Championship. It'll all pick back up on August the 14th with another triple header to get us to the end as Beneke goes faster once more. A 217-874. That Ferrari is well and truly flying. $25,000 on the line in the SCO Sprint Masters. Do not miss any of that action. Lewis McLeod and myself, Arjuna Kankipati, will bring you the action along with Hugo Luis in the production booth. And the Friday before each of those GT3 races, you can catch the Sprint Challenge with the GT4 cars. Lewis McLeod and Samuel Aurora to bring you through two 60-minute races every race weekend. As we come to the conclusion of the hour, though, it is time to hand over to the very capable Samuel Aurora and Stefan Schlacker. Thank you for tuning in to these opening two hours. We'll see you next time for more SEO competition. Well then, here we are with 21 hours and 59 minutes to go. It's been an amazing first couple of hours with Arjuna Kankipati and, of course, Liz McGlade joining myself on the commentary booth. But now, of course, it is time to welcome in my partner for the next four hours. We've got Stefan Schlacker right here along with me. And this is going to be a fun ride. This is going to be a fun part of the race because now strategy has become quite a lot of fun. With Team Redline, of course, going the distance in that first thing, extending their stint by one lap. And that has meant that they rejoined, well, 3.5 seconds ahead of the rest. But eventually, they've built that gap up and they have doubled it in that last hour. Stefan, so far, Redline have been on a march. But now, in this pit stop cycle, I think that's when we can really see the gap sort of cut down right now. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I have been trying to keep up with all of it uh, as best as possible. Obviously, had to also look out for my guys over in the number 99 car. Uh, but yeah, it, it's been incredible what uh, Redline has been able to do once again. I mean, they have been doing that already in the official iRacing 24 hour just one yeah. week and they go but doing this on a completely different strategy in a completely different car has been honestly mighty impressive not only about what the uh, speaking volumes about what the drivers can do but also what this team as a whole can pull up and when you consider that team redline actually were competing with the bmw on the iRacing spa 24 hours only a week ago it's a bit insane to think that with the ferrari with the bop constantly changing they're actually able to come in. They're actually able to deliver such a good race so far. But again, it, it feels like an unnecessary reminder, this one. But I've got to do what I've got to do. This race has still got a long way to go. As Beeler Racing Team Euronics almost see a move on them by the DV1 Triton team. Remember I said only a minute ago, this is going to be a critical lap for Beeler. And finally, we have one car on the pits. It's the Vendival Sim Racing car. No, no, that's Apex Racing. I'm sorry. That is coming to the pit right now bit early, no? Considering all the other teams are able to go an even lap longer now. 
Yeah, um, uh, there has been interesting strategy developments uh, already since pretty much the first stint because uh, like Red Line Blue, who have been able to go 29 laps on their first stint, which is mighty impressive, especially because um, they have limited fuel uh, compared to what they're actually able to do. And then going a lap longer than what we saw in the official iRacing 24, where uh, BS Competition surprised everybody with being able to go 28 laps from the get-go. Um, quite honestly, there's a lot of development that I didn't expect. Indeed, and in the background, you saw Baylor Racing Team Euronics being passed right there by the DV1 Triton Racing Team, critically for P number 10 for the prize pool positions right now. So that was a big move happening in there. And we also saw Urano Esports being challenged by Core Sim Racing. So fun stuff going on, but you're absolutely right, Stefan. I wonder how you can actually eke out 29 laps from there. We saw a few onboards, we saw some of the fuel saving, but how frustrating is it to do that sort of fuel saving when you know that there's so much time you can get from the car as Urano send it down the inside right here at Wuhan. Ghost Sim Racing might go up there, pull a sneaky and get both positions at one time. Dealer Racing Team Urano's defend. Urano have to go to the inside line and so they do with some confidence. Ghost Sim oh! Racing is coming, they make contact and Beeler have lost 2-1. They have lost two and one and nearly get spun around this time around once again. But I have to say, they may have lost two positions, but they've most definitely saved the race. They have. Vila could have been out of this race in one shot with that car going almost the wrong way around. The awesome Z Sports are going to attack them. They're not going to show any sympathy at all for Vila Racing Team Unix. They say, well, you may have lost three positions on the last lap. Make that four, my friend. And so to the outside, they try. Not make it working out this time. It's a Beeler Racing Team Euronix. No, it's not a Beeler sandwich. It's a pure sim sandwich. And they all die for the quick lane. That, <laughs> that got a bit crazy, didn't they? Yeah, I'm, I'm honestly a little bit surprised that nobody off that pack is able to go a lap longer. Especially being stuck behind other cars. Should be yeah. easy to save that much more fuel, but... Apparently, not so in this battle pack, just probably fighting way too much as we have a little bit of side by side there between Bila and Kor. Indeed, oh, this is in the pit lane, Triton, right there, getting a bit too crazy. And, and you might be wondering how did they not crash? Well, it's sim racing, you can ghost past just a little bit. But yes, everyone coming into the pit lane five minutes after the R is done, but crazy step when the cars are going a lap longer here. And wait a minute, is that Pure Sims who got the jump on go in the pits? That's wow. Pure that got passed. <laughs> I'm, I'm, okay. I'm right now confused um, how all of that worked out, but either way, they're all in pit lane. Some uh, drivers go stepping out, stepping in. What is happening here with Pure Sims? And I think, I think they did a Sebastian Vettel from, from China in 2015. They made up a position in the pit lane. <laughs> and, and that just is one of the more bizarre overtakes you will see. Now, of course, it depends on, it depends on how much fuel they take in on whether they come out on top or not. But that is just fantastic. I'm, I'm a little bit out of loss of words here. About that situation, <laughs> but all in all, uh, I don't think it's going to change much in the grand scale of things because they're all still going to be able to, uh, yeah, exit the pit lane at the same time as we have to two VRS Kuana Sim Sport teams driving through pit lane. Uh, the red line blue joins them as well, so the top three into the pit lane they go, pretty much on the dart of 21 hours and 53 minutes to go. Indeed they do, and this is going to be critical, so watch out for where you see Team Redline. Where is the 71 car? Where do we see the MSI Esports 47 car? That is going to be the marker that you have to track right now, because Coanda, both their cars, by the way, the, the LEGO Technic and the and the Coanda Simsport machine have gone a lap longer. Remember, heading into this pit cycle, the red line car was seven seconds ahead of both the Coanda and the MSI cars. Where do they come out? Of course, will they be getting guys this time? Um, I don't know right now the track temperature, so I can't tell you exactly. 
but I think we should see Tyre. Uh, but we focus on that later as we see MSI Esports, who have come up a bit close to Williams Esports, who have gained quite a fair bit of time, but a word on the go car. Remember that incident we saw just a few seconds ago with Core Sim Racing being passed in the pit lane by Pure Sims? Well, that happened because Core ran out of fuel. Oh, Crazy. Well, that explains things why they were so slow. I was wondering. Yeah. I guess they, they were really slow right there. Um, and yeah, as expected, uh, Quanda and Lego both up on the jacks. New fresh stacker tires gonna go on to these Porsches. And that will be fun. So they will be mighty quick in a situation like this one. So here we see on the left hand side the MSI car and the Williams car both tagging along. How close will they be to both the Coanda machines when they come out? Jacks are down, cars are out. Do they get in the lead in this case? Remember, the MSI 48 and the Williams Esports car still yet to pit in a situation like this one. So they are your provisional readers, but this is the car to watch out for. The Red Line 71, they lost time. Oh no, they haven't. Oh, wait a minute. That is a hefty blow. Coanda have rejoined way behind. Oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah, the 71 is well ahead of Koanda and Lego, but also I'm a little bit surprised about how much the red line blue is behind two Porsches, the 91 and 92. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That is also an interesting battle that's going on right now. So why have we seen red line go that much faster? Why are we seeing that much quicker of a stop? That's because red line, they seemingly haven't taken tires. 20 seconds faster, their pit stop. So essentially, if you cut down that window, red line are, are still... Red line and MSI would be around... Yeah, 20 odd seconds ahead, which is still, still amazing. But yes, strategy is the difference. So keep a keen eye on Redline and MSI Esports in this situation. They, of course, have changed up the strategy. They have tried something different. And, and Stefan, how hard is it in this stint of this race, when the heat is certainly on you, to actually go for a double, which is what Redline are doing right now? Well, I have to say, in this kind of case, um, they're pretty much copying what they did um, last weekend because last mm. weekend they also went with a uh, single stint and then a double stint on their tires so uh, yeah no uh, they, they should be most definitely used to what they have in front of them because of how uh, much they're copying their strategy from last weekend however yeah. uh, there's just that one big game changer that is the temperature because last weekend the temperature in the early stages of this race was as high as we see today before. Yeah, exactly. So that's going to be a bit of a factor as well. And you saw, and you were on the commentary boot for that particular race, Stefan. And that was a proper red line dominance all the way through. I mean, uh, for, for a large part of it. But still, this is a very interesting challenge now. Because red line have, have tried, I mean, I wouldn't say the unthinkable, but the improbable in a way by going for a double sit in that Ferrari. This yeah. is going to be interesting, and, and they can do that because they built out such a big gap to Coanda before the stop. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it, it's going to be interesting to see how much the other teams have learned. I mean, yes, we have a different BOP from last week, but still, yeah. uh, everything still applies to everybody. So um, to actually see what these guys are going to be able to do uh, against Team Redline should be very interesting. There's just that one question mark that still is uh, kind of hanging above everybody, and that is VRS Corona Sim Racing. They did not participate in last weekend's yep. race, so there's a lot of data that they have maybe lost compared to Team Redline when it goes into uh, the racing. But however, obviously on the same side, you can say that um, Team Redline can't use all of the data they have gained last weekend, yes. especially because it was a much different car that they were driving, because that back then was the BMW and not the Ferrari that they're driving today. Move made for P number 10, Beeler Racing Team Euronics, who had a mighty stint in the first half with Sven Haaser climbing back. They've moved up into P number 10. And that is such a good point, Stefan. I think with Redline right now, 
it only might make you more tired to have two 24-hour races in a row, especially when you can't quite take any of these learnings, because here in this case, they're driving a Ferrari, which is way, way different than the BMW that we're seeing right here. But coming on Redline in a second, I want to speak about Williams Esports and the number 25 machine. They have gone for an outrageous thing. They're just in the pit lane right now. And that is some 15 minutes later than when all the other cars are stopping. That must have been a crazy stint for Williams. Yeah, most definitely. But uh, Williams, once again, I, I don't think they have been able to learn from the mistakes they have made in the iRacing Spa 24 hour uh, because they were one of their favorites going into the race. I think nobody can deny that that Williams versus Team Redline was the big storyline heading into the RSC Spot in power. However, they have very much underperformed of what Williams normally is capable to do. Um, there was, I think, only one car finished inside the top five last weekend. And that was also because in the very end, on the last lap, in the last corner, Williams uh, or the Mali Racing Team got hit by the Williams Esports car. Uh, to give themselves a penalty because they exceeded 100 incident points and thus dropped out of the top five and into seventh position at the very end. But still, Williams Esports in that BMW, they have been racing this car as well in the R6 Spot for They have been the big storyline as the other performer of that race. And it seems like they're still continuing on that struggle to understand the BMW perfectly here at, Spa, uh, at the Spa uh, racing track. But there's been lots of talk about BOP, of course, and yeah, we said it, it's going to be spoken about again and again constantly over the course of this broadcast. But I love how Lewis McGlade put it a few minutes ago when we were on air with him. He said that everyone's going to complain about BOP, everyone's not going to be happy with it, but it opens up a, a bigger variety. So say you might say the Porsche is faster on the launch stints and the BMW might be faster in terms of tire saving, who knows? I'm not quite sure because we don't have access to that data. but. I, I love this aspect, right, where we see different cars of different strengths and we see such a variety in the mix. Of course, no Mercedes anywhere close to the top order, but still, Ferraris, Porsches, Lamborghinis, Audis, all in there in the top 15. Yeah, very much so. I think uh, the fast Mercedes right now is actually uh, Fuga. Um, uh, they're sitting in, I think they're sitting now in... 19th or 20th, something like that. A 22nd, actually. Uh, I think they're still a f the first Mercedes in the order. Uh, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> you know, there's one thing about BOP. If there's a top team that is not complaining about how the BOP is, there's something majorly wrong because that <laughs> car then obviously is OP and needs to be bopped once again. So. Everybody is complaining, especially Williams. Um, everybody who is in that SEO knows Williams yeah. has been on the forefront about complaining about the BOP, and there has actually been a BOP change just yesterday uh, with a few cars getting a little bit less of a weight added to their cars, so a little bit of a weight reduction. Some cars, like for example the Mercedes and the BMW as well, have received a minus five kilogram weight penalty so they still have quite a lot of uh, weight to them but has been uh, five kilograms removed of that weight penalty that they had to carry so um, yes very much BOP always a big talking point in any series that uses BOP but a BOP is a necessary thing in a yeah. spec series like this because you have so many different cars and you need to be able to have same-ish performance by every single car so that you don't have a all of a sudden single make class just because of how OP one of the cars is. To be fair, the organizers of the sports car open, well, it may not may not focus more on the BO, on the BMW, but all the way through, it's it's quite good to see the variety that we're seeing on the grid right now. And it's a bit insane that last week all the BMWs were dominating, and right now they know where. But but full credits to Williams, by the way, full credits to Williams for actually taking up the, the BMW to such a high position right now. It may not be the fastest car for sure, but they are making it work. And that's what matters at the end of the day. You've got to work with whatever you have right now. And Williams are doing that to, to the best of their abilities. But let's see how it works out. I mean, if, if you just look at last weekend where the Ferrari was, like, yeah. uh, I, I don't think we even had a Ferrari 
in the in the top split uh, last weekend. So yeah. um, SEO has done a very good job to to bring the field to a level where the Ferrari is also capable of being fast on a track where it technically shouldn't be fast because it's just against all of his strengths and for all of its weaknesses. So uh, SEO, the organizers have done a very great job in bringing this field to a point where we see a fast Mercedes, where we see a fast Ferrari. Yeah. It's just a shame that we don't see a fast Ferrari. <laughs> someday we will. Hopefully someday we will. But yeah, you could hear Danny Lafuente saving a lot of fuel on there. I think the Ferrari has just come back like The Undertaker in a way. I mean, it was no way only a couple of weeks ago. And all of a sudden, all of the top teams are using that. And I was intrigued initially to see, why is Team Redline using a Ferrari? Why is MSI Esports going for a Ferrari? But you can see the reason why. They are one and two right now. At Coanda, even with the Porsche making it work. I think it's only fair to say, Stefan, that this feels like a Spa 24. We've got so much variety at the top of the grid and all the teams are able to compete properly. Well, I mean, only last year we did not have the BMW, we did not have uh, the Porsche as well. Now it finally feels a lot more, a lot more like the real world championships in a way. Yeah, exactly. Um, we also have uh, so many more cars uh, that are being used and not just, as I said, that single car class. Uh, even though there would be many more. So, BOP does bring good things to the racing. You can say whatever you want about BOP, but it is a necessary evil to bring many different car styles uh, to one place and make them safe fast over the course of not only a stint, but also over the course of a race. So, it's gonna be very intriguing how this BOP will play out, especially when we head into the night of things here at the spot. And which is why this race is so different. It's just not a carbon copy of what we saw last week in the iRacing Spa 24 hours. It is totally different as we see Williams Esports getting a bit too close to the MSI Esports car right now. And lots of people, uh, Stefan, lots of people have come up and said, yeah, but you're just having two Spa 24 hours in a row. It's not going to be fun. It's just the same race. You're going to see the same thing over and over again. I think it's changed because of that. I think, I think we love that things are a bit interesting in this aspect that the competitive order has been changed and so it, it, we may have lots of teams competing in both races but it's a completely different feel to each one of them i mean yes and no it, 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 the, the feel of the racing itself is a little bit different because you have to fight against different cars and a little bit of a different weapon to yourself because of the BOP is being a little bit different however in the terms of the spa 24 obviously it is a back-to-back -back spa 24 so um Yes, very much is the same exact race. You're going to be able to do the same exact things. And in the case of, for example, Williams, I don't even think that their setups are too much different, uh, even though there's a BUP difference. So for these guys, obviously, they have taken the easy route, just adjust your setup a tiny bit for the BUP changes and be done with it but uh for, for teams like for example team redland i know we want to get mentioning these guys but they have been racing the bmw there they're now racing the ferrari and that is a very different place for them because obviously the ferrari requires a whole lot of different things as we might see bmw past a ferrari and very much so that is a position change so with that we now have williams esports past msi esports for ninth place you're not watching Formula 1 from 2002, by the way. It is actually the BMW getting past the Ferrari right here, which may seem like common features until last week, but this year, thing, uh, this uh, week, I'm sorry, things are a bit different. So, Williams Esports, again, as I mentioned, making the best of the BMW as they can. I think we've had enough of a chat on, on BOP and what the after effects of that can be. So far, things are quite good, but I think there's a lovely top topic being ruined up in the chat right now, Stefan, about Spa. We've literally, we're literally going to end up this weekend with 48 hours worth of racing at Spa within two weeks. How insane is that? I think, I think at this stage, all the commentators, all the drivers, I think Hugo who's producing and who's done, I think 36 hours of production of those 48 will be just remembering all these corners in, in our dreams, basically. We can see it when we sleep as well. Um, well, for, for like even for me, it will be uh, 12, 22 hours that 22 I'll be hours, commentating yeah. on. 
uh, from these two races. So I've nearly done a Spa 24 of commentating myself um, <laughs> in these two weekends. But I can tell you most definitely I hate Spa. I will always hate Spa and it's not going to change a thing about how I perceive this track. Come on, it's not that bad. We'll get to that it's point in a second, but I have to speak about Ricardo Ferreira right now. For racing for Arnage competition. It's good that we've seen Arnage right now. Of course, a newer team, by the way, with, with a special investor be coming behind them and supporting them all the way through. We, we hadn't quite seen a lot of them until the SEO Master Series early on this year, where they had a tremendous opening round. But after that, things have been okay. Things have not gone the way they actually wanted to they're getting back on track and I love it I love the pink livery I love the way the team is decked out and the way they're branded all the way through and Ricardo of course one of the older drivers bringing in the experience to that team and so far Stefan so good for them so far so good so okay out to go uh P17 right now that's pretty much exactly also where they were running in last yeah. week's race uh, so, same-ish thing for them. They're also, I think they were running also the BMW last BMW, weekend, yeah. if I remember correctly. So, Arnaz, uh, yeah, one of those teams again. I mean, it is only one week, so there isn't much time uh, that you can uh, dedicate to looking at the data of the last week's race and try to come up with a new solution to problems that you face there and that you're still going to be facing this weekend. So. Um, yeah, Arnage is still doing a very good job. I mean, they were one of the cars in the last weekend that were running into problems um, and had a nice fight back through a little bit of the field to get back to that uh, midfield position. So I really wouldn't count out Arnage here. I uh, think they, if, if they can keep their car clean and not get hit by other drivers, uh, I think they're one of those teams that can go for a top 10 finish here today. Exactly, it's a it's a real possibility, and they are making things work out quite a fair bit on our competition. I, I just like a team with pink livery. I just do. I, I know Mac Packham from the Virtual Racing School Coanda team will support me on this one. He's a big big fan of the color pink as I am as well. A bit bit of an unusual color, but unusually special. You love to see it at times. But coming back to Spa, why why do you hate Spa, Stefan? I I don't. Is it just because we've done too much of Spa in the last couple of weeks, perhaps? No, um, I hate this track with a passion, no matter what uh, goes <laughs> on on it. Um, it. It is just one of those extremely overrated tracks. No matter where you go, you always see Spa in any series at any point of that schedule. And it's just an overused track. It doesn't really give you any uh, overtaking opportunities. You have three Does overtaking opportunities around seven kilometers of track. That's just not good enough because there are many shorter circuits that have as many passing zones as Spa from the show. What does it not? We've got La Source and uh, this That's corner fun. right here. We've yeah, got Le Con. That's Yeah, true. we've got uh, Puon, if you're daring enough, in a GT3 car, which some people have been. We have got Blanchiment. Yeah. Come on, Blanchiment, it's also not counting. You only have three passing opportunities. It's it's La Source, Le Cum, and the Chicane. That's three passing opportunities. If we go, for example, to the Nürburgring, you have also uh, uh, the Yokohama hairpin. You have um, the hairpin at the bottom of the track, and then you have the NGK Chicane, if it's the slow burst. So that's, once again, three passing opportunities in a matter of five kilometers. Yeah, but uh, but when you come to the Notch Lifer, which is a, a, a long circuit, there's barely any. I mean, I mean, if, if we're just looking at overtaking opportunities, the Notch Lifer might be one of the worst, because there's only a real chance of the dotting of her. By the, I mean, so so that's it. It's highly crazy. wrong. <laughs> that is that is highly wrong to say that their only passing opportunity around the Notch Life is the dirting of her. Where else can you do that on the GT3 kind of 24 hours? Honestly. Uh, well, Adenauer Forced very much is a passing opportunity. Uh, then you have Adenberg, that's no, also a passing it's, opportunity. It's a bit hard when you come down and descend in. I mean, it's a very narrow section you need to add now, so. Uh, well, any section around the neighboring Notch Life yeah, is a very narrow one. 
Um, so that argument really does count. But it still always is at least uh, wide enough for two cars to fit. Then you also have um, Bergwerk, that is also a passing opportunity that mm. you can use. Obviously also uh, Stahlstrecke, that is another passing opportunity. I know I'm missing a few in between that are also passing opportunity. Um, there, there, as I said, there are so many passing opportunities on other tracks as well. And I just think that at, at this point, Spa Francorchamps just has that... It's like Monaco. It's a track that has so much hype around it for no reason whatsoever uh, that these tracks just will never die just because of the R Spa Francorchamps and the uh, Monte Carlo racetrack. No, 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 no. I, I, I've got to disagree respectfully on that. I think I think Spa is just the best place to be for an endurance race, as we're also seeing in the real-world race as well. So much drama right there. So many opportunities. I mean, yes, it's only got three opportunities, but it's a lot on how you can actually make it work out all the way, right? You've got the flowy sections in the middle that are so much fun to drive on. They've got, they've got pool on. There's Biff Bath. There's, you know, I, I, See, but, but that, that's, that, exactly, no, that's exactly the thing. It's a great track to drive at for something to drive for track day even. It's perfectly uh, suitable because it has so many uh, fast flowing sections and uh, the track itself flows very nicely. But for racing, it's just not that great because of how little of the overtaking opportunities you actually get around such a long track. But looking at this battle once again back before we start to fight here in this booth um, <laughs> the number 16 still is following the Bila racing team uh which is i think that is the 45. yeah now we, we could go on and on about this for a long time but we've got a race on our hands and it's a fun race this one Bila racing team you by the way they are the car we are going to focus on for a little bit they rejoin well they were pretty decent the 45 machine they've also been climbing up the order but nothing like the 46. They've been holding on to P11 for quite a while. And at the start of this team, they dropped back down to MSI Esports. But considering that they started from the pick lane, it is just insane. But Sven Hasse, Sven Hasse was on fire at the start of this race. And it, it may look like a very audacious strategy to go for two tires at the start of this race, but he's made it work so much so that teams like Redline and MSI Esports have got the confidence to double stint as well. Yeah, we, we're, we're going to have to see how that is all going to go for these teams. Um, especially for the guys that didn't take tires whatsoever. Uh, we have seen in the Spa 24 last weekend that the teams who did take uh, a hard work on double stints on their tires lost about a second a lap in the, the second stint on their tires. So, uh, very much is a little bit of a gamble if you can pull it off and lose less time than to gain in the pit, which by the way is 24 seconds, that you're faster stationary uh, or, or shorter stationary than a car that takes four tires. Um, it most definitely can pay off uh, for the Euronix car. Obviously, it is a little bit different for them. It's only 12 seconds because they did take two tires. So if they lose less than 12 seconds to the competitors, most definitely has paid out, but at what real cost? Like you're wearing out two drivers more than with new tires. And is that gamble really gonna work in the long run to have your driver wear being worn out a little bit more than the guys on four fresh tires? So true, so, so true, but Bila have gone back and they've actually taken in pressure rubber right now, so they've negated that, but you're right, it, it can be so such a fatiguing experience to go for two tires in a situation when the temperatures are so high, but they've made it work, Bila Racing Team and all the other teams are double stinting now as well, and riding on board right now with Yellow Walters of Five Star Motorsport, and Five Star is a team we can speak about for a little bit right now. Started by, of course, uh, Maximilian Fritz, previously of the Hersinger team right now. And it's it's quite the lineup. It's It's got a f quite a few top drivers like Jason Cooper, Yelly Walters right there. And they've come together, they've competing in all the major endurance racing events so far this year. I think the first time we've seen them at, at such a level since Daytona, which was their opening race. So amazing to see Five Star Motorsport competing in an event like this as well. But... How awesome is it, Stefan, to see smaller teams come up all the time, to see them 
pop up and compete against, say, bigger lineups like in Altus or, or Pure Sims for that matter. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it, it still shows that even with small teams, you can still be extremely competitive. I mean, we all, we also only have to look into the ISO, ISOWC, I think it's called. Um, that is also a broadcast of us here on Racebot, where we also have teams like Total Downforce Racing uh, who are able to compete in that series quite successfully in the name of Riley Thompson there. So uh, small teams can very much make uh, the work going. Uh, the, the thing we also have to mention about Five Star Motorsport, we have seen them in the official iRacing 24 as well last weekend. But I watched just one small problem. You only saw them for two and a half minutes because after that they were wrecked on the outside of uh, Rade Lyon uh, just on their second lap of the race. Yeah, exactly. Bit of a bit of a shameful experience for them. All that happened last weekend, but so good to see them right here. So good to see them competing with, let's say, new teams like Carnage and all established ones like Logitech Altus Esports right there behind them. By the way, I've got this question, of course. Why do people end up asking this when they come to sim racing about the hype of hype of endurance racing, Stefan? And, and many say, well, it's longer than a sprint race. It takes more preparation, more time, but. Really, there's this festive speed, festive speed, a festive feeling about endurance racing. I'll get that right eventually. <laughs> and, but why do people love endurance racing so much? Why do all the top teams and even, uh, say, I wouldn't say amateur outfits, but say drivers who ha don't have sim racing as a professional career, why do they also end up coming in? And why do we have so many big splits for Spa 24 hours or Daytona 24 hours or Nürburgring for that matter, when it definitely takes a whole lot longer than, say, a VR or GT Sprint series for that matter? Well, that is already the point in itself. It takes so much longer for a 24-hour race than for, say, a 45-minute race. It takes so much more preparation. It takes so much more determination to race such an event. It is you and your team against the world. That is also another big thing. Yeah. There's so much prestige around these kind of events as well, because um, in the terms of motorsport, the real big events were always and will always be the endurance side of things because uh, that's where really car makers uh, can make their stuff up or can break their stuff up. Um, like the big stories, Ford versus Ferrari, that was Le Mans 66, that's the biggest story in racing pretty much. Um, there, there's just so much... Um, passion as well about these things as we see a maneuver here uh, against the 55 by Luke McCown for Logitech G Altus able to nicely move past a little bit of a headlight flash there from the uh, 55 not too happy probably about what happened there um, maybe there was a touch on so didn't really see that uh, so yeah, either way, the move has been made for that 18th position through last year. But yeah, I mean, as I said, that's a big thing about endurance racing. Uh, it's so much more and everything more than a simple sprint race uh, because there's just so much more going on in a 24-hour endurance race. Always love to see so many teams and drivers come up. I think last the i racing 24 hours of spa that we had last weekend as well an outrageous turnout i think the turnout for daytona early on in january was so huge that the servers crashed and the race had a delay that's how much people loved it in john's racing here and i racing and yeah may take more time may take more preparation but i think it just adds to the feel of it and how awesome is it stefan that we're getting to see the gt3 side of things being bumped up by i racing we're seeing a lot of confidence from them and, and even they've responded with, with, the, with the new Porsche, with the new BMW coming in as well. It's like there is the invisible hand from iRacing supporting GT3 and John's Racing here on this service. And what looked like a very weak field only a year ago now is just super strengthened up. And, and everyone wants to do a GT3 and John's Race now. Yeah, um, I mean, we, we, we can kind of say it. it. It felt a little bit like the, the dark horse of iRacing for a very long time. There wasn't many updates going towards the GT3 roster, but uh, I think iRacing has realized that the big pull of things uh, in, in race is most definitely that GT3 side of things because of how open it is, how um, relatively cheap the racing uh, there as well is. 
uh, compared to, for example, a formal outfit. So uh, that's most definitely where the pull comes. And also a lot of star drivers that you come to think about are or have been racing in the GT3 side of things. So uh, obviously that is a little bit excluding the big Formula 1 uh, uh, stars, but that's a whole different story because in real life, obviously GT3 machinery versus Formula 1 machinery is quite a different skill set that you need to bring into your stuff. Uh, Brad Hartley, obviously one of the big talking points in that regard, coming over from LMP1 to Formula 1 fields and not being all too successful, but also extremely unlucky at the same time. So uh, it is very different, but still, um, these GT3 cars can generate a lot of fun because of how close the GT3 regulations are and how much diversity yet you still can get from all these cars. I absolutely love it. I love that even the DTM is now resorted to GT3s as a stopgap solution in a way. And we're seeing top single-seater drivers also come up and race GT3 racing. And on iRacing, it's a it's a special feel to it, the GT3s. It's, I think, one of the more accessible cars to start up with them. When you've got, in terms of GTs, when you've got, say, cars of the 718 Cayman or the McLaren 570S, or for that matter, the Porsche 911 GT3 Cup car, I think it's a lot more safe to start with a GT3 machine, isn't it? Uh, well, well it, it most definitely depends on what you want to get because a Ferrari 488 GT3 can still set you back 650,000 euros per race weekend and that is just getting the car to the track so we're not yeah. talking there about tires, fuel, your crew, your drivers, we're not talking about anything there yet not even uh, the starting money that you need to pay to enter one of these events. That's just 650,000 euros for the car itself. And that's also excluding any spare parts that you would still have to buy on top of that. So um, it is very expensive to own and operate a GT3 car, but still it's nothing compared what you have to pay if you make a mistake like Linus Tech now. And Linus Tech now spinning around oh. for Impulse and having a big, big hit at Puh, not double gauche by the way, but yes, that's a big strike for them. The first of Impulse racing that we've seen so far today, but not the best way to make an impact. Well, they did make an impact, but not the way they wanted to. By the way, do I see Five Star Motorsport in the pit lane? So certainly something's happened to them. They were right within this battle that we're seeing right now, and they got passed by Luke McKeon in the Logitech G Altus car. Well, there they are, right behind them. So I, I must have gotten slightly confused um, on that one. Yeah, the, they have entered two cars, the 55 and the 5. Yes, of course. Stupid me. Uh, I always end up forgetting aspects like this one. So the second Five Star Motorsport car having a little bit of trouble on that side, but this is good right now and just take a look at this train guys take a look at the names in this train in this battle for p number 10 right now we've got Beeler racing team ironics msi esports tv1 triton urano a, a second Beeler car and then, and then arnage i think then we've also got uh who else is behind arnage there's there's also not just g altus and then five star this is I love it. I've been saying it constantly since the start of the race so far. But this grid is so big. It's like a dream race for us. We've been watching them compete in different championships all over the year. To see them finally up together in, in similar machinery is awesome. Yeah, very much so. Um, they, they, there is a lot of different uh, teams that are driving in here. Teams that normally maybe don't even do G3 racing and just came yeah. in for this event. So. Um, these guys are most definitely still putting out everything they have, even though they might not even be regulars on this SEO calendar. So, uh, have to give it to them. And I've, I've also said it already last weekend, the pace, once again, incredible how close this whole field is. So true, so, so true. That is spot on. And the pace is super, and it makes it even more crazy that although we're seeing so many top teams, the others are able to break away. We are seeing many different packs come up. So it only makes you wonder, well, I mean, 
for, for a lot of our drivers, for a lot of us, when we compete in any second or third split or whatever it may be, this competing with uh, the likes of a Pure Sims or competing for that matter with the likes of an Arnage will be quite huge. But now, to see that even they've got quite a fair bit of a gap to say the MSIs and the Commanders and the RAGs is a bit insane. By the way, battles going on right here. RAG Esports are uh, in the Porsche. That's not RAG, that's one of the Mercedes. So, Crazy battling going on that's right back there in the mid pack. I'm slightly confused about who that is. Uh, that's but Entropic EOT Race. Indeed, it is, yeah. That, we've not quite seen much of them so far in the race right now. It's, the, a lot of our focus, by the way, has been on the cars at the very top because, of course, the battle for the lead is what we've been doing so far. But this is the one for P24. And again, if there's one learning I can say from all of my driving, which is very limited, it's that no battle is too small. When, the, when you're in the midst of it, even the battle for P25 feels huge and that's what might be going on in their mind right now. Just to make it into a race like this one is such an achievement in a way. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, don't be confused about that Lamborghini at the very end of this pack. That is a lap car that they had to maneuver past that. Uh, this uh, 29 right here, uh, that's the second fastest Mercedes right now on the track. Uh, fastest Mercedes just two positions out the head. You can see it on the forefront of some, some of your streets. It is still uh, the Fuga uh, eSports car. That technically is not longer uh, these guys driving for Fuga. It's, this is pretty much their farewell race to Fuga as they have recently joined uh, Budlapar Motorsport and Ooh. are taking this race as their farewell tour for Fuga. Interesting. So it's a clean sweep. All three of the drivers aren't they? Are, are they? are they moving from, from Fuga to Budlapar? Interesting. Yeah, um, a little bit of a weird story how uh, that all came together. Um, Jan Schmidt, who is going to take over the car soon, there has already been driving a uh, different 24 hour race. It was the major 24 uh, with Butlapa Motorsport. And since then, uh, pretty much has been in contact with us uh, non stop, basically. And now they have made that switch over. Those three drivers. Uh, that are gonna take uh, home uh, this Mercedes, hopefully for them, uh, are all gonna join us at Butler Park Motorsport. And uh, very excited about them. Uh, they have plans in continuing to drive in SEO uh, and other series as well for us in the GD3 and GDE categories. So very much looking forward to how that's, that partnership is gonna turn out between us and those three. Yeah, that'll be nice. I mean, to see things like that, that'll be quite fun. And, and of course, SEO is a growing grid. We are seeing new teams constantly pop up. Yep. Good Lapel, of course, you guys have been around for quite a while, haven't you? And to see new drivers join in, this strengthens the lineup. But but a question on the organizational side of things. How tricky is it to constantly just uh, add new drivers and make sure that they all gel in? Because, well, it may be still, uh, I mean, it's not a new concept, by the way, but esports teams are just like a real world team in a way, like a football team or, or, or for that matter, even a rugby team. And so having that same frequency is such an important one to make sure the team do as well, in a way. So how do you well, manage that? Uh, well, you, you say it, it's kind of like a football team. It's, it, it's, it's so much worse than a football team in that kind of sense, because <laughs> there's a really weird mentality right now in the RAC community where uh, if you're not in one of the top teams, you want to get there by all means necessary. And so we sadly at Budapal Motorsport had a very big shakeup in our lineup. We lost like four or five drivers uh, who jumped ship to a faster team just because they thought the grass is greener there. But that sadly is right now a little bit of the mentality inside iRacing um, that you need to be always in the fastest team possible. Otherwise, you're not going to be as happy as you can be. But, you know, it, it's just things that you have to work with. And I think we have done a very great job in coping with the losses that we had to endure. And most definitely, very uh, happily looking into the future of what might come for our team. So good. And, 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 and it's, a, it's a fun point to discuss this one about small teams growing and everything. It, I, I, I mean, in a way, 
the intention of any driver coming up on iRacing will be, of course, to compete at the top level. But there's, there's always two ways to do it, right? You can you can go for a bigger team, or you can actually make sure that the team grows together. And we have seen so many top teams become top teams because we've seen drivers come together and grow them from once they were really smaller ones. By the way, Pure Sims Esports attacking Beeler Racing Team Bionics. So keep a keen eye on that one. But yeah, there's, there's two different types of teams, aren't there? There's teams that start yeah. out as a big unit, like an RAG, of course, with the right funding and with the right people at the very beginning. But there, there are other other smaller teams, like, say, for instance, like a Five Star, like a Butlapal Motorsport. And how satisfying is it, Stefan, to see your team, which might be a smaller one, grow bigger and, and say, compete with the likes of a Williams or a Redline or a Coentas? Uh, well, you know, it's it's like the growing pains of a younger team that you have to endure, uh, that uh, people are going to jump ship because they think the yeah. grass is greener somewhere else. Uh, I think that's just the nature anyway. Um, but in the bigger picture, as I said, there's a lot of uh, I have to be in a faster team if I am one of the faster guys and I'm only in the midfield of a very good split. Uh, it is a little bit of a weird momentum right now, which has been starting to die down. I have also to say that, uh, to not throw too much shade at our beautiful community, but uh, there has been a very big movement in the past year and it's starting to slow down. Thankfully, once again, that people have to jump ship quite regularly if they're in one of the medium-sized to small-sized teams. So, um, it is great, but as I said, it's just a growing pain right now that we have to endure. Um, and uh, if you can have a very stable core, uh, it, it won't matter who you add or lose around that stable core. Mm. If you lose the stable core, though, that's where you kind of have to go into a little bit of panic mode um, uh, because all of a sudden you don't have your big draw talent anymore uh, that you need to be able to put out great performances. That's kind of what we had to endure here with Lapal. Uh, sadly, with those growing pains where we had to lose uh, pretty much all of our core drivers on the iRacing side, but in no means are we a small team. I mean, uh, I did already say it last weekend in the Spa 24, and I'm gonna say it again. Uh, but Lapal is pretty much the only team that also does real world racing, not as a real world team, but as a sim racing team that has gone to the real world as well. And we are the official uh, track record holder in the VT1 class around the neighboring coach life. So uh, by no means are we a small team, um, but on the iRacing side, we right now endure quite some growing pains. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of teams can very much uh, say the same thing about them, but it's not about uh, what you have to endure, it's about what you can do while still having to endure those growing pains. And that's where you have to give it up to teams like Five Star and to all the smaller teams. They are doing a phenomenal job for having to cope with losses and new drivers coming in as well that need their time to adapt to the systems that you're using to perform the best you can. And also such a good point by Tim Ryan on the YouTube chat as well. A word on Altus, similar situation. They grew up very, very quickly as yep. a sim racing team. And now they've got a team house in Australia as well. That is that is just outstanding, right? And, and it's so satisfying to see smaller teams come up and grow into something bigger. It takes a lot more, as you rightly mentioned. Drivers might jump ship. Of course, they might have their own reasons for doing that. But yep. of course, to see stuff like that is so rewarding. Of course, there's a different, there's a different fun in watching Coanders and Red Lines and MSIs go up against each other or an RAG. But just watching smaller teams compete, it's just, it's a better feeling all the time. And then the same can be said for, for say, a team like Satellite Racing, as well as pointed out by Ayrton Williams up in the chat right now. Amazing stuff. Yeah, I mean, there are most definitely those small teams that pretty much just exploded into uh, the top region of competition and uh, that's also really great to see obviously they had uh, the right connections right from the get-go or accidentally met the right people that can also happen um, in some things um, so th there are many circumstances that you have to be around uh, to actually make it into the top regions there's a lot of skill and luck also involved to get there um, 
So it, 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 there is no single formula that you have to follow to become a Team Redline, to become a VRS yeah. Pro and the Simsport. You have to make it your own way. And however you make it, that is your unique story because there's not going to be a second team that will be able to do the same like you were able to do. And uh, I mean, for Altus as well, it is a little bit of a weird story because uh, an Australian team, usually, um, they are not one of those teams that is able to get that big. We have many Australian and, and Kiwi teams on our platform, but they've all stayed in the regions of, especially around what they know, so the supercars and stuff like that. So it's Altus yeah. actually trying to make that jump and being successful with that jump going into uh, the world championship side of things uh very impressive and i think that leaves the door open for many upcoming uh, australian and uh new zealand team to make that jump as well and be successful at making that jump yeah exactly some outstanding stuff right there by the way one of one of the growing teams that we are seeing right now porsche sport and i think it's their first race at such a level i, I want to speak about them and it's so awesome to see Porsche Sport come up and race. Of course, a Porsche, even though it might not be beneficial by the BOP, even if it was ever not beneficial with the BOP, they would still come up and race that. That's the support that they've got. It's in their name, so of course, but yes, lovely to see them carrying on, lovely to see them competing in B number 24, was it, if I'm not mistaken. So it's, it's good to see that sort of determination and commitment that they've got right now. They lost a position on this lap, but they are doing a very, very good job all the way through but folks as we approach the r mark as we approach more pit stops it's a very good time to go for a short break right here on race spot tv time for a race spot tv fan immersion but who do we go for stefan well, who do you want to ride on board with for the next five odd minutes uh well i i think it most definitely should be inside of this train i think that train for 20 seconds position will be a very great uh, watch so uh, I would say why, why not go on board with Porsche Sport they are right in the center of this sandwich and I think hearing the nice uh, boxer sound of that 911 yeah. should be a great one let's do just that for the next couple of minutes we will be on race spot TV fan immersion stinging to the Porsche Sport 911 GT3 R car so watch and we'll be back in a little bit. And in that meantime, keep a keen eye on this battle and keep a keen eye on the timing screen because Coanda are closing up. Back in a bit.
and gentlemen, a short view back to the past. Well, only 10 minutes ago, we saw VR Esquire SimSport be 15 seconds behind the MSI Esports car, but now they've closed up with the fresher rubber and they're right here, but only five seconds away from them. Welcome along, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Sports Car Open 24 Hours of Spa. My name is Somal Arora, joined, of course, by Stefan Schlacker for the next three hours. And this is turning out to be quite the race here at Spa Franco Shops. Yeah, you might be saying, well, I've seen another 24 hour endurance race at Spa 24 and Spa Franco Shops only a week ago. But this is turning out to be quite the beast with Red Line doing the good work at the top, as they did last week as well. But the competition is different now. They've got rivals in MSI, in Coanda, in Apex Racing as well. This will be quite the fight, but together, it's been both the Coanda cars who have been working in tandem. And at last, with 20 hours and 58 minutes to go, MSI Box and Stefan, isn't this a bit too early, in a way? Um, I think it is. Well, it's been 23 laps that they just did. Uh, I think 24 laps was the normal stint length for them. So I think they're doing some weird strategy where they're under fueling their car every single time. Um, or at least that's kind of what it feels like right now. Um, if, if it's going to be the winning strategy in the very end, uh, we really don't know. So we'll have to wait and see how this is going to turn out for MSI. But right now, it's most definitely a, a very intriguing story, kind of like the BS competition of last week. Aha, indeed. So MSI are in the pit lane to keep a keen eye on them. They boxed in from P number two. And folks, you know the deal. If you're enjoying what you're seeing, subscribe to Race Spot TV. That's where you get all top sim racing coverage on the iRacing side. But indeed, we saw so much of fuel saving going on by the Porsche Sport team. And fuel saving might be the mantra of this race all the way through. So watch out for this. Peter Racing TV Ronix, by the way, trying a move on Logitech G Altus for P number seven. And that is well executed. That Bila car, Stefan, has been through the hill and back. And now, from starting from the pit lane, Bila are up there. They are right now in P number 7, as the pit stop cycles will be approaching up in a minute or two. Oh, look behind Williams with the oh. dive on Altus. Altus even had to swerve to the left there to avoid that dive bombing. Daniel LaFuente. So, a little bit of a highly aggressive move, but I think they know where this train is heading. And if they don't, uh, jump on board, they are most definitely gonna miss out quite heavily. But yeah, uh, Bila, Euronics Racing Team. Um, I honestly, do we have any information why they started from pit lane? Because right now, if, if they just did it out of precaution, um, that would mean that they have, like, maybe even ruined the chance of winning this race outright on pace. Yeah, 100% because Bila Racing Team Iran is qualified, I think in the top 8 somewhere. I can't quite remember exactly where they were, but they elected to go from the pit lane, which, which got me scratching my head, I'll be honest, but this is just turning out to be good. Let's say, from what they've got, they've made quite a fair bit out of it. And by the way, a fastest lap, part by ATVO, of course, from Jamie Flew in the Apex Racing Team Lamborghini. We've always known that the Apex Lamborghini has a lot of one-lap pace, but Jamie Fluke is just getting the best of it. But realistically, Stefan, is there a chance that we can see the Apex Racing Team competing with, with all the, with the red lines and the Coanders? Because right now the gap is big, but with strategy, as we have seen, they are closing things up. And Coanda are now just 13 seconds behind red line when they were some 50 seconds off when the pit stop window opened up the last time out. Uh, well, it depends if George Simmons has to drive this car. If not, then they most definitely will have a shout at trying to compete with them. <laughs> because we all know that George Simmons would switch out this Lamborghini for an Audi RS3 uh, when he would have to drive it. Um, but yeah, no, quite honestly, they do have the pace. They didn't really have the pace at the start of this uh, um, race. So... Um, it all depends if it all comes together. Obviously, at one point, uh, the traffic will start to play a big um, question in their runnings as well. I mean, we don't have a field of 54 cars here today. I think we only have 38, yep. um, of which 34 are still running. So most definitely it's a much smaller field 
the hand what we saw last weekend, but still, uh, even though it's only 34 cars remaining, that could still mean a lot of traffic if it comes at the bad times for you. And 34 cars hunting for glory, a prize pool of some $10,000, but 3,000 of it going to the race winner. And as it stands, that money and more importantly, the pride of beating all the other top esports teams on the iRacing Road service would go Team Redline and number 71. It's been quite a phenomenal last couple of weeks for them. Of course, we've discussed early on in this broadcast that Team Redline, they were... They were with the BMW last week, and even with the Ferrari, they're making things work. And it's so good to see BOP actually bringing back the Ferrari in, and all things are all good. But let's focus on Apex Racing for a second. They're boxed in with 20 hours and 53 minutes to go. Now, normally, teams would box with at the arm out, basically. But what we've seen so far, Stefan, is there's been some pretty good fuel saving. We just got a glimpse of it on the onboard with Porsche Sport when we were in the race for TV fan immersion. But they are fuel saving frantically now. Yeah, most definitely. They're, they're saving quite a lot. So, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what their strategy is uh, right now dictating them. Are they doing that on purpose or is it just a necessary evil right now as in they are stuck in traffic or catching traffic at bad times that they're just able to save that much fuel but it most definitely seems like more the case of them just wanting to save this much fuel and it's most definitely paying off. It is indeed, yep. Quite a few teams trying that Ferrari, of course. Many claim to be a very good car on fuel consumption. May not have the biggest tank in the world, but hey, that's what it is. And some teams are able to make it work better than the others. The pit window is well and truly open right now. The R mark has been crossed. Many teams and drivers have constantly saved up a lap and a lap and a lap in all their stints, which is why you see some cars going even longer. So watch out for that. Williams, by the way, are going to be very interesting in this sim. The last time they boxed was around the 45 minute mark. They extended their stints to some 29 laps. I'm not sure how much that was, but they have been stunning on the fuel saving race. So they may not look like the strongest right now. Of course, the BMW does not look like the strongest with the BOP. More on that in the previous part of the broadcast. We're not going to speak more on that right now. But what we're basically trying to say is Williams have been making this car work a lot better than all the other BMW teams have done. And in terms of their alternate strategy, they've got something in the bag. We're not quite sure how things might go right now. What we are sure of is the Redline 71 in the pit lane. Oh, there's been a swap, by the way, hasn't there? The Lego Technic cars moved out of the 91. Yeah, I think it has. Yeah, it has very much so. 92 is right now the leader, actually. Um, so... So stops all the way through the red line 71 car in the pits. You can see the Beeler car coming out right now. The Coanda 91 is also in the pits. But, but the 92 Lego Technic car is going a lap longer. Make a note of that. Make a note of that in your diaries. Ah. This could be the determining factor. The red line 71 is in the pits. The red line 72 is in the pits. The Coanda car is in the pits, but not the 92 Lego Technic Coanda machine. So they're staying out, they're staying out a lap longer. This is going to be very intriguing, considering that Charlie Collins wasn't quite able to pull out a lap early on in his first in, but now they've gone the distance and they've got a lap on Red Knight, who initially were the ones doing all the fuel saving at the start. Yeah, there's my confusing com confusion coming from as to uh -huh. why the Lego was all of a sudden in first place. But obviously, if they stay out a lap longer, they are obviously taking over the lead of this race. So it will be intriguing to see what the LEGO team can do from here and out. Maybe they can build something for themselves on the foundation <laughs> of this lap. Good pun right there. I mean, LEGO building, it all just works out well. It takes some time to build some LEGO, just as it takes some time to build up a very good endurance race. And that's what the Quanta Sim Sport team are trying to do right now. By the way, for the main uh, sports car open the Sprint and Master Series, you can also take part in the giveaway by LEGO and you can win a Porsche 911 GT3 R LEGO version of that. All you've got to do is follow along with those races with the next round coming up on the August of 14th at Monza. So keep that in mind. Well, let's see where they are. Let's see if the Coanda LEGO Technic car will box right now. 
We certainly know that the Redline 71 machine is outside of the pit lane. They've done their stops. We can see the, the second Coanda car come out as well. And no, they stay out for more, Stefan. Yeah, so Lego is quite good on fuel saving. I mean, they were behind yeah. the VRS Coanda Simsport car for all the stint, and they were closely following that car as well. So fuel saving has been done plentifully and being able to pull out two laps on your competition just because you're able to save behind one car speaks volume about the fuel saving, uh, saving capabilities in that 92 machine. Yeah, 100%. In the first thing, they weren't quite able to do that. Even though they were behind four cars, three cars, I'm sorry, not four. But still, they're stuck with their teammates. And I think the best way to describe this is that, uh, is that even though they had fresher rubber, they were able to work together with their teammates in the 91 machine and claw back that cap to the number 71 red line, which is exactly what you should be doing in the case like this one. The 48 MSI car also boxes. This was not the one in second place. The one in second place was the 47. But yeah, they were provisionally third. They were fighting, say, somewhere along P8, P9. So keep a keen eye on where the MSI Esports team also rejoined. But yes, I think what we saw right there, Stefan, from Coanda was some, was some very good, very good teammate-based driving where they realized that there was no point in fighting each other. And as a joint unit, they were able to claw down that gap to MSI Esports. Uh, and of course, the red line, and that really is what you need to do in a situation like this. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure if this was planned on, do on doing for uh, the Kwanda guys. I think it was just a little bit of a thing where the 92 realized that you're not going to be able to overtake the 91 and thus started fuel saving. Obviously, if you're the car in front, you have to make the pace uh, and you can't start to extremely fuel save yourself to cover off that strategy. So. I think for the 91, a little bit unlucky that they weren't able to do the same, but extremely lucky for the 92 because they might actually come out in front here if they play the cards right. It just works for them. And you might be wondering, well, who's a part of that 91 car that we're talking about that hasn't quite been able to get it done? The 91 car. And it, it's just an insane lineup, this one that they've got right there. As we see, a battle between Apex Racing and Team Redline. Of course, Redline, the leaders, uh, net leaders, by the way, and they easily swoop past Apex. They've got a lot more pace in that case right now. And, and Redline are just dominating this race. But now we finally see the number 92 come in. And what is that? Two laps later than all, all else? This is some tremendous yep. fuel saving. Yeah, two laps longer for the 92 than everybody else. And... Uh... The big question comes in, I think they took tires last time around, correct? I think they did. They did indeed, yes. So, uh, with the track temperatures coming down, I am wondering if they're going to take no tires here. Mm, this will be interesting. So, keep a keen eye on that. Will the cars go on the jacks or not? They've done a stint on the fresher rubber and they've saved fuel as well. So I'm not sure if the tires will be hurt that much more. We'll be watching on the split screen camera. And if you're wondering, well, wow, man, this feels like a real race. The broadcasting is absolutely awesome. Well, that's just a Hugo Luis magic. He's the one working the magic on no, the cameras change. right now. Driver change. Do they go on the jacks, though, is the critical question. Uh, I Last think they will. You. With a driver change, I'm pretty sure they will go up on the jacks here. Interesting. So, the number 92 LEGO Technica will be on fresher rubber in that case, which means that it may fall back onto the red line car that you're seeing on the left-hand side of your screen, but they can claw back with fresher rubber. That will be fun. Now, by the way, they won't have fresher rubber, would they? It'll be only fresher by a couple of laps. Mac Backham is the driver getting behind the wheel of the number 92 car. Again, okay, a fellow yeah. enthusiast of the color of pink. And now... Yes, the car is on the jacks, but it presents an interesting situation, Stefan, where where the Quanda car does have fresh rubber, but it's only fresh by a couple of laps because we've also seen uh, we also seen MSI and Redline go for fresh rubber this time out because, of course, they double sent it the last time. So this will be a very interesting battle. So can Quanda gain as much in a situation like this? Well, they most definitely will have to gain, otherwise uh, uh, it, they're going to be boxed. They have boxed themselves in kind of like the same situation that we saw at the very beginning of the iRacing Spot 24, where Williams 
did take the double stint on the first two stints and red line went for single stint and then start with double stint the tires and uh, that's basically where the foundation already was built for the big victory that team red line did uh, celebrate last weekend so um, basically right now strategy wise this could be the make or break stint for Kuanda and Lego yeah 100% but a word on Kuanda versus Red Line. In the, in the past, in the previous part of this broadcast, we spoke a lot about smaller teams and the fun about growing a small team and how it can evolve and grow up. But for a second, let's talk about Kuanda versus Red Line. Let's talk about uh, the battle that I'd like to think is a lot like Real Madrid versus Barcelona in the world of sim racing. Two established top teams with with their own brands and an own own character in a way as well. They, they've got, they've all got a different style. Kuanda, of course. Uh, going for the more team-based, bonding-based approach with having their own team house all together. As we see Williams finally stopping now with, with 27 minutes gone. Uh, with, not 27, 17 minutes gone in, the, in this particular hour. Uh, but yeah, uh, but let's get back to Kwanda versus Red Line. It's awesome that these two different teams and two different approaches with a uh, completely different character to each other. Red Line, of course, all operating virtually. Kwanda have their own house. Redline have a Max Benneke spearing their attack. Quanta have a Josh Rogers. Again, both these drivers have clashed a lot in the iRacing World Championships. It's created a few controversial moments. And, and whenever someone looks at a big team in sim racing, these are the two names that come up into mind. How awesome is it, Stefan, that so far this year, we've not got the chance to see both of them in more in many endurance races on iRacing, but we get to see them here go head to head for the win in two different cars in the Sports Car Open Championship. This is just Phenomenal battling that we're getting to see right here. Say, say as in, as I mentioned previously, like a Real Madrid versus Barcelona in a way. I mean, uh, I, I kind of don't want to go into that argument again, how a Max Benneke is much better than a Josh Rogers because he's also driving the real uh, racing special events. Um, I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see what Josh Rogers can do compared to a uh, Max Benecke here at the uh, SEO Spa 24. Obviously, we didn't see Kuanda last weekend uh, when it was all about the prize, uh, the pride and prestige of the fun of it. Uh, but yeah, most definitely, it still is going to be a very uh, interesting battle to watch, especially now that VRS Kuanda will have to uh, run down to red light with the new tires. Watching, waiting, and understanding. That's the name of the game right now in this part of the race. Everyone is following their own approach, their own strategy. I'm trying to build something right here. Again, the compounding effect works in the world of sim racing. You, you can't just go out there and bank on something extraordinary happening and just all of a sudden execute a genius strategy. Say like you can in Formula 1 with a safety car. But here, it's a lot on how you compound the race all the way through. And, and this literally means, Stefan, that one slight error, one slight spin, or maybe one one bad in the fuel saving, and, and what you're trying to compound and build up over the race gets shot down. And as we see right there, DV1 tried on going a bit wide at Blosh, uh, not Bloshima, at Puhon Corner. Got a bit scary there. Um, yeah, I think there was a little bit of a slide on entry, and that's why they elected to take the extremely wide line there through Double Goosh. Uh, but yeah, um, as you said, um, one small thing can change the the outcome of a race for you, especially in the virtual side of things, because we don't have things like safety car. And I mean, even there, uh, just playing on the strategy part of things, just uh, when you're fuel saving and one of your guys in one stint is able to, say, let's say, make 28 laps and only makes 27, that could already be a quite a huge blow to your overall strategy, because all of a sudden, you might uh, face yourself with different struggles catching traffic at the wrong point because you had to stop a lap earlier than you expected to and stuff like that. So um, very much could always be a uh, deciding factor, a very small moment in your race, like even uh, Triton just going there a little bit too wide, sliding their tires out. That already might be a little bit of a drawback for a very big team if they have such a mistake and it costs them a lot of tire life. So uh, at the very top level of things, 
Um, you don't really see these kind of things from Redline, from Apex, from Koanda, just because they have prepared themselves to the absolute maximum. Because also, once again, one of those things, small team versus big team, they can afford to sit there for a few hours straight each day and practice where, especially in the smaller teams, there is nobody that does this for a living and they all have to also work at the same time and thus can't put as much practice in. But that does mean that small teams can't be as successful as the big ones. Yeah, and I think that's a very good point that you mentioned right there. We can speak about it a little bit as the battles calm down, as we see more more gaps come up all the way through the field. Uh, now, before we get into that, a bit of an interesting factor: Apex Racing team at the start at the start haven't quite uh, boxed yet, so that is why they're they're somewhat artificially up there in P number three. And Team Redline 71, 72. Well, the 71 is leading, and the 72 should be the one slightly behind. So watch out for that. Watch out for how things are going to be playing in that aspect. So largely, you can expect a Redline 71 versus MSI 47 versus the two Coanda cars, and then maybe the Redline 72, and of course the Apex 90. So that that is how the order would ideally look. Of course, we're in a bit of an off stage of this race when strategies are slightly different. So this is the fun part. We don't know how things might go later on. And that's the fun bit about endurance racing. You can't tell. You can't pinpoint things like that one. You've only got to wait and watch to see how things evolve eventually. But coming back to the point, uh, and uh, there's this one lovely question by JG right here. He's asking, how's the race been so far? And now linking it back to what you said, Stefan, about not many of these drivers being pros, how much of a factor is it? Now, they are coender. They have the opportunity to compete in this to have the uh, opportunity to compete in of course the seo sprint masters in a set of course competizione but even they have restricted their series so that they're able to give the best into each championship but for a lot of the smaller teams it's it's just picking your fights right you can't be competitive everywhere against them yeah exactly um I mean for smaller teams also the name of the game is a little bit different for the smaller teams it's all about publicity getting your name out there and trying to to get some traction via that so especially smaller teams you're gonna see in a lot of different series that are all uh like if they're specialized on g3 machinery you're gonna see them a lot in bigger series that are exactly that you're not gonna see them at the forefront but you're gonna see them in m many battles especially if they can take the opportunity to be in those battles because that's gonna bring them screen time that's gonna bring them the traction uh, the bigger teams they don't need to do that anymore they have their sponsors they they don't need to put out their name any anymore because um they're so big their name is out there anyway already so they can pick their fights that's also why we, we see that that kind of a weird development right now in the big teams where you still have bs competition you have team redline you have williams who go for these special events where uh kuana uh, uh, doesn't do that anymore. They, they said, we don't care about what the special events bring to our team. We only care about where the money lies, which um, sounds probably very wrong, but it's a very understandable decision to go for, because obviously um, in those uh, events where there's also money at the line, like for example, right now, the SEO Spa 24, where there's 3000 euros, for the winner of this series, for this race. Um, there is still a lot of things to be had apart from just the money. Uh, you can also be, uh, get a lot of prestige just from winning this one event because not only was it this a, a Spa 24, but it also was a Spa 24 where there was money on the line. Yeah, no, that's, that's so true. And, and they're not mercenaries, right? I mean, when you've got so many Team, so many people in the team to to manage when you've got your own house you, you need to be where the money is of course beyond the point teams become so big that they have to look at their financial interests and that's what say a commander would be doing in a situation like this only fair only fair that a situation like this would eventually happen but what we i mean we're on this argument of small teams and bigger teams we also need the bigger ones now, as much as we talk about the fun of developing a smaller team what we need from the outside of course is say a bigger team like a commander like a red line just coming in and, and being an identifiable brand. See, when you come up to watch a foot, when you come up to watch football, 
you might have a Manchester United, you might have a Chelsea, and for sure, eventually you might watch something and maybe become a fan of Crystal Palace or, or some other smaller teams, but you get into the sport through, say, a team like a Coanda, a Redline, an MSI, maybe Beeler nowadays as well, who are competing at the top. RHG have become that sort of unit as well. So, I, I, as much as we go on to speak about smaller teams and the love for them, we, we need these bigger lineups to attract people. And, and it's just created something so awesome where we've seen big drivers become big brands. People know Beneke, people know Rogers, people know Sebastian Joe in the Red Bull Racing Esports team as well. And now that we're having identifiable superstars in a way, it just helps. It helps grow the sport all the way through. And I'm glad that we're getting a situation like this. And who started it all off? Mm, not sure. I mean, I, I only got into sim racing three years ago, so I'm not very... Well, the question mind, is really. quite simply answered. It's all about Team Redline and Gregor Hutu. The first alien ever to grace this planet. Uh, Gregor Hutu most definitely uh, one of the very early superstars of sim racing being the undeniably uh, biggest thing to ever grace the uh, iRacing Grand Prix World Championship Series and I uh, honestly am very surprised that I was able to remember that name um, with how much of a mouthful that championship was. Yeah, Gregor Hutu, um, obviously I think a lot of traction happened in the sim racing world just mm. because of how um, unrivaled the pace of a Gregor Hutu was and a lot of people took that as a challenge to try and take down uh, that beast of a man and uh, most definitely many people have been able to do that uh, in the times until uh, Gregor's slow descent into the management depths of Team Redman. I'd love to see him race in a race like this though. I mean, imagine, right? Gregor Hutu coming back on track to race. That, that would be quite something. And, and maybe Gregor Hutu versus Hugo Luis. Who knows how awesome that would be back in another open wheel car. Yeah, we, we, we can see. It, it may be a while away. But yeah, uh, there's there's lots of history in the world of sim racing and esports, which may sound odd, considering that it's such a new sport uh, that at least might seem to many, but it's been around for quite a while, of course, as we mentioned earlier on the broadcast. Around 20 years since esports has been here, so quite a lot of pedigree here with the teams and the drivers and how things are growing right now. But for the future, things are looking bright. The new drivers and new teams want to be joining. That's Alexander Davidson making a move on the Five Star Esports car. Let's talk a little bit about how how the sim racing ecosystem has grown quite a fair bit as this race calms down and as we see the gaps sort of widen up. It's amazing, right? After uh, lockdown, quote unquote, that we saw so many people getting into sim racing, and maybe in a few months' time, Stefan, we might just get to see the first batch of the competitive drivers who, who joined sim racing during that period and are now able to compete in top events like this one. I mean, it already started well before the pandemic happened. I mean, uh, especially if, if we look at the prize money that we all of a sudden started to see in the World Championships, which basically is in the, uh, another three leagues up from where we started off with the World Championships. Yeah. I, I remember the times where uh, the winner of uh, the World Championship, I think, got like 3,000 euros, I think it was, um, yeah. in the very early stages of the iRacing Grand Prix World Championship Series. But uh, it, it most definitely has gone a long way from then. We have seen a competition influx. We have seen so many more teams being able to compete. We have seen so many more brands to join. We have yeah. Team Fordzilla, which is sponsored by Ford. Uh, we have BMW sponsor many teams uh, right there. Obviously, also Team Redline has a BMW sponsored team. Uh, BS Competition has one. Um, even Williams has one. So uh, a lot of brands have joined Iris and for for the better. And not only Iris, yeah. but also the sim sport in general. Sirius have started their own esports competition. Uh, to gather more uh, talent and gather more interest. Um, 
So it has come a very long way, but if we look at esports events like, uh, I mean, we've also talked, I think it was, was Connery and me who talked about yeah. that in the closing stages of the Spa 24, where you kind of have to compare it to the other esports like CSGO, like League of Legends. There is still a lot of ways to grow for sim racing um, until we get to where those guys are because there are millions being paid out. Uh, at the very big World Championship events for uh, those games, that, uh, which is kind of interesting that sim racing has got that same prestige yet because uh, you can't get any closer to what you do in real life than with sim racing because here you're actually sitting in a cockpit of sorts, you're having a wheel in front of your face, you're having the pedals uh, at your feet and yeah. you can't get closer to the real thing than with sim racing so i think right now most definitely the sky is the limit for sim racing in the future i think the reason why and of course it's there's no point there's no shame in discussing that of course it's, it's the equipment right it's it's slightly costlier than a counter strike or a league of legends and and takes a lot more technical to get that sort of stuff and and yeah. when you and by the way as the red line 72 slowing and letting the 71 pass. So, team orders perhaps? We will get back to a point in a second, but, but what's happening here, Stefan? Uh, well, it might be team orders, might be fuel saving strategy as well, that uh, they're going back and forth trying to save enough fuel to get that one lap extra out of their cars. Uh, they tried to do that already in the Spa 24 last weekend. Uh, when they saw how strong BS competition was with being able to go one, two laps longer uh, than everybody else. So uh, most definitely, I think they have realized that the 91 and 92 are doing the same thing. And so they're now trying to counter, counter that strategy uh, with their own fuel-saving strategy right now. So this is going to be very, very interesting. The 72 red line not taking ties in the last thing. They're on a different approach altogether. So watch out for them. Keep a close eye on where they are going. And of course, you can do so by clicking on racepod.tv slash 24 in the YouTube channel. You can follow along on the ATVO timing screen and get a close eye on that one. But right now, a move being made. Is that RAG Esports suffering a little bit? I saw them drop down two positions on the timing screen from P7 to P9. So there must be something happening with them right there. And as we get to that, it's DV1 Triton defending in P number 11 right now. From Urano, from Co, from Logitech Gialtus, from the second dealer car, and of course, the second Logitech car in a situation like this one. Turning out to be fine in the mid-pack right now, and you might say that, yeah, things are calming down, but this is where things are getting exciting in terms of strategy, to be very honest with you. Teams are trying new things, and that is where we get to see the most amount of drama. Quick replay, what's happened to RAG? I wonder if that was a spin right here. Oh, no, uh, no they, they just, just had to take team. the outside line. They got double teamed RNG Esports and Julian Cernan has been passed by the Beela. And the, I don't know what's it with the Williams today. The Williams guy has just been making some audacious, sneaky moves so far. I think that's the third one I've seen by them since this morning. And that's Urano missing their braking marker. They go slightly wide and they're passed by Coulson Racing in the background as well. So lots of lots of chaos happening all the way through. And, and that's RAG Esports who were very comfortable in around P6 early on. They've been hit back by a couple of positions. And honestly, what are Bela and Williams doing? They're just working together so well and they're passing people together like a double team. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure that Beela Racing Euronics doesn't 100% like this uh, situation right now because yeah. you have your competitor saving fuel behind you and not being stuck in traffic uh, while being able to do that as well is going to harm your chances so much more than the chances of Williams Esports. So a little bit of a bad situation for Beela, but Williams, I can tell you, they won't be complaining about this situation right now. Yeah, they won't be. They are in a happy zone right now. It's hard to imagine, considering B.O.B. and the likes, but they're making it work, which is what matters the most. Michael Neumeyer 
uh, Neumeyer, uh, Neumeyer, I hope I've got that correctly. But Michael is chasing the Irano car in P number 14 right now. You can see the camera and you can see how their eyes are, of course, peeled into the next apex like a real world driver because, of course, this is a simulation of real world racing. Honestly, it's not a real broadcast that you're watching, it is actually esports. Yeah, that's how good the quality is. That's who Hugo Louis is working his magic right now behind the cameras. But a comment from JG, uh, who's of course uh, not doing quite well right now, recovering from a disease. And mate, I hope you are keeping well and I hope that you can take care. I, I just hope that you can fight from that one. And it'll be great if we can show our support to him in the chat. But he said that sim racing has boomed this past year. I think the virtual 24 hours of Le Mans... Oh, wait, I can't say that. But yeah, that helped a lot. Along with the televised NASCAR and IndyCar events. And, and that has to be so true, Stefan. I think this was the first time that we got sim racing exposed to a mainstream audience in a way. Uh, well, yes, no, maybe. It, it, it does most definitely depend how while the broadcasts were done like in the case of for example formula one where they tried something a little bit different uh mm. and made a little bit of out of a choke out of it that really didn't help too much about the status of sim racing but thankfully in the very mm -hmm. end it also did damage the status of sim racing either so uh yes it has been a very great thing um uh, but at the same time, a lot of things could have done a lot better by the real world racing series that went to sim racing. I think out of all the real world racing series that went to the virtual world, uh, the supercar series did the best thing because they took their machinery, the V8s, not only to what they considered home tracks, but also they went to Montreal and stuff like that. Yeah. But even to Daytona and Talladega. Dega. That was wild. That, uh, that generally was wild. That was generally wild, wild, and it was great fun to watch as well because you were able to see that they had just the absolute fun with it uh, <laughs> and didn't care whatsoever about what they were doing. But still, the broadcasts were one. 1000% professional and they tried to keep their utmost professionalism even when they had a 20 car pileup in turn one at <laughs> Montreal um, and I mean they also kind of lost a little bit their composure and just started out laughing right there but the supercars and in general the guys behind the microphones as well they have done the best job possible to represent not only themselves the drivers the racing series the cars but also sim racing in a general in all honesty though how awesome is it right that at the end of the day we are able to live up to the main motto or the main reason why we're here in sim racing to have fun at the end of the day and broadcast and races like this remind you of aspects like that and and i love the fact that in endurance races like this one we are able to have fun we are able to talk about topics like this one freewheel a little bit as teams focus on their strategy if you've got any questions send us in in the twitch chat or on the youtube chat as well we'll be sure to answer all of them on air oh yeah i love this sort of feeling where we're actually able to enjoy sim racing and so we will be when we see this battle so the Quanda 91 car has closed up to the teammates in the Lego Technic car, but they're not going to get past, are they? Well, if I remember correctly, it was the 92 that came out of the pit lane behind the 91, so the 92 did overtake the 91. And it seems like it's the, the turn of the 91 to start saving fuel behind the Lego car. So um, most definitely a little bit of a very, thought, very good thought out technique. By, third, uh, by the 91 and the 92 teams to be able to save fuel in turns. Good stuff going by them, good stuff going by Williams, good stuff by Beeler so far. Of course, the best stuff has been happening with Redline at the very top in the 71 car. So they're the ones who have been dominating so far. But it ain't over yet. The gaps are only coming down. At a, and at one point, you've only got to wonder how close this race will eventually end up being. Tell you what, though, things are getting interesting. I've heard something special, Stefan. Something's popped up in my notifications booth. It's a, it's a message from a friend of mine on Discord who said that iRacing, of course, they're having this charity race at Charlotte, this four hours of Charlotte, and they're answering questions right there. 
as we see a move being made right now. And, and, and what they've done is they've just announced that the LMDH car is in the works, Stefan, on iRacing. Can you imagine LMDH coming to iRacing? Maybe just like the M4 GT3 that you're seeing on screen right now. Maybe before a wheel has turned in real life as well, like a prototype machine. Uh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, this is my general re uh, uh, reaction to this, but yeah, no, LMDH, obviously a big thing uh, in the real world. It is the, um, obviously, pinnacle of sports car racing. Um, kind of like the former one of open wheels. But in, in reality, uh, the LMDH only is going to make sense in the terms of iRacing if we're also going to obviously get more uh, LMDH apart from what I'm going to guess will be the Dallara chassis um, yeah. that we're going to get. Obviously, iRacing, the big partnership with Dallara uh, is helping in that regard. But it, as I said, it only is going to make sense if we're also going to get uh, a lot more other things. And um, I, I don't remember how the LMDH is in regards to the LMP2, I think it is. Yeah. More of a bit faster. Pace. No, it's, it's supposed to be a bit faster and just about as cost effective. Oh, right. I forgot, I'm sorry. The LMDH is going to be an upgrade to the LMP2 because they're yeah. bringing up the LMP2 to the DPI pace. There we go. Um, so it is not 100% the replacement of the LMP2, but it kind of is. So it, it is yeah. like a trade, basically. We're, we're going to have the LMP2, we're going to have the LMDH, but in, in events where we have the LMDH, um, I'm going to oh. be surprised in, for example, the Daytona 24 hour, if we're going to see the LMDH and the LMP2 in that race, because technically it is a thing, but I would be surprised if we see that kind of thing on Iris. How fast would that be? How crazy would that be? And by the way, we've also got LMP1 cars on iRacing as well. And you know the deal, if you, if you like what you see, if you like iRacing, you can literally go in there and get to your account basically. Make one, get a wheel and get on iRacing. Fastest lap, by the way, by Patrick Holmesman. That is an interesting time to set a fastest lap, Stefan. That is not what we usually end up seeing. Uh, maybe it is go time for Holtzman. And ah. uh, he thinks he needs this pace right now because he, he opened up the gap to the 72 by four seconds. And remember, even though they are team headline, both of these guys, uh, they are on complete different strategies. The 72 is on uh, old tires where the 71 is a new tire. So that's, uh, yeah. I think it's a little bit of a strategy play there by the 72 over the 70 by the 71 over the 72 uh, and also not to forget over the 98 and 92 which by the way haven't been able uh, pretty much at all to close in the gap to the 71 and 72 so right now especially the gamble from the 72 seems to have paid off in the stint of going for a double stint on their tires so uh, VRS Kuanda seems like they have backed themselves into a little bit of a weird mm -hmm. corner with that move on um, changing drivers and taking uh, new tires. But obviously, still a very young race. We're not even four hours in, and we're already talking about strategies that could end your chance at a victory. That is still over 20 hours away here today. <laughs> 20 hours, 16 minutes and 5 seconds as I say that right now. Long way to go in this race, but does that mean that the action is going to get dull? Not a single bit. When you've got drivers like the ones that we've got on our screen right now, when you've got battles like MSI versus RAG Esports, I know I'm going to stay excited for the rest of this race and you shall too as well. So see you right here on Racepot TV. Lots of fun stuff coming up. Speaking of fun stuff, I want to talk about the preparation of a 24 hour endurance race, Stefan. And, and there has it's been some fun. over the last few weekends with, with two spot 24 hours. Uh, well, the preparation of a, for a 24 hour race is not fun. Um, that, that is for certain. <laughs> unless, unless you're having fun with your teammates, it's not fun because it is just so incredibly complicated 
to set up a car for 24 hour race. Obviously for sprint race, let's say for 45 minute sprint race, you know that the track temperature is really gonna change. Your car is only gonna change so much because you don't take uh, a full fuel load and stuff like that. So it is much different uh, than a 24 hour race because in a 24 hour race, you go from a full fuel cell to a, uh, an empty fuel cell. You have uh, stints where you drive with fresh tires. So you have stints where you drive with worn tires. So you drive in the day, in the very uh, hot day. You also drive in the very cool day. and your car has to keep the same-ish balance throughout all of that. So you have to test a lot of things. You have to test in the day, you have to test in the night, you have to, uh, to test in the dawn and in the dusk as well, because even that can be different um, because of certain parts not being hit by the, the sun at dawn compared to dusk. Um, so it is a very complicated excruciating task to test setups to prepare your car for a 24 hour race and uh that that's one thing it is a not very fun task because especially if your setup is in the very early stages of development your car is not gonna feel great you're gonna have a lot of problems everywhere you're gonna crash it especially at Blanche Mall, nine times out of ten uh, because you just lose the rear end of the car until you have pinpoint exactly uh, what you need for your car and for your drivers as well um, uh, what they need to be able to drive through Blanchimont no matter if they're awake uh, if they just had their first coffee if they just woke up and <laughs> rushed to the cockpits without any practice and warm up so like not only for the drivers it's extremely frustrating at times but also for your setup makers because you have to make a very fast setup but also a setup that can't be driven no matter how tired or exhausted your drivers are at any given point of your lap it's such an interesting topic right and and when you've got aspects like this when you've got hours and hours and hours and hours of preparation data collection when you've got so much of data planning and plotting to realize what car you should actually select and then you end up doing so with your aero sheets and whatnot to find out what sort of setup you have to make in and then stefan bop happens how frustrating is that to be honest uh well normally bop comes in very early uh, at this at the practice stage anyway um, and then you're only gonna have minimal changes to your BOP unless the BOP has been completely wrong by the competitors. Yeah. So it's not that frustrating because you always know going into the race or in, even into the race week what kind of BOP you have to expect at the time of the race. So it's not too annoying unless, uh, as I said, there's a big BOP change, which we really didn't have for this event. So. Yeah. Um, these guys knew very much about what they need to complain uh, to their setup makers or even to the uh, the organizers about the BOP. Um, and um, yeah, uh, the car is going to handle different. If you forget to uh, put on uh, the ba the uh, bands of performance while practicing, obviously your car is going to feel very different uh, to the actual race uh, where the BOP has been enabled to. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, it shouldn't be too annoying unless you uh, get surprised that there is actually BOP in this race. Yeah, got to love how much preparation and effort and the hours that go in. And many teams, of course, also resort to collaborations, don't they? I mean, we, uh, we haven't quite seen any major one in this race uh, particularly. But quite often we've seen two teams coming together. Uh, have you had an instance like that, Stefan? Has, has Butterfell collaborated in that sense where you've tied up with the team and you're working together on a race site like that one? Uh... No. <laughs> I had to think, I'm, I'm, I'm only in Butlapal since the 23rd of February, but uh, to my knowledge, we have no, not cooperated with anyone before, yeah. and also thus far haven't had the need to do that. Interesting stuff then, but no, I, I'm just so intrigued by the collaborations of how team works, teams work together. 
uh, just got to make sure that the entire unit gels in as well because of course two different teams maybe two different styles of working two, two different styles of operating the team and managing things up but they still end up coming together for that one common purpose we saw a few of them for Nürburgring not so much for the 24 hours of spa this time right here that we will get to see quite a fair bit of them as the year rolls on more than John's race is coming be by the way after this one for SEO though, there's lots of fun things coming up. There's the SEO Sprint Masters Championship that's going on any which ways. And there's, there's such a such an amazing battle happening between Team uh, VRS Quine, the Sim Sport, the Lego Technic Sport car, of course, which is their own, by the way. And them and there's Cobra Sim Sport, there's Apex Racing, who are very, very close as well. That is turning out to be a mighty fun series on the GD3 side of things. And we go to... Uh, Monza, we go to Red Bull Ring, and where's the last circuit we end up? We also have another really fun circuit in the middle with that championship. And of course, the same calendar also exists for the VRS SCO Sprint Challenge Championship that I get to commentate on with Lewis McLeod, who was on the broadcast early on here today. And that series is an absolute madness one. It's got GT4 cars. And so many top teams like Core Sim Racing, you've got teams like German Sim Racing in there, you've got Fiercely Forward, you've got Sim RC that are competing, all in GT4 machines. Volanti also, who are a part of this race, are also a part of that championship. And it's just utter, utter madness. You get to see GT4 cars race up against each other. And Stefan, what's your take on the GT4 championship so far? It's, it's turning out to be fun that we get the McLaren in, but... Do you reckon there's more cars on the way? And, and what do you reckon about the competitive scene of GT4s right now? Uh, well, you know, GT4s always had a little bit of a hard stance uh, in the world of racing anyway, because they're not GT3s, so they're, they're like a lower class. They're, they're not prone for the ultimate competition. But in reality, <laughs> these GT4 machines, they can generate very great racing and uh, especially if the PUP works out, they can fiercely uh, work against each other and be competitive for hours on end. So uh, the, the GT4 machines, they can be a lot of fun, especially because they have such different characteristics to GT3 cars, especially if, if you just compare the Porsches, the, the 911 versus the 718, uh, you, you can't have much more uh, different cars than those two with the one being extremely oversteer on the throttle yeah. uh, quite hard springs as well so the car bounces around a lot if you hit curbs and or bumps in the wrong way so um, it, it most definitely favors a much different driving styles um, but in all reality it is GT racing and GT racing always is uh, extremely exciting no matter what kind of class it is be it GTE or yeah. even HED4. Well, speaking of news, Stefan, you've got something special. iRacing will, on that Charlotte Ford R stream, they're announcing things like, they're distributing basically great amounts of news right there, as if, as yeah. if it's just something for free. And and there's this one one piece of news that's genuinely got me mighty excited, and, and I can only imagine what it's actually going to be like when we get it on the service. So what is it that they're doing right there? Well, uh, Greg Hill announced that I was, by the way, an hour ago, uh, that they, last year, they started doing something out of their comfort zone, and that was create the Mount Washington Hill Climb in iRacing. So, for an, uh, we already, Greg Hill and the team behind the scenes of iRacing have decided to take up hill climbing uh, as a challenge for <laughs> iRacing, and that is not even a challenge that they have for the themselves but also for the software because uh, they had to come up with new solutions of the sheer volume of trees the vegetation even the rocks and the shaders so uh, the good thing is with that uh, Greg Hill also said that they learned a lot of things on how they can do stuff not all different but also better so let that sink in hill climbing on iRacing uh, I think that has to be the first ever sprint uh, event on iRacing ever. I mean, no, no, no circuit in a way. You just go down 
from point A to point B, which will be funny. Oh, it's going to be amazing. I mean, if hill climbing is here, you can only imagine, right? Five years down the line, iRacing might have a rally simulation part as well. Look, just, just an amazing to see the kind of strides that iRacing is taking. And of course, you can let us know your opinions and your takes on that down in the chat on Twitch and YouTube. My apologies for that one. But yeah, uh, that it's just turning out to be amazing to see which way things are going and how iRacing is making strides all the way through in so many different aspects. So many different cars, so many different types of racing. Stefan, I, I know you're a big fan of oval racing and you compete in some indie cars yourself. And what we're speaking about right now, when we speak about endurance racing, is just literally one half of the community. There's, there's such a big community, such a big following on the oval side as well. It's just mind-boggling to see how big the racing community is getting on the oval, not only on the indie side, but also on the NASCAR scene as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, if, if we just look back, uh, I think two years now, it is since iRacing introduced dirt oval racing to the community. That was a very big shock going through, especially the short track community on the oval yeah. side, where a lot of people said, well, now that we are going to have dirt racing, uh, that there's going to be a massive split in the community because all of a sudden those guys who take on dirt oval racing aren't going to be around anymore for short track racing. And in the very early stages of dirt racing, that was actually the case as Patrick Holtzman puts out another performance with a 2 minutes 17.695 showing right now who is boss in the team redline lineup. Uh, but as I said, it was the case at the very beginning, but very quickly that started to get immense traction and it not only helped out our racing overall but it also helped out the short track community uh, and they grew in numbers uh to uh numbers that they were actually more uh than they were before dirt got introduced into the iris scene Outstanding how the whole community is just growing up together, building up, and we're getting to see the series and the whole service go from strength to strength. I'll tell you who's going from strength to strength. Saw that right there? That was a visual representation of how quicker Coanda have been in relation to Apex Racing Team, getting past with both their cars on the Apex Lamborghini and moving up into P4 and P5. A part of their comeback is done. They've gotten past the Apex Lamborghini, but this is where the real challenge begins now because seven seconds up the road is the MSI Esports number 47 machine. And that, that's a bit of an outlier in a way because the number 72 red line that is ahead of the, seven, well, the 47 car is on a totally different strategy. Don't compare them with MSI right now. But MSI have to get past them to get anywhere close to the number 71 red line car that has been leading ever since the end of that first stint. Well, if you've got a minute or two, I mean, of course, we're reaching the hour mark where we should see pit stops start to roll about in a few minutes. But let's give you a run now. Let's give you a good idea of what's happened in this race so far. We started out with things all quite clear with, of course, both the Coenda cars qualifying one and two. Of course, how else will things go? Josh Rogers is in the car. He has to be on pole position, right? And after that, MSI were third, Redline were fourth, and Redline very, very quickly stayed at the back of the train, got up to P number one, and the place where they built up their gap with the number 71 car was they actually went a lap longer at the end of the first stint by fuel saving and by staying behind everyone. That is how they got a three and a half seconds gap, which has since been converted into a 50 second gap because they, they didn't take any tires on their next stint and has come down to say around 10 odd seconds, which is commendable considering they're only half a tenth behind all the other cars when the pit window began. And now, Stefan, things are starting to change. It no longer is just Redline applying the pressure with Patrick Holtzman. Mac Backham behind the wheel of the Lego Technic car is blocking it. Yeah, surprisingly, with the help of the draft of the Apex Racing team, Mac Backham able to put in a new fastest lap right there. Um, so, uh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, so yeah, unsurprisingly, there we go. The Mac Batman was able to put in that new fastest lap of the race. However, this means that they're slowly but surely creeping into the gap that Team Redline has been able to create while 
we have, as you were able to see, also seen the pass for second place. Team Redline continues to be on a different strategy compared to everybody around them, but this still means Team Redline Blue has gained immense amount of tons because they are still six seconds ahead of the two VRS Koala Sim Sport teams, and that means that they are still in front with strategy play. Still in front indeed, and that's been the story of this race so far. Redline holding up a very, very strong position, and you might be wondering, well, eh, what's up with the 72 car? Where are they? What are they doing? Why are they so up ahead? And why have they just been passed by MSI Esports when at the start of this thing they were in some P6 or something? Well, they've not taken tires, by the way, to put it very simply. Redline were behind behind Coenda and I think somewhere with Apex but yeah this has been quite a fun stint for them and and now that we're approaching near the end of this stint now that we only have say around 10 odd minutes to go before we see all the cars come into the pit stops if they can genuinely stay right here this will be such a big win for Team Red Line 72 and in this case they would have out uh, they would have eclipsed not just the two Coanda cars, but also the, I'm so sorry about that, also the Apex Racing team right there. So that is just tremendous, tremendous driving by the number 72 red line in terms of taking a risk and making it pay off. Again, you've I mean, got to wait and watch. It, it, it hasn't paid off yet. We're, we're not at the end of the stint yet. Um, it only has paid off for them if they stay ahead of, uh, of all of the BRS cars. If they don't, or if they aren't able to do that, they most definitely have chosen the wrong strategy at this point. Um, most definitely seems right now is, there we go, in the background, that's the two Porsches trying to chase down this Team Redline car. Um, right now, it, it looks rather dark for that strategy to have paid off. I think we're still one stint too early for that double stint on tires as we nearly see a car crashing. I think that is the R8 G Esports car. Yes, it is very much so. It is number eight um, that has gone into pit lane. Yes, it is indeed. So let's watch and wait and see how things will be for R8 G in terms of their stop. Of course, driving the Porsche and got tag teamed, by the way, by, by Williams Racing and, of course, Peely Racing Team Euronix early on in this race so far. So that's the story. And these two guys are still together. They, they will not go anywhere. Wheeler and Williams, best of friends, in a garden, walking together on a Saturday evening, having a fun time. This is how you spend a good time, right? Just, just play around and drive a few laps of spa with your friends for 24 hours. Have a good day, have a good evening. That's what Williams and Wheeler are doing right now. But even together, even together, they're able to work their way up and maybe get a good finish towards the very end. Maybe top five for both of them. It's still a long race. Got to wait and watch to see how things are going to go. But yes, the pit window is open. You can expect to see more cars boxing in. The first of them was the RAG Esports Porsche, and you got a feeling that they had to do something different. Things were just sliding away from them in the last couple of hours, which is a bit strange considering that the RAG team only won the Nürburgring 24 hours a few months ago, again in the 991 GT3 Cup class. They're, they're a team with pedigree, but it's a funny situation, isn't it, Stefan? Where, where sometimes the RG Junior team, I mean, of course, they don't race together in the same event, but we quite often see the RG Junior team get into more of the spotlight than the RG Senior teams have done, because they're competing in more championships, like, say, in the SEO Sprint Masters as well. Which is extremely weird if, yeah. if, if you're honest i mean you you can argue yes the rh junior team they need the experience uh so that's why they're driving in so many um competitions but in reality most of the times when we see the junior team versus the big team driving the junior team a lot of the times has the better of the more experienced drivers so um it is a really weird and confusing approach that rng is doing uh but maybe it is just a thing of availability where the juniors just are just that much uh more available for these kind of things than the other team so yeah yeah in in all together it is 
weird, in a sense, good for the Trini team because they get that experience. But also in terms that means that because of that, they're starting to be faster than the main team for RNG. And that is most definitely a development that you probably like, but also not like because all of a sudden the junior team is the team that brings in the big news uh, for your team. Can we call them a junior team so far? I mean, we know there's this distinction with Coanda, and uh, we know that their junior team, of course, is, is actually genuinely a very, very junior team. All the drivers right there, barely 13 or 12 year olds, and they still drive as if they are world championship drivers with that composure and that race car. But, but with the RAG, the, their junior drivers are slightly older. They mostly around 15, 16 year olds. As you see, Logitech G Altus send one in a risky place on Urano. And have they made it work out? Yes, yeah. they have. So, smart move by Fabio Besuk to get up into 13th place. But yeah, coming back to RAG, it's. Can you call them a junior team now? I mean, some of the drivers are under 18, but still, it's, it's just. It's fascinating how things are working out. And you're right, now, it's, it's the junior team that ends up bringing more news than senior team most of the times. Yeah, as uh, as Urano got some besuch there from uh, Logitech G Altus. There's a little bit of a joke for our German viewership. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, is, it is a very interesting development. And uh, as I said, it's not something that you frown upon as a team manager, but uh, it's also not the real development you like to see. However, it is a bright future, obviously, uh, that as well for RAG because you know that you have some very great talent coming up in your ranks. And, you know, you saying uh, the VRS Karma um, junior team, uh, yeah. I actually don't know who the junior team is, so there we go. Oh, I'll tell you. I will tell you more on that one. I know Benjamin Fuglesang is a young ace uh, for Kwanda, and only all of 13 years old, and he has been phenomenal so far in the same racing Grand Prix series, racing the Porsche Carrera Cup car. And he's been superb, of course, the Norwegian, that driver. We've also got a few others. I forgot his name. I, I, I always end up forgetting his name, but th there's this one extremely young driver who just surprises me all the time with the space. Uh, again, one of the Quina Juniors, as we see some battles going on, that's Ko getting closer to the DB1 Triton. Oscar Bixrud is the driver I'm referring to right now, the, the younger one. Of course, he's also 13. He's also mighty, mighty quick. There's Karl Perenuchtan as well, who's, I think, 14 years old. And they are, I mean, they got very close to drivers like Sondra Setsas, like Karl Fredrik Harshog, like Jarl Tien, and Glenn Kay. All of them, I mean, some of them competing here in this particular event. So, Gives you an idea of how fast they are, but this train has returned, and the midfield fight is on here. Yeah, the, this this uh, train has most definitely uh, returned to its former glory once again. With yeah. I think that's eight cars on the quick count uh, behind that Audi, leading it all in tenth position. Obviously, core. Um, uh, oh no, wait, that's not core. That is indeed, isn't it? It's ninth place. There we go. At the 11 of DV1 Triton Racing. So something is a little bit wrong there on the number plates for them. Probably somebody pitted ahead of this train. That's why still uh, Triton has the 10 lighting up on the windshield. But either way, this is the position. We're not allowed to forget that the last two, uh, right now two, um, money paying positions in this event because you get money all the way down to 10th place. Yep, $300 for the teams finishing in 10th, $3,000 for the team finishing at P number one. And that money, as it stands, would be going into the bank accounts of Team Redline. And by all the other teams in the P10 positions also get one. But what's happened to Triton? Triton have boxed with 19 hours and 51 minutes to go. Triton have boxed. In the background, we saw MSI 47 also come into the pit lane. They are the ones fighting for the win right now with Team Redline. And so. Where have they come out? The MSI 47, by the way, came out uh, somewhere. I can't seem to find them right now, can I? So, interesting stuff. We will keep a keen eye on that later on. But yes, DB1 tried on another one of the teams coming in. And look at this run right now. Altus are getting ever so closer to the back of the core sim racing car. They go side by side as the second MSI car also boxes. 
Nice and sweet, Ogenic Geologists move up a position and go fall one back down. So Altus move up to P number 8 and it's some 18 odd seconds before they catch up to Williams Esports and the Beela Racing Team Euronics who have been who've been holding hands and they've been walking together in the park, they've been having a nice sunny evening, they're having a good time basically and they're all carving their way up to get into that top 5 but your leader is in the pit lane, the number 71 red line has boxed with 19 hours and 50 minutes to go right on cue as expected question is fresh rubber or not uh probably or not um the <laughs> way this should be going 71 did, did take tires last time around i don't think they're gonna switch drivers in this pit stop so should be a fuel only stop for the 71 especially because i think I think we're down below the 30 degrees Celsius track temperature. Yeah. So the temperatures are cooling, the surface gets cooler, the tyres are under less pressure, which means you can go for the longest stints on those tyres. And we might just see Team Redline finally going for that double stint. Well, not finally, they've done a few double stints before, but again, finally do it with more confidence in a situation like this one. So double stint it might be. Watch out for whether the Redline car gets on the jacks or not but in the meantime these battles are amazing Corsim racing Altus 43 are boxing so does Arnash competition the, the lovely pink livery I absolutely love it they are going in the pits as well and watch out where do Coanda join in later on when do Coanda box because the 92 went in far far longer in that last stint there's a very good chance that Coanda close up the gap in this particular one. So keep your eyes peeled exactly on that. Done for Redline. They are outside. Their pit stop is over and done with. And they rejoin in P number 9 ahead of 5 Star Motorsport and the 46 Beeler Racing Team Euronics car. Interesting that Beeler haven't bit it with Williams. So there is a bit of a split up in this situation and Stefan temperatures have fallen on big time now Koanda might just be able to go for an even longer stint and in this case Koanda have actually closed up with the leading red line car the number 72 and it's not just one car it is both of them yeah this is right now the big make or break point for red line uh, I think they were five seconds behind the two Koanda cars uh, at the last pit stop so this is good for them but it's also bad for them because that means they only gained like five seconds in this pit. And that is highly interesting. Okay. Quite a pit, Lego stays out. So the 91 that has fuel saved all day long, or rather all stint long behind the 92, is not able to go that extra lap or maybe is electing to go that extra lap because they think that with the fuel saved, they can chop that team red line blue car just because they are not as long in the pit stall. But, but the red line blue car isn't really their main competitor, is there? The red line blue is just somewhat artificially up there. They've made it work. I think they will be coming out behind the Coanda cars in this situation. If Coanda, of course, are not taking pressure up in this situation, which I think should be the ideal because they did take pressure up the last time out. Let's wait and watch is what I mean to say. But. Uh, it's the 92 that's been doing a lot of the fuel saving so far today. Apart from the first thing, they have been on... Look, they have been saving literally like an Indian Indian family does all the time, to be honest with you. And, and that's been the way forward with them. So let's see. The, here's the here's the 71 red line car, the leading machine coming back out right here. And of course, they will be far, far ahead of all these guys, but the gap is the main factor. We knew that the number 71 red line would be ahead. It's just a matter of by how much. That's the question we have to answer. So, keep a keen eye on that. Lego Technic car goes a lap longer again without the stop. This is turning out to be a crazy, crazy frugal race for the 92 machine right now. And Mac Backup is saving like a monster. And no, there we go. The 71 red line finally takes pressure rubber as they would have. But the Coanda car seemingly not doing that. The number 91. I mean, for the 72, it was expected that they go up on the checks, uh, obviously, because they did do a double stint right here. 
but it is surprising for the VRS Corona Simsport that they also like to take tires here. I thought for sure that they are going to go in a double stint strategy here, so uh, a little bit of a weird call, especially because we're only at the 26 degrees Celsius track temperature uh, point already, so the double stint very much a possibility, Red Line Blue showed it. And as expected, once again, the 91 comes out in front because they were able to take much less fuel on that. Interesting then. Finally, we see the number 92 Kuanda car boxing way, way later than all the others, as has been the norm so far today, considering how much fuel saving they have done right now. Um, but, yeah? You know, they're, they're only pitting one lap earlier, so they weren't able to go that one lap longer. Uh, they lost a lap in this fuel stint to everybody else because even Team Red Lamp Blue was able to go 26 laps and LEGO only able to go 25. Though they lost a lap in terms of a fuel window in this one. Interesting. Oh, there's a bit of pushing and shoving going on in the pit lane, as it always ends up doing. And Coastal Racing are also boxing with 5 Star Motorsport right there. But this is big, isn't it? The fact that the 92 Coanda haven't quite been able to do this has been a bit of an interesting factor. So let's see why they join out ahead in relation to the 91 Coanda team. But I think maybe they have alternated roles in this one. Maybe the 92 would be the one pushing in this stint and the 91 would be the one saving. Who knows? Who knows you need, and also who knows what the 92 decides to do on the tire strategy. Maybe we're gonna see a double stint here from the 92, maybe we're not gonna see a double stint from the 92, so uh, much interest right now in that right hand picture as we see the core coming down to the old pit lane. And there we go, 92 onto the checks. So that means easily Team Redline will take over once again the lead once uh, Williams Esports 25 has pitted. So, I'm very intrigued right now. Why have Coanda elected not to go for the double stint? Uh, of course, in the YouTube chat, Gianni Vecchio of the Red Line team came up and said that they've been double stinting for a long time. And yeah. they did double stint in the iRacing Spa 24 hours for a, new, a stint prior to yeah. the one where they started double stinting in this race. So, what's happening right here? Why have Coanda elected not to do so? And and essentially, what they're doing is, of course, both their cars rejoin in very similar positions to where they were, right, right next to each other, with the with the 92 leading the 91 car. But but now their gap to MSI and all the red line cars is 25 seconds, and the red line car also has fresher rubber. Uh, well, uh, to to answer the question first, uh, oh, as don't. in the Spa 24 versus the Spa 24. In the iRacing Spa 24, they were able uh, able to start double stinting or one stint earlier because the track temperature wasn't as high. In the iRacing Spa 24, we started out with 33 degrees Celsius on the track. Uh, in this race, if I'm not correct, we started out with 38 degrees yeah. Celsius. So that is why they were not able to double stint uh, that hour earlier than they wanted to. Uh, with the Kuanda, it is... A most intriguing story, I have to say, uh, why they're not electing to double stint tires. Maybe they don't see the benefit in their setups. Maybe they even know that if they would double stint right now, uh, they would be so much slower in the second stint that they would lose all that they would gain by not being stationary for another 24 seconds. That, of course, could be the big talking point why they're not taking tires. Uh, or maybe it's just that their setup on the Porsche just doesn't feel as good uh, in the second stint as yeah. it does feel in the first stint. And obviously, if that is the case, um, then all the strategy play doesn't help you if your drivers aren't able to keep the car efficiently on track and especially stay out of the grass and stay out of slides like the 92 just did with a little bit of a big moment there on the entry of Velocimo. I mean, let's be honest, Porsches are not known to be very, very easy on tyres, are they? Of course, rear engine, rear wheel drive car, very, very hard on those rear tyres. And we also end up seeing the car so aggressive in turn ins that sometimes the tyres in the front can also be a bit damaged. But if that's the case, if the Porsche generally is not good enough in relation to 
uh, in, in relation to the Ferrari in terms of die saving. This is a big disadvantage that Coin to have right here. And Redline can perhaps exploit that and and maybe just get a long-term advantage on that. I mean, if that is actually the case that Kuanda just isn't able right now to go on those double stints uh, and only is able to do that in the night, then obviously that is a very, very big disadvantage that uh, Team Redland is already exploiting. Let's be honest about it, because they have already yeah. gained so much time on these guys, uh, which is already, what is that, 40 seconds nearly uh, between Redline yeah. and Kuanda. And in terms of raw pace as well, it's not like we've seen the Ferrari being a lot slower than the Porsche. It's been very well matched up. So that could just swing the balance in the favor of Team Redline. So wait and watch is the motto right now. We can maybe have a better idea when the race evolves. But yes, your Sims and Logitech Gialgus are battling against each other on the right hand side of your screen right now. But I, I can't get it beyond my head right now. This is such a fundamental aspect of this race that could give Redline the advantage and interesting interesting stuff we've only got a way to see how this involves but right now riding on board with Ross McFarlane of Pure Sims Esports quite the quite the royalty in GP3 Ross McFarlane we often end up seeing him in such a good position and he's been with Pure Sims for a fair bit of time and now Altus dive down the inside of one of those lap cars and get the position in quite cleanly Yeah, Ross McFarlane has to make the move right here on the 58 of MB Racing. Does so brilliantly to the inside. Also much respect given by the MB Racing team. So, Ross McFarlane in that pure Sims number 16 able to continue to pursue that uh, Logitech G Altus Racing team up ahead of him as the 8th place 31 Porsche Sport. Porsche 911 GD3 R is in pit lane to take their scheduled pit stop and you know we're talking here about how this is going to be developed and it's going to be really interesting the shame is we're only going to be able to see that for another one and a half hours before we have to give up the mics for our second stint of commentary yeah indeed so that's going to happen in an hour and a half well, that's going to be Stefan and myself right there till then and I hope you have a good time because we certainly are going to and if you've got any questions any discussions send them in the YouTube chat we'll be sure to have a chat on that but it's not like after we've gone you're in the hands of well some other commentators you're in the hands of Conry Matic, David Haynes and Lorenzo Bonder three of the best endurance racing commentators on Racebot TV and things are awesome on there so send send your questions in on YouTube and Twitch and we'll be sure to answer all of that right there. Well then, stops coming in. We are seeing Williams Esports box with 37 minutes to go in the R and Porsche Sport have also been doing some frantic fuel saving. Much like Williams, both these teams deciding that the frugal way is the right way. And that's what they have been trying to plan on. The long pit lane this at Spa. You've got to weave around to the old section, get past the hairpin. I've genuinely seen an incident where we've had a car crash right there and we've seen a pile up in the pit lane right there. So that, that can get a bit of a crazy one to crazy one to navigate at times. As we see Arnash competition getting closer. And a word on Arnash competition again, uh, just, uh, just for a couple of minutes. Anash are a new team, of course, backed by two investors in the world of sim racing. And they have been growing, they've been getting better, competing in the SEO Sprint Masters. Got a good result in the first round of this championship, by the way. And they send a move down the inside of the other BMW. That, and that is a good one. They move ahead of Mivano. We've barely seen anything of Mivano so far. And behind the wheel of the Anash car is Jimmy Antunes right now. And Jimmy has done so much of real life GT4 racing. He's raced quite a fair bit right there only came to iRacing a year ago it's been quite the sensation and so Arnaj have been getting their act together getting on the up for the last couple of rounds of the SEO Sprint Masters haven't quite gone their way so far 
I mean, talking about a team that hasn't uh, had their way uh, in the past few uh, weeks, months, even. Mivano, right there, uh, as we have a little bit of a fight in behind them uh, between Urano and DB1. Triton Racing still side by side there out of the chicane. And I think that should be settled in the favor of Urano. Okay, this is interesting. Urano are blocking the position off, and the DB1 Triton car cannot get anything done. But I get a feeling that things might just spill over at Lecom. We might just see an aggressive move. So watch out for that one. You know what? I think it'll be fun to watch this battle from an onboard cam. Why don't we go for a quick race spot TV fan immersion and ride on board with the racing Dronix car who get the best seat in the house to watch DV1 Triton versus the Rano car. Back in a couple of minutes.
So here we are again, folks. Welcome back to Racebot TV for the SCO Spa 24 hours sparred by Virtual Racing School. Seriously, guys, did you see that? Did you see that set from Beeler Racing Team Ironics? As we saw them trying to get past the DV1 Triton team, both of them in the Audi. This fight is in the midfield, and this fight is just keeping us on the edge right now. Battle for P number 15 going on. Welcome along again, folks, to Race Spot TV. My name is Samuel Arora. Joined in this stint by Stefan Schlacker for the next hour and a half. And now, Stefan, the Bieler car is going to the outside. Now, the 45 machine finally gets P number 15. This midfield battle has been so much fun to track over the course of the Race Spot TV fan immersion. We have a conclusion at last. Yeah, at last we have a conclusion at, at last. The 45 moves up another position. It's an interesting race, though, for the Euronics cars, uh, because the 45 and 46 have been moving rather nicely through the field, but for the 45, uh, they have gone a little bit backwards in the last stint and a half, and haven't really been able to recover from their downfall quite too good. But it seems like it's once again going upwards for them, and once again moving up into the top 10. 40, 46, obviously, a lot of a different story right there have moved themselves into 8th place after I think that was the car who started from pit lane. Or was it the 45? Yep. Yeah, the 45. 45 was the one. It's been... Uh, the 46, I'm sorry. Uh, it's been an yeah. amazing race okay. for Beeler Racing Team Ironics. When you consider that they've started from the pit lane, when you take that aspect out, you might be wondering, well, Beeler Racing Team Ironics, champions of 24 HG Sports on Racebot TV as well early on this year. Why are they in P number... Where are they? P number 8. So... That's because they started from the pit lane and why they did so still remains to be a mystery, like evolution. That's a bit of a wrestling joke if you caught that. But yeah, Team Redline are the ones dominating and MSI Esports are close up. They were my predictions, by the way, MSI Esports for the win. But Stefan, I mean, it'll be a bit, bit of a silly one to ask a prediction at this particular stage of the race, considering how Redline things are 71. going. In. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, who do we have on the cards at the start? Uh, well, I, I, I think everybody was talking about the VRS Quadra lineups. Mm. The 91 and 92 taking uh, the front row lockout in this qualifying. I think they were the big favorites going into this race. The, the red line, they were favorites as well. But I, I think they were, were a little bit of a dark horse for many people because obviously yeah. racing in the BMW last week and racing the Ferrari now uh, wasn't 100% sure how well Team Redline can pull this off. And um, well, we all know how much quality that lineup has. Jumping from a car to a different car in a match of just one week, it is quite the challenge, and especially from a car like the BMW to a car that is the Ferrari which has two very different skill sets that make it fast. It's quite a challenge and they have done a very good job up to this point. Obviously, uh, still anything can happen. We're just under 20 hours to go in this race. Uh, so still a very long race. But I think if everything continues to go the way they are right now, that 71 will most definitely be the one guy to beat for the win in today's event. And if it stays as things are right now, they might just end up home with 3,000 US dollars. Not much, just 3,000. It's, it's not, not a lot, is it, Stefan? Not, not a lot for, for any top sim racing team, is it? $3,000, that's a huge amount that they've got to play for. And it's fair to say, right, along with the prize money, it's also the prestige and pride of beating other top teams i mean if, if of course they end up doing so say beating uh, beating an msi beating beating a coanda beating an apex that that means a lot these are teams that can beat in the world championship i mean yes these guys are going to get three thousand euros uh, dollars but uh, it's also a lot of pride that you can take home not only that but also you have won the spa at the iRacing official spa 24 then you have also won kind of like the side chick of it the SEO Spa 24 that has some price money attached to it as well. And I think that speaks just so much more than just being able to say that you have won the SEO Spa 24 
and take home a little bit of prize money. But the really big question comes into mind, who is going to get those $3,000? Yep. At the moment, it may seem like red line, but it only is seeming. A long race, this one. And I, I mean, honestly, can be a bit frustrated to hear the phrase, it's a long race, it's a long race, it's a long race, it's a long race. It gets boring, but it might be boring, but it means a lot, to be honest with you. It, it, it seriously, generally, can a, anything can happen, right? I mean, we've seen Toyota back in 2016 at Le Mans. Just, just for an example, or maybe in 2017, Le Mans would be. A, yeah. I hate I mean, you for bringing that up. It, it's, it's. I was able to survive the iRacing Spa 24 without <laughs> anyone mentioning that for 12 hours, and you have to go <laughs> now. Uh, I mean, and beyond the point, someone had to. No. No, nobody had to. That memory <laughs> can't stay buried forever. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, uh, the good thing is there are no technical difficulties that can happen with your car that it all of a sudden shuts off with two and a half minutes to go in the race. But um, yeah, no, te technical difficulties can still happen. You can have a brake failure like we have seen for, I think it was actually Max Verstappen in last year's edition of the RSX Spark 24, where he had uh, some very uh, bad brake problems uh, in that race and a teammate had to take over and thankfully was still able mm. to win that race but uh, all in all anything can happen and in real life it is a little bit of a different mentality that goes into these kind of events because for them uh, you just can't do something like we do here today where you say all right i'm gonna relax a little bit i'm just gonna say fuel you can't do that in real life it's literally 24 one hour sprints that you have to uh, do uh, to be able to be competitive and try to fight for the win. You don't 100% have to do that in the, uh, this kind of um, event because it's sim race because uh, we're not as uh, physically and uh, uh, strong and enduring as real life drivers. But still, it comes to the point where we're starting to also be in the vicinity of having to say that it's 24 one-hour sprints just yeah. because of how top-notch the uh, pace is at the very uh, top end of uh, the field. Yeah, no, spot on. And I think, uh, before I get to my point, firstly, shout out to the ASR Able Esports team. We haven't seen much of them so far today. And Guillaume Levesque currently in P number 25. So I hope it's turning out to be a good stint for them pushing hard and fighting against Fuga Sim Sport for P number 24. That is what hap is happening for them right now. But I think, I think in a way, it's good, isn't it? That we are not getting to see 24 one-hour stints because then it adds a different dynamic to our endurance races. It's not just a, it's not just 24 sprint races slubbed into one. It, it's a whole lot different. You get to see a lot more fuel saving, a lot more die saving. I mean, I remember a couple of races a long way ago and I'm not sure but somebody tried a triple stint as well in a 24 HE Sports Series this year and and those sort of dynamics when you're not sure if teams will double stint, triple stint, will they go for two tyres in one stint or not, will they half fuel their tank, will they quarter fuel their tank, these sort of aspects, you don't end up seeing a lot of them in, in 24 hour sprint races and, and this I think this adds a more different dynamic for nerds like us in a way. Uh very much so, and by the way, just called a uh, 24 hour sprint race. That's very easy as well. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, it's gonna add that different kind of modality code because you're gonna have to be blasting out laps uh, while saving fuel that are as fast as if you would save fuel, and that is a challenge in itself. Uh, because it is extremely hard to still be as fast while saving fuel. It is most definitely possible. However, uh, you're going to have to break so much later and just be able to carry uh, the same amount of speed around the track uh, that you really have to be extremely experienced um, in that kind of sense. I'm not even sure if Maximilian Benecke right now would be able to do that without extensive, extensive practice in that regard just because of how difficult that skill is so so true that's what makes a really good endurance fixing driver and 
In the past, it used to be taking care of your car, taking care of your gearbox, making sure that the engine is fine by being very smooth. But now it's a lot on the tires, a lot on the fuel. And it just baffles me, right? Just take a step back. Take for... Just sit back for a minute and think that we're actually getting to do this in an age where things are so crazy that we're actually able to compete against drivers all over the world in virtual race cars that give you a very similar feeling coming up and racing in joint spaces and having dynamics like car setup, aerodynamics, fuel, tires, temperatures, all this stuff. The iRacing is just unreal, that's what I mean to say. It is just a phenomenal level of detail that's going in to making the simulation what it is right now. And there's more upgrades coming, more cars coming, rain coming, as Stefan mentioned, hill climbing coming into iRacing as well. This service is just growing stronger and stronger. But right now, a move potentially being made for P number 24. And of course, the Able Esports team moving up ahead, Fuga Simsport. The BMW passes the Mercedes, and the Mercedes just looks like a sorry little car here today. Yeah, uh, uh, to, to conclude, uh, and we all know uh, that sooner or later we're also gonna get uh, a tire uh, uh, engine wear, gearbox wear in our racing. We all know that that will sooner or later most definitely be on the table of things that are simulated in this uh, game. But yeah, to, 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 since we have the Mercedes right now on the screen, uh, it is. Honestly, a little bit surprising that Fuga did go out and take the Mercedes. They were a little bit wrongly informed about the Mercedes as uh, they went into uh, this competition with the Mercedes because uh, they had the information that the Mercedes is rather good on the tires, which is completely an absolute um, the wrong end of the scale, to not say the B word, uh, but uh, because the Mercedes eats tires as if it was a little snack before lunchtime. Um, because that car with its big engine up in front of the driver's seat is a little bit weirdly placed. It's not a front engine car in the, in the same sense as the BMW because the Mercedes has a front mid engine, uh, mid -engine mount. Uh, basically meaning that the, the the engine is in the front of the car but it is behind uh, the front axle and thus it is a front mid engine uh, and that induces a lot of understeer to this car and it literally is the boat that it is um, and that is why you have to work very hard with your front tires to draw that draws out the life of your tires like nothing else and that's what these guys are really fighting against right now I, I can tell you most of their time they're really losing lap in lap out is right here that's coming up that mini sector in i racing um from the entry of lecum all the way down to the entry of double goosh slash puhon and that's where they're losing three four tenth per lap uh because that is the big sector where the mercedes is losing its time because of its immense understeer uh, throughout prolonged and also through corners where you have to switch back uh, very fast. A masterclass in why the Mercedes is not not quite the best car right now uh, on the iRacing service in terms of endurance racing. It, it is just amazing. But to give credit to it, the Mercedes is quite a stable machine. But what genuinely baffled me was that in the new iRacing update that we got, I think a few months ago, the Mercedes, well, what happened to the Mercedes got cut down by a little bit in terms of engine power, suspension settings were changed, and oh, you know what? The Mercedes was made even more stable around the bumps, as if it needed any more of that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're, we're not allowed to, to talk down the Mercedes. I mean, uh, uh, last weekend we saw uh, the guys around Richie Stanaway, uh, Shane van Gisberg, and, and I'm yeah. very sorry, but I forgot the third driver they had in the Team Redland Black Velvet. Um, uh, they were inside, I think, the top 10. I think they were eighth place, so they were inside the top 10 uh, after the 24 hour race. So if you get that set up 100% right, that Mercedes still can very yeah. nicely work for you. However, it is just so incredibly hard and uh, long setup work that you have to do to make that Mercedes fast 
Uh, and that's exactly the point. You just have to work so hard and so long on setting up that Mercedes that we don't see anybody going for it, even though it would be a valid option, just because of how much setup you have to, setup you have to work on uh, until you're fast enough to be comfortably practicing your stints and everything around it, that it's just not worth it to put in the time to then be still a tenth or two off every single lap. Yeah. yeah, it's just not just a bit too much, a bit too much to ask for when teams and drivers can go for other cars. But to be fair, iRacing have generally done quite a good job when, uh, in terms of making sure the BOP is very evenly matched and the same can be said for the SEO organizers as well this is I mean this might not favor the BMW right now yeah for sure but they have said it time and time again someone's going to be unhappy someone is going to not have the best day in terms of their car management it's it's still fun to see so much diversity at the top with Ferraris with Porsches with Lamborghinis with Audis everywhere I think I like this riding on board with Yannick Wiskop Psyker uh, he is driving the Fuga Mercedes and might be on the steering car this one, but it sounds amazing. You know what? Let's take half a minute and listen to it. And not, not, not a race spot TV fan emotion, but now that I've said it's amazing, it'll be a bit of a shame if I just keep on speaking over it. So listen to it for 10 seconds here. That's 10 seconds right there, my guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, I kind of have to step in there, obviously. Uh, driving for Fuga right now, but these are my upcoming teammates in the with Nepal Motorsport team. Yannick Wiesenkopf Seeker, or nickname Mike, as I have come to know. Uh, doing a very great job. He is also, by the way, the fastest driver of that team. Is in for his second double stint, I believe. So, um, already was in for the first two hours of this race, has taken over that Mercedes once again. And their target, by the way, is most definitely a top 20 finish. Um, so soon, hopefully, they are going to be able to get into that. Yep, indeed. Lots of teams trying, lots of smaller teams taking part. Smaller in relation to the number of people working in the team and what the resources are and what their past has been. And one of them has been five-star motorsport and it's been a five-star race for them so far uh, constantly trying and pushing and one of their cars is out right now but this one the number 55 has been consistent that's all you need right now consistency in a 24-hour endurance race just keep on knocking uh not on the wood but just keep on pecking the wood like a woodpecker keep on keep on doing that keep on chugging in and you might make a hole big enough in the tree that you end up getting quite the reward. A P21 is a very, very good position for them to be in, considering how, I mean, considering that we don't end up seeing them uh, racing these top names so often. That's Five Star Motorsport. I'm also very nicely intrigued and very nicely surprised to see P1 Esport right there at P number 12, Stefan. That is a very good position for them to be in with our Nash competition. Uh, and they're competing uh, with the likes of MSI and RAG, which is amazing it is very much amazing but um, I, I don't think they're right now holding true to the name because yeah, p1 esports true. sitting in fourth place little bit failing on the target there boys <laughs> yeah for sure it'll come it'll come in a certain while I, I i'm very sure about that the way they've gone about with this race there's a good sense of there's a good sense of content so that's what I can say. They've not made any major errors, no shenanigans. I think we saw them involved in one of those battles early on and they were able to execute it pretty well. So, yeah, it'll come. Maybe not now. Maybe in a little bit. Tell you what, though. Two teams have been on P1 for a lot of times. RAG Esports and Logitech G Altus Esports. They're fighting against each other. And that Porsche has been able to go past. And yeah, has, race. has been able to go past, uh, I have to say, finally has been able to go past because yeah. um, they have been fighting for so long that I can't even remember anymore when they started to fight for that ninth place position. But the good thing is, these guys have been able to get a little bit away from the big, big train that they were stuck in for a very long time for this ninth place. So that's yeah. at least a very good news for them because now 
that they have settled in. Uh, they are looking set to drive away from 11th place. Indeed they are. So this will be interesting. The MSI blue car is also coming in fast on them. And RAG, man, they have been through a lot in this race. RAG have been trying. They got double teamed by Williams and Peel early on. Their strategy has been, it's been interesting so far. Not been the best in the world, but yeah, they're getting to it. That's what I mean to say. It's it's a long race ahead for RAG Esports right now. And it's just a matter of pushing hard and constantly staying right in there. And with the Porsche, they're doing just that. Next target for them would be Williams Esports. And they are some five odd seconds down the road. And RAG, of course, came in with fresh rubber this time out. So there's a chance that they can close up. But Williams have been superb. Williams have been fuel saving quite well. And they have been boxing in at some really absurd timing. So keep a close eye on them. And as we speak, Stefan, within a few minutes, we'll be back in the pit window. How, how crazy is that? The time is really flying right now. Yeah, most definitely is flying and it's flying away very fast. Only just over 19 hours to go. And then we already have to call this race a gunner. And that also means that in less than about two hours, I think, the sun has been completely swallowed by the world and we are in the night time of racing as well. So that's going to once again be a much different stra strategy that we might see happening by everybody until then. Uh, it, it still continues a very interesting race. Team Redline in the 71 is continuing to drive away from the rest of the field right now, sitting on nearly a 18 second lead, bit over an 18 second mark over the MSI Esports 47, which in terms is leading about 14 seconds ahead of the uh, VRS Kohanda Sim Sport 2 cars. That first one is the uh, Lego sponsored car, uh, which technically uh, still is a VRS Kona Sim Sport driven car. And Stefan, now that we're on the subject of endurance races and about how teams are managing the races on the whole, I, uh, I, I'm often uh, very amazed by how teams manage out. Of course, you've raced in a fair few yourself, but the fact that there are drivers from all across the globe racing, it, it's quite amazing. And there's a reason behind that, isn't it? Because if you have all your drivers racing from just one part of the world, Eventually, someone has to do the long night stints. And the reason why, I mean, for some it might be long, because I mean, some people like to stay up in the night, so it may not be a problem for everybody. But uh, essentially, when you have a driver very tired behind the wheel of that car, say mostly in the night, can be such an issue. And so many of these teams right here try to make sure that the lineup is split up into different time zones. I mean, we saw, I think in the last round, we saw the BMW GB team, uh, the team BMW GB uh, in the last 24 hours of Spa, where we had Canapino from South America, a couple of the Williams drivers from Europe. You need that sort of lineup, don't you? To make sure that you can eventually end up being a successful unit, because then nobody has to drive tired, nobody has to drive in the night, per se. I mean, need is a very strong word for that. Uh, want? I don't know. I mean, you can want such a team, but what use is that night driver if he is four seconds off the pace? Uh, it, it still is going to diminish your chances of winning that race. Um, so it, it is that kind of thing. You also have to, to compare driving styles if the, the one guy from across the world is not comp compatible with the setup or the rest of the team. It's not going to make a very great night yeah. stint either so uh, you have to balance that kind of stuff and you also have the night owls in your team you, there, there's always going to be that one guy who stays up till four in the morning um, and, and <laughs> still continues to race so uh, it, it just doesn't matter from where that driver is as long as he can stay awake enough to pilot a car fast enough so that you still have a win a chance at the win uh, or at the target position at least uh, coming out of the night end i mean i have been one of those drivers that has taken on a lot of the night stints uh, even though i was tired and wasn't able to set myself up for the night time since because most of the time you're also leading up that week to the race you're starting to go a little bit later to bed just to prepare yourself for yeah. that night stint um, and 
I have to say, I've always was one of the guys that was very quick in the night time because you, all of a sudden you, it's just you, it's just what you see in the headlights, and it, it kind of needs a little bit of a different mentality than daylight racing. That's a very good point. Uh, that's a very good point. As we see right now, we're coming towards dusk, well and truly uh, towards dusk right now, as the sun sets in and we get to the final part of this particular stint. Just an hour left until Stefan Schleicher and myself have to bid goodbye on this commentary stint and you will be joined by Lorenzo Bonda, David Haynes and Honoré Mahadek. With them, you can be sure that along with getting some really professional coverage on the streaming, you also just just get some absolute banter. That, that's always the case with them. Yeah, yeah I absolutely love listening. I mean, you get professional commentary from Connery and David, and then you also have Lorenzo. Uh, so uh, the banter will be flowing there as well. Uh, with Lorenzo, be sure of that. And speaking about the banter kind of things, uh, what is the most beautiful livery in this race? Oh, uh, I am convicted about this one. I, personally, riding with Pascal Sticks right now, I, I love how simple and beautiful the core livery looks right now. An arch competition, as I've said time and time again, I am amazed by how amazing that pink and white car looks, to be honest with you. Oh, what else? Who else has a very good delivery so far today? Uh, who else? That's the core car we were talking about. Nice and simple, white and orange. Our Naj was right there. P1 competition is the one you're looking at right now. Who, who, who are you going to pick for this one, Stefan? Uh, is Bela in the list? I'm a big fan of delivery. It, in fact, is not at all. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm trying to cycle myself right now through the cameras that we have available to us. And I think I'd, I'd have to go, if I remember correctly, it is the R8G Esports uh, oh, Porsche, nice. that number eight car. Uh, obviously, I would go always with the Zebras, but the Zebras aren't in this race uh, today. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of have to get out of my comfort zone. And I think right there up there with the most beautiful livery is most definitely the Ramon Gershaw Esports uh, team, I'm great. And if you're wondering who the Zebras are, BS Competition, but they are one of the top endurance racing teams out here. Always, always super competitive. We're not here today, unfortunately. So. They, they couldn't do 224 hour races in a row, so that's why they said, yeah, fine, we might not be able to take part on this one. But P1 Esports are being chased hard right now by Beagle Racing Team Ironix. Make a move smartly down at the bus stop chicane, and they get it done. Late braking right there, and Urano might have something, you know, on this one. Urano Esports go to the outside line to try and make something of P1 Esports. But I don't know about P1, they're sending them back down to P number 16. Have done. Good move right there by Urano Esports HP. And, and a word on Urano. They've actually come out with three teams here today, Stefan. Yeah, uh, three teams to conquer all. And right now, uh, I would really honestly love to know what the targets was, what targets were for Urano coming into this race. Was it a top five finish? Was it a top ten finish? Where exactly does uh, that organization see themselves capable of doing? I think most definitely the target was for at least one car to get into the top yeah. 15. And uh, that is most definitely where they are right now. But I don't think this is where they're going to stay. I think they have in the very end, or they are going to have in the end, a shot at the top 10 finish. Could be, could be possibly. There's a good chance of that, and we will track everything here on Racepot TV. And by the way, you can keep tracking as well. Check out the link in the chat. It's been uh, pinned up, I guess. Racepot.tv slash 24 for live timing of this race as it all happens. So you can track the data for your favorite team, understand how good they have been, they have been doing, and see more of that one. Well, the hour mark has been passed. And very, very soon we will get some pit stops. And so this will be the fun part of the race where we get to see how strategies has worked out. And speaking of strategies, Stefan, have things been better for Coen? I, I don't think so. I mean, it's really, it, they are where they were, in a way. Yeah, they are where they were. And most importantly, Team Riot Line 72, uh, they are still right on their heels. And uh, 
right now the pendulum wildly swings in favor of the 71 team redline especially because the kuana cars they are still being stalked by the 72 uh, team redline and so one little mistake and both team, uh, uh, both uh, kuana cars will be uh, thrown off the podium so they most definitely will have to continue to be very careful uh, they have been able to close in the gap. They started off with 25 seconds. They are now up to 29 seconds. So Kuanda really, really struggling, at least right now a little bit against the pace of Team Redline. But uh, you never know what the night brings in Spa. That is so true. You never know what the night brings in. Uh, maybe by the time our commentary slip is done, it could very well be properly in the darkness here at Spa. And with that, it means that your apexes might be hidden. It, with that, it means that thigh temperatures are going to be lower, track temperatures are going to be lower, and there's no chance of a triple stint per se, but th th there's still a lot that can be gained as we see the DV1 Triton team and P1 have battled it out. And DV1 Triton, by the way, were able to get even faster. They were able to make that move on P1. And P1 have gone from what? P2? When B, B11 or 12 to B15 all of a sudden, 16 all of a sudden, so big drop right here. You know, it's still interesting to me that the Apex Racing team still holds the fastest lap of the race here. Uh, I honestly, did expect that Team Redline 71 will have a little bit of an answer to the fastest lap of the 98, but it seems like they are a little bit too caught up in the strategy to be able to go full pace right now, saving fuel as much as possible. That car is, while still able to extend their lead now up to 28 seconds. Um, yeah, no, 71 is just right now clocking their laps, like pretty much everybody is. This is the, the time of the race where you're just clocking your stints, keeping up to date with the strategy, trying to drive as fast as possible while saving fuel, while saving tires, because you know that this could right now be a little bit off a decider on how the race is gonna go for you in the night uh, because you never know exactly how the night is gonna shape out for you as by the way Romain Groschon eSports the number eight goes into pit lane that marks our opening of the pit stop oh sorry no the closure of our pit stops obviously because that number eight has been always the last part of it. yeah they have been but Stefan, how do you actually go faster? I mean, how do you go as fast as possible while fuel saving? Generally, it's, it's something that every single team and driver wants to try and do, every single team and driver targets, but it's such a hard ask that that balance between fuel saving and actual pace right there. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a few things that come right into mind. Obviously, since you're saving fuel, you're gonna lift earlier, so you're not carrying as much speed into the braking zones. So that means you're gonna have to be able to bring up uh, the composure to brake that little bit later because you're not carrying as much speed. So we're talking here about 10, 15 meters that you're all of a sudden uh, able to brake later than if you're just going full blast into the braking so that's something you have to realize right away obviously you're now also gonna have to roll your car better around the corner that is a little bit of a uh, driving style thing as well you have to be able to alter your style so that you're able to carry a little bit more speed around the corner we're only talking about one or two kilometers an hour because that once again in turns is going to save you a little bit more fuel because you're not going to have to accelerate as hard out of a corner and that also saves a little bit of fuel you're also going to be have to be able to be nicer on your inputs that already saves you fuel if you're nicer on your steering wheel if you're nicer on your throttle inputs that is gonna in terms also uh, gonna bring you a faster lap time while saving fuel so there's a lot of things that go on most of them are driving style related as that that carrying more speed around the corner being nicer on your inputs breaking a little bit later carrying more speed around your corners uh, and, and that is uh, just things that you have to practice day after day if you go for a fuel saving strategy. Such a great point and it comes only with practice and honestly it, it just makes it even more special 
See, a driver like Josh Rogers, of course, a Coanda qualifying expert, is able to do so well in qualifying, along with being such a good endurance racing driver as well. It, it just puts things into perspective. The drivers who are extremely fast and extremely hard can also do that sort of fuel saving. And I'm just amazed by how he actually works out. It's, it's so, so good to see drivers like that. Yes, you are seeing the number 92 and the 91 Porsche of the two Coen teams coming up closer and constantly trying to get closer to Team Redline, but it's just not happening right now. That the gap to MSI Esports, it was 10 seconds, it's come back to 7, which is which is an improvement, by the way. It's not, not exactly all that they're looking for right now. So things have to go even better for Coanda for them to get a bit higher. And since we're having right now four Porsches on our screen, it's a little bit of a fun fact. The Porsche family still is the richest family in Austria. Ah. Wait, they were Austrian? I never knew. Porsche is Austrian. Yes, very much so. Okay, you've got to tell me more about that. I, I'm genuinely... I mean, I'm not very good at my Porsche history, which is uh, just a bit of a shame. I'm a big fan, but I've never quite done much of research. But what, what is it all about, Stefan? Well, uh, the Porsche, Ferdinand Porsche himself, was born in Austria. And then a little thing. Uh, uh, and then uh, the Porsche brand later obviously got created by uh, Mr. Porsche. And then a little thing called the Anschluss happened uh, under one short period of time. And then Porsche got forced to move into Germany, where they have been situated in Stuttgart ever since. And that's why we have come to know the Porsche brand as a German brand, but very much is still an uh, Austrian uh, brand because the Porsche family still is the majority shareholder of the Porsche company. Um, uh, and they're still all pretty much living in Austria. And nice. uh, by the way, also, BMW, uh, what, which we come to think as a German brand, is also half Austrian uh, because the four founding fathers of BMW, two of them were actually Austrian. This, this is amazing. I actually had no clue about that. And, and <laughs> I wonder what the folks at Porsche Sport have to say about that one. I'm sure they must be knowing, but this is just, uh, uh, this is the first time I heard about that. There's some stunning stuff, yeah, and David Haynes also uh, was going to be joining us in the commentary booth in some time, also coming up in the chat and mentioning that the first cars were also made in Austria. Yeah. Amazing, this is... And I mean, that same flair there, well. there's a lot of car history that people don't 100% realize in Austria. If, if we just think about, for example, the Fiat 500, uh, uh, yeah. that actually was a car, uh, obviously by Fiat, but uh, the Steyr Puchwerke, uh, as it still is uh, known as, uh, they were allowed to then produce their own uh, Puch uh, 500, it was called, so basically just a German translation of 500. Um, and that was also a very successful car, it was the same base, but a few things were different in that car as well. Um, and obviously a lot of uh, manufacturing of car parts as we have the fastest lap by Mitchell de Jong now uh, just over a 217 there so we're nice. starting to creep into the below 270 mark there as well um, uh, a lot of car parts and even cars are manufactured in Austria uh, by uh, at Graz by the way which is the second biggest city in Austria and Mercedes is 100% German, isn't it? That's one question we've got in the chat by Bayer Hexel right now. Uh, yes, obviously, Mercedes is 100% uh, German. Uh, obviously, Karl Benz uh, has, uh, was the creator of Mercedes-Benz and he was born in uh, Mühlberg. By the way, uh, Karl Benz, that's not his uh, actual name as he was born as Karl Friedrich Michael Valiant in Latvia. And I've totally not looked in Wikipedia just now. <laughs> I, I love these nuggets that you end up bringing out of the broadcast, Stefan. Always, I'm a big fan of stuff like that. But it, again, I, I've been surprised I had never known that Mercedes and the Porsche and BMW partly from Austria. Just crazy stuff more of that right here and 
Oh man, this is this is awesome stuff. Well, speaking of Porsches right now, they are closing up, and there's the stop. There's the MSI Ferrari coming into pit lane, the number 47. Right on time, right on cue. Don't think there's going to be anything different, or anything rather unique happening in this particular time, is there? Everyone knows what they have to do right now. Everyone knows that maybe now is the time to start double stinting, and maybe Koanda might do so as well this time out with the Porsche. Yeah, uh, so that was MSI taking tires, yes? Yeah. I saw that correctly. Uh, there's also a Porsche that went off just ahead of the map. Um, so, yeah, MSI, you know, it, it baffles me how offset MSI is right now to everybody else. Yeah. I'm a little bit confused as to how their strategy actually looks like. Um, are they just able to go that much longer? Or or did they short fuel in one of their stints? Well, they have been... They haven't been that much closer. They've been constantly stopping at this particular window. So yes, it's just been normal. Uh, they had a double stint the last time out. They will be taking pressure up this time out and trying to fight back in this case. But MSI have constantly just been in that case. They've never been able to extend their fuel window by that much more so maybe that's going to be the aspect that holds them down a little bit maybe towards the end but again it's a long race we can only wait and see if the strategy actually holds them down because sometimes i mean fuel saving might seem fancy fuel saving might seem exciting on the whole and in a, in a way that it may seem like the ideal way out in terms of your strategy but sometimes it can be slightly faster to go for go for it and eventually it's just how fast your stint is on the whole that matters and so the second MSI car is also boxing along with Arnash competition and the BMW all in time all in time you will get to see the other teams as well but yeah what do you reckon we're finally time for point maybe with the double with, with the double stint finally yeah um, I, I don't know if they're, if they're gonna go for it if I'm honest Whereas Kwanda. They haven't shown us any indication yet to go on the double spin. Uh, it most definitely doesn't seem like that they are going to go for it um, with, with that uh, in the very end. Um, I, I, it's honestly really, really hard to call the strategy that Kwanda is on. Maybe they're going to single spin every single time because they just don't feel that it's beneficial for them in that Porsche. Um, so... We, we, we just have to wait and see how all of that is gonna go for them. But to, to really close off that little tidbits that the tidbits that I was throwing at you, so yeah. um, there is technically a connection between uh, Mercedes Benz and Austria as well, as well because um, as we know that the premium cars of Mercedes are also called the Daimler cars, yes. uh, Mercedes Benz Daimler, and actually Daimler. Uh, has a very big connection with Austria because uh, the Polkwerk, which which is now uh, uh, the the big man the Magna cars manufacturer in Graz, which you see Jaguars uh, and, and all that sort of stuff roll off every single day. Like every single day you drive past, you see a different yeah. batch of cars that are standing outside that. Uh, the Austro Daimler, as it was called is a manufacturer that was bought up by Mercedes-Benz uh, not uh, very, very long ago, 1934, but Austro Daimler <laughs> is also, as it says in the name, an Austrian company that is now Mercedes-Benz. Man, I never knew <laughs> that Austria has such a good connection, seriously, to the world of motorsport and, and to the world of automotives as well. I mean, we all know them as a country that's produced some great racing drivers as we see the Coanda car and Redline come into... No, that's not the Coanda car, that's the safety car right there, but yeah. Uh, no, that is the Coanda Lego Technic car. I got confused for a second. It looks very similar to the safety car, very beautiful in a way. You heard it well. here first, people. Benny the Pace Car Driver, now officially sponsored by Coanda Simsport. <laughs> exactly. No, they look very similar, but it's interesting that both Coanda 92 and the Redline 71 have come in at a very similar time because largely what we have seen so far is some slight differences in their pit stop strategies all the way through. Redline 71 has boxed in a lap, late, a lap earlier than Kwanda, but maybe is that it, uh, Stefan? Maybe 
going to have gone another lap less on fuel. And so we saw them go a lap less less than last time out. 25 instead of 26. Have they lost another lap again this time out? I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's so weird. I'm, I'm honestly not 100% sure how all of that goes. As that's a little bit of a hold up by for Kuanda. Uh, by I think that's Pure Sims right ahead of them. That BMW. Yes, it very much is. Yeah. And I was 16 of Pure Sims. So that's not going to help the 91 either here. So they're going to drop a little bit behind the 92. I imagine at this at the end of this stint. Um, it's, it's so weird altogether, that Kuanda strategy. And I think once again, uh, the 92 didn't take tires, right? The 92 uh, didn't, they didn't take yeah. tires, sorry. Yeah, exactly, it didn't take tires, yeah. That's what I meant, exactly. Um, but yeah, so it continues for Kuanda that they're just not willing to take that double stand. It's so baffling for me as to why they're not going for it, because in the spot, the iRacing spot before, we saw the Porsches be on the same strategy as uh, Team Redline with going for those double stints. So yeah. just why is Kuanda not willing to take those tires for a double stint? Are they really so maximized on their setups to put out any kind of performance in these Porsches that they are just murdering these tires so much that they're not able to go on these double stints? But I'm a bit, I'm a bit amused. Uh, Kwanda might know this, right? Coming into this race, they might have plotted out all their strategies, might have plotted out every single thing. And right now, it seems like, uh, right now, it seems a bit absurd that they're not quite able to compete to Redline, but they surely must have something planned out. They weren't quite competing in the race when, if they knew that there wasn't a chance for them to go out there and win it. So this is getting me amazed. Is, is there actually genuinely a way out for them to win this race without double stinting even once? I mean, I mean, they will, they will tonight. Oh, double, double stint for the 91. Way at last. Number 91, double stints, and that is it. Coanders have split their strategies. The 91 on older rubber, the 92 on fresher rubber. You can see the Lego Technic car go past. And this is going to be fun, Stefan. And this is going to tell so much about this race right yeah. here. What is going to happen with that 91? Will they be able to stay with the 92? Will they just completely fall off the bag? And also, that 72, did they take tires? I think they very much did as well because they yeah. have dropped quite far behind uh, the Team Redline cars. Exactly, uh, the, 70... the corner cars. Yeah, 71 took tires. Apex didn't take tires. Redline 72 didn't take tires. MB Racing Nordic also did not take tires. Oh, in yeah, so... We're actually right now seeing the, the pit stop tires right there on our left yeah. side screen. So, yeah, Team Redline 72 did not take tires. So, of all the top teams that have pitted right now, only the 71 has taken tires. That's hugely interesting because if the 71 can reel in both Kuanda cars, that 71 has not only a better strategy, but on track they have overtaken them by over 25 seconds as well because uh, they don't yeah. need to take those tires in the next stop so Kuanda I think just officially shot themselves in the foot <laughs> that's one way to put it that's one way to put it but let's let's watch actually how this cycles out eventually uh, they have taken a long while to do that haven't they to be honest with you Ideally, it would have been better, but again, must have been something related to the Porsche. Because as far as I can remember, I don't think even RAG did a double stint for a long while as well. So this is this is turning out to be fun. Now, RAG, of course, also in this particular stint, eventually going for their double stinting, as with all the other Porsche cars. So maybe it's just a Porsche thing. And the BOP has been so interesting that we don't know whether the Porsche will be faster in the night time or not. So maybe it could be just that the Porsche is not better on rubber, but it's in the night so this battle is just about to take so many other different layers Stefan that uh, we might just get a very tremendous fight but right now advantage red line clearly I, I'd even say and they and, and uh, go as far and say they already have that break over Koana Sim support if we're talking tennis here um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know uh, if, if you want Sir Mill I have yeah. one more tidbit for you lined up if you want it. Go for it. This one is racing uh, inspired. 
Uh, and it, it, it's quite um, fitting right now because we are getting into the orange part of the sky. Um, yeah. Do you know why McLaren is racing oh, yeah. under the papaya orange? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I heard you. I heard you in the last broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, for everybody that doesn't know, uh, it's a really funny story because Bruce McLaren back in the days painted his McLaren orange, uh, specifically papaya orange, uh, because that was the only color that was available in his shed. That's the only color he had in his shed. And that's why we have that papaya orange on the McLarens. How insane is it? that it's given birth to some of the most iconic racing liveries and right now we all love and celebrate that McLaren so much and I think we have to see an orange McLaren 570S GT4 as well sometime on iRacing I don't think I've seen one but yeah just just an amazing story that's how simple times were back in the day with racing yeah very just, much so I mean since you did know that one I'm gonna give you one more yeah uh -huh. Ferrari and Red Yes. Yeah. Have they always raced in red? Not always. They had one race at the 19... Was it the 68? I, I don't quite remember exactly what year it was. The early 60s, that was. Yes. When they had to race in the blue colors of the North American racing team. And the reason Wrong, it was why... Black. Yeah. Oh, it black was as black. well? It no, was blue. It was black. It was the American racing black that they were racing. Nah, it was, it was blue. Um, it, it was Watkins Glen for sure. That I know. The internet it will was, tell us. Yeah, the internet will tell us. We'll find that answer right now. But yes, speaking of Ferraris and black paints, Redline are doing that job perfectly fine with the number 71. And actually, it's been a while since we've caught up with Beeler Racing Team Euronics and the 46. So where are they? What are they doing? Beeler, by the way, in P number 8 right now. And, and there's this genuine intrigue. Are they going to be P8 or P9 when the Williams eSports team boxes? Because so far this race, Neil and Williams, as I mentioned constantly, they have been like two friends going hand in hand, walking together, lovely Saturday evening drive. They've just constantly been together in terms of their strategy. One wonders what could have happened to Beeler if they had not started from the pit lane. But yes, Stefan, is it blue or is it black? It was white and blue. White and blue, yeah. There we white. Go. And it was two races in 1964. 64, that is. Yeah. That was done in protest, by the way. Because... Uh, I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it was some protest. Uh, it, it, was be it was a... Uh, squirrel between... Enzo between, uh, Ferrari himself and the FIA. Uh, I don't remember exactly why it was either. But uh, he then threatened that Ferrari will never race in uh, Italy's yes. most iconic color. And that was the age when sponsors weren't quite there. That was before Lotus had done what they had done with uh, with, with sponsors. So that would have been a big, big blow. But I should know. Uh, I'm being a bit silly. It was only a couple of months ago I finished reading the Enzo, Fi Enzo Ferrari biography. And then that had a very detailed explanation on that. But yes, Williams Esports pitting right now. That was the time when Williams weren't on the Formula 1 grid. Only two years later, Williams actually joined in. And now Williams, quite the ace in sports car racing online. Yeah, what a story that Williams racing team is obviously founded by the great Frank Williams himself. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't think there's a more iconic private team than Williams. It still is sort of private, obviously. Only the name remains of the original Williams team, but that doesn't uh, put any downer to what this team stands for. Exactly. Williams now owned by Derilton Capital. Not much has changed in the esports organization since they've come in. Of course, part of the same Formula 1 team in a way, just an extension of that. But yeah, not much has changed. Williams, the Derilton Capital team, still showcasing the same sort of confidence towards esports. And why wouldn't they? It's an investment for the future. It's one that's going to be there for the long run. Makes no sense to cancel it out and make any changes considering how successful things have been so far. And Williams today are also just on a mission to try something different so far. Uh, they've been trying, they've been trying. They, they avoided the mistake that they made last time out with the Mahler Racing Team by double stinting a bit too early. They've been fuel saving, again, like an Indian family would save money, in a way. Very, very frugal in their approach. 
Yeah, uh, well, basically, Williams <laughs> seems to have learned out of their mistakes. However, uh, it, it seems like they still haven't picked up on their pace, sadly. Um, the, these guys most definitely have done better on the strategy front of things. Uh, they have picked up the entire strategy of Team Redline and the fuel saving strategy of BS Competition. And together, they have made their way inside the top seven. Right now, sticking in seventh place, and we all know where it ended up for BS Competition. They have made their jump from 11th on the grid in the Spa 24 to third in the end. Hirano Esports closing up to be the racing team. Hironix for B number 12 as there are 18 hours and 13 minutes left to go in this endurance race. Long way, but it's been a fun race so far. And it's been madness, and the madness will continue. Meanwhile, if you're just joining us, welcome along to Race Spot TV. My name is Somal Arora. Joining me right now, Stefan Schlacker in the commentary booth. We are going to be here uh, changing over the guards in 30 minutes uh, on Race Spot TV with Conrad Manic, David Haynes, and Lorenzo Bonder joining the broadcast booth right now. But I like what I'm seeing at the top of the field right now. Kwanda have got the jump. Team Redline, but Redline, well, pressure rubber. I think there's a chance they can go past rather soon in this case. Well, they have made the jump only on stretch right now because both Kwanda cars didn't take tires, where the 71 did take tires, and they had uh, only 18 seconds of advantage over uh, the two Kwanda cars. So the Team Redline car, they will soon uh, be at the forefront again because they are much faster on those pressure tires than the Kwanda cars. Uh, and that means that they're gonna really, really um, stretch their lead here in this uh, the second half of this stint yeah. uh, because just of how much pressure their rubbers will be, especially towards the end of the second stint. The tires will extremely fall off for Kwanda and that's where they're probably gonna lose like half a, one, one and a half seconds to the deep red line. The red line firmly having their hands right on the trophy. Not completely, but they're getting right there. And they have started off the best way possible. But I, I am amazed to say that this, after 30 minutes, will only be one quarter of the race done. Can you believe it? One quarter of the race. So much more can happen. So much more can change. And the thing is, there's no safety cars. There's no volatility in an aspect like that one but there's a lot of things that can happen lap traffic yeah can be a bit crazy no fords right here of course in this race what we saw last time out was an op ford uh, in the spot 24 hours but yes that has not competed in this one a question uh not a question but a, but a good a good point by by hexel right now on the twitch chat something i've heard recently do you guys know why the marlboro mclarens are painted in this sort of neon red orangey color because it translated to Marlboro Red through the TV cameras. Oh, that's a good point. That's a very good point. I think they also ran a special livery, didn't they? Back in the day where we had an orange uh, instead of a red red car. I mean, not, not orangey red, but proper orange. I think it was in Portugal, somewhere in 83 or something. Not sure. But it's amazing that we're on the debate of finding out the liveries of of old iconic F1 liveries and discussing them. And I always have to bring this up, right? Whenever we are on any endurance racing broadcast about what BS Competition actually ended up doing <laughs> with, uh, with Robbie Foley and the Turner Motorsport team, when they literally took a sim livery on to the real world race car in terms of the M4 GT4. By the way, fun battle here right now. Redline have gone past the Porsche Sport team, lapping them through. There we are. Rules being made all the way. Stefan, well, well, honestly, in terms of liveries, well, what is one Formula 1 livery that, or an iconic Formula 1 livery, or any racing yeah. livery for that matter, it can be sports car as well, not, not the one you like the most, but one that people admire a lot, but, but you're not a great fan of. Um, so, so, one that I don't like, but a lot of people like. Yes. Uh, 
bit of a tricky one. You can know, you can let us know your take on the YouTube and the Twitch chat right now. As Stefan considers his answer, and we see this amazing onboard camera from Nick Shoulder Wisdom and showing you just how high the corner Orosian Radio really is. Wait, which one are you thinking about, Stefan? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think about all the liveries that I know. And, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of like Enzo Ferrari in that kind of sense. Uh, a car, a Formula One car, isn't beautiful until it starts winning championships. And that, that holds yeah. true so much. Um, and, and that's why there isn't a particular livery that I, that I love, that, that other people hate, or the other way around. Um, I mean, if, if we really talk about iconic liveries, uh, obviously, Jordan, uh, BAR with their zipper livery, because Fia said you can't run two different liveries uh, in your team, uh, that, that, that kind of things, but, uh, you know what, actually, I, I'm going to go with the Honda uh, Earth. I mean, it's nice. It's not the best in the world. It's I really liked it, and a lot of people hated it, so... I loved it, yeah. I mean, it's nice. It's not not the 2007 one. 2008 one was a bit better. I mean, I, I, I like both of their livery so. Yeah. No money, though. No money with the team. And that's why they yeah. were not able to get things done. The one from the Twitch chat by Red Stapler. Red Bull. Oh, that's a good point. That is... Red Bull is just... It's become a bit stale right now. But at least it's identifiable. That's I the mean, most important thing. I mean, what else can you do with uh, Red Bull's kinds of car? Like, right. I mean, exactly. Um, but because we've seen it so many times, because we've seen it in so many different series now. I mean, let, let, let's be honest. It, it's much better than their actual silver and blue livery that they used to run. Oh, back in the day. That was just... I mean, making a car look like a can of energy drinks is not the best idea in the world. But speaking of iconic liveries in the world of sim racing as well. Now, it's so awesome that some teams, Stefan, have just picked a livery and have stayed with it as Beeler, of course come out ahead of Williams, so they've made that move stick, but they'll be tunneling along together, they'll be walking together, they'll be all the way through, down to the very end. Their strategies are just coming together so well, you won't expect them to be in any different a place. But yes, speaking of liveries, here's the pass by Patrick Heinrich on the Williams racing team right now. Going to the inside, nice and smooth, and, and these two teams are the two teams that come to mind, Stefan. Two teams that have not changed the liveries much since they've come onto the iRacing service, but Two liveries that you instantly remember all the time. They may be constantly the same, but at least they're standing out against all the others. And, and you know that when this car comes in, it's a Williams, it's a Beeler. There isn't... I mean, you, you say that. I mean, come on, Team Redline. Come on, have they ever changed oh, yeah. their, their livery? Like, Not that much. On. Like, yeah. There, it was always one red line. Thank you. Um... That, that's also what they call red line. Yeah. Surprise. Red line, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, they, they're staying not only true to the to the liveries, but also staying very true to the names because it features one big red line through the car, um, or or blue, depending if they're red line blue or red line uh, red. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, m m most definitely team red line. That one team that comes immediately to mind that has always stayed in the same livery and i think that's the that's the joy of sim racing because you're not obliged to sponsors i mean unless you're a beeler racing your own extent you're sponsoring yeah. your own extent um and i have to paint your car that way but um uh, oh no wait for what wait uh i remember now for euronix it's actually the different way around the big people are sponsoring this team and it's actually euronix racing team I think it was that we run. Either way, um, it is the joy of sim racing that we don't have those big sponsorments agreement where we have to paint our cars a certain way because sponsors determine that. Like for example, we don't need to think that far back. We only have to think about um, Racing Point in Formula One where they had to have that pink car because the Austrian sponsor of BWT, uh, Better Water Technology, um, determined that their brand color, even though it has nothing to do with their logo nor with what they're actually doing, is pink. And that's why all of the cars that they're sponsoring 
are running in pink. I like it though. I like it's distinctive. They've made that work in DTM as well and other championships through junior formula as well. Yeah. And, and and their marketing tactic is quite simple. Their marketing ad said it makes people turn stand around out. and look. And, yeah. and stand out, exactly. And, and I think we have we don't have enough big cars in motorsport. Uh, uh, and, and traditionally there's been this saying which I think is absolutely rubbish that pink is a girl's colour and whatnot. it isn't it's just beautiful it's, it's amazing if it's used right and BWG tries well, that you know it, I mean it, it is saying but it is actually uh, the thing uh, a pink is feminine and purple actually is masculine uh, so that's that's where that comes from yes in case you didn't know it's not blue that's masculine it's uh, purple uh, that's a masculine uh, color right there. Um, it's not it. From what colors? But I mean, let, let's not get into that debate right now. But yeah, <laughs> what you can say is, uh, yeah, basically. I mean, the, I mean, it, it's quite simple. Sex isn't gender. Uh, that that's the big talking point. Um, so um, yeah. I mean, but but what on the racing cars? On on the purple yes, racing on, cars? On the racing cars, have... we need most definitely more pink. We need most definitely more purple, and we most definitely need more cars that aren't black. Edward. Black cars are fun. I mean, if you, if you make it work out quite well, it, it I mean, can work out beautifully. Let, let's just say, uh, there's one thing that you always need to do, and that's stand out. And if all the cars around you are black, and you're black, you don't stand out. If all the cars around you are white, and you're white, yeah. you're not going to stand out. So, um, we're seeing most definitely a trend towards cars that are more standing out, like, for example, Arnaj, with that. Yeah. Pink livery. Uh, there are more and more teams that uh, decide to go down that route of being able to stand out. Like, for example, Roman Show, they, they are orange, they are purple as well, like Granda, for example, as well, but they, they have more black in them, and uh, Granda has more white in them, and all of that stuff. But uh, we're also starting to see um, cars that are more towards tailored towards the sponsors like for example like we have on the screen right now Kwanda with the lego technic esports team they have a lego technic inspired car we have the team bmw bank cars that are still having uh the uh bs competition inspired livery what? that's a big one that's a big one that's one of your leading contenders that's the Kwanda 92 lego technic car involved in a major shot thankfully they are able to walk away from that without much damage but you can't quite tell if there's much damage or not because frankly with the lego technic livery it looks awesome but you can't quite tell if there's damage on the car or not let's watch again we will see the replay in a couple of seconds but what has happened is that they have lost their position to team red line oh that not was their Fuga. fault at all not their fault at all the Fuga sim sport car moved across slightly I wonder why that happened. Uh, that they they really touched the grass, they touched the grass on brake. They lost a little bit track there of where they were in the braking zone, touched the grass, and that's why they they have that uh, big move over to the right oh. side trying to save their car. And sadly, the Lego Esports team was right there, and that means Team Redline, easy pass for them, moving up into second place, just 1.6 seconds behind the VRS Kwanda Sim Sport number 91. Oh man, this is a biggie. Uh, thankfully, they're not falling down by quite a fair bit. The damage seems to be okay. And we will qu quickly check again on their lap times. We can really get a good idea of that in a little bit. But this is huge. This could basically take them out slightly because that has easily lost them around a few odd seconds. And, and in this battle, when you're so, so tightly matched with everybody, this does not help. This is just absolutely... Not a disaster in a way in a sporting sense, but yeah, a bit of a big uh, punch in the gut for VRS Quinta Sim Sport right now and their number 92 car. Still all well at the top though, but they are very, very easily and very, very consistently, Stefan, losing time to the Red Line 71. It's only a matter of how much they end up losing at the end, isn't it? As we once again see the replay, who was it that they nearly take? Oh, it was, oh, it was nearly oh, the ASR X Able Racing, I think that was. That they nearly took out driving backwards across the track. Yeah, exactly. It could have been a bit crazy. Could have been a lot, lot worse. Thankfully, all okay. No touching of the, 
No touching of the barrier. And there's Javier Guerrero coming up with the comment of the day. There are three Lego pieces on the track. This. <laughs> yeah, but the good thing is, uh, quickly jumped out of the car, uh, collected those three pieces, put it back on the car, and is driving away again, seemingly untouched. As there we go, on board with Jonas Wallmeier, spectating that one. Uh, missing his apex a tiny little bit because of that second point missed as well because that was the 99 to the inside of himself there but yeah thankfully seems like the 92 of the lego tech in esports has lost any more lego pieces than those three and seems to be able to continue on their track it's gonna be crazy i i almost got worried about what's gonna happen in the race for them later on but no thankfully not too bad and now look at this, it's the Quanda leading car that's coming up towards traffic and now this just means that the Red Line 71 machine can get ever closer and use the traffic to their advantage to get slightly up ahead. It's Mitchell de Jong versus Jonas Wallmeyer in the Quanda 91 against the, well, against the Red Line 71. And, and as I mentioned early on folks, if you're just joining in, this is a lot like Real Madrid versus Barcelona in the world of sim racing. Except it's not the La Liga, it's the Premier League where all the other teams can also come up and beat them on any given day. But I say why they're the Real Madrid and Barcelona of sim racing. Firstly, they've got two stars in them. I mean, uh, Rogers for Coanda has been their main guy and De Jong also is coming across very closely. But for Redline, Benike always been the top man. There's been Vecchio, there's been Walmeyer, everyone closing in. But Benike remains as the standout. Two different approaches of running the team, by the way. Coanda have their own team house. Redline, it's all, it's all virtual. It's all virtually operated. And in the World Championships as well, they've been constantly fighting against each other. But we don't get to see them battle each other nearly as enough as we would like to see in endurance races. Finally here, they're here. It feels like an all-star clash, this one. And I like this. I like to see how things are working out right now. And the strategy is also going to be very impressive. Red line, slightly different. They've got fresh rubber, so they ideally should be able to get past Coanda right now. But are they going to sustain it? That's the main question. Coanda double stinting for the 91 and the 92. Finally double stinting, by the way, because uh, for a long time they refrained from it. And maybe that was just the reason why they lost all that time to Red line. You know... You, you you say they are Barcelona versus Real Madrid. Yeah. You do realize who won La Liga last year, right? It was a, that's my point. That is yeah. exactly my point. You've got teams <laughs> like Apex, Bilo, who can be like the Atleticos and well, in the Champions League. It's like um, it's of the other. Way. I mean, you know, you, you're saying it can be like the Atleticos. Uh, Atletico is. It, it might not be the biggest team in Madrid, Apex is but big. technically. It is the biggest team uh, that uh, Spain has, even though a lot of people don't realize it. Uh, but that's a much different story, uh, especially because they don't have to be that much in depth to be that good. Um, <laughs> which which obviously isn't the case for Redline and Coanda, that they're massively in depth, that they're, they uh, have four times the depth than they actually have money available to themselves. Um, yeah, no, it, there can always be that underdog uh, that snipes away a win or even just a podium, and that can already be hurting quite a bit. Um, yeah. If you are a Kuanda or a Team Redline uh, team, then you always have that expectation to win everything you see. Um, and then even a second place isn't a very good result for yourself, even though exactly. you might show it on uh, social media as a very good result for yourself, uh, you know that there was more in it, that you should have been there when it counted. And this is right now where it counts. How long can Guanma keep behind that Team Red Line? Or will the Team Red Line snap away that first place right here into the chicane? They seem, seem very racy, so it might happen already in this lap. Getting closer. They're not going to make the move at Bloshima, of course. Thank goodness they're not. Could have been a bit crazy. Imagine. Um, of course, knocking on wood as I say that, but imagine if, if the two leaders try to make a move at Loshimo, there's a, there's a very good chance it might not work out. And <laughs> you might just have somebody else coming up and picking up the pieces, the Lego pieces from there, if you know what I mean. But yes, that's not going to happen. These two drivers, Mitchell De Jong and Niels Wallmeyer, far, far smarter than that 
to make a move right there but they are getting closer i think this could be the chance you know this very well seems like the moment that we see the changing of the guard again with walmire moving past mitchell de jong right now back in the slowly following them behind the lego technic car but not close enough here we come then using the draft and using the power of the ferrari which has been quite phenomenal here today Jonas Wallmeyer puts the inside line and takes the lead again for red line. Now the fun begins. With around 20 minutes left in their stints, how much damage can Coanda limit? They are double stinting. Their tyres are nearly not as fresh as those on the red line car. But if red line double stint, they will be also having worse rubber in the next stint. That is the chance when the Coanda Porsche can catch up. But add another factor into the mix, the night. And that just changes everything, Stefan. Yeah, it very much does change everything. Um, but it could also change nothing. You know? <laughs> As I said, yeah. uh, the night time in an endurance race is so special because it can change everything or it can change nothing. You never know what's in the bag for you. Thus, you have to always keep on your toes, not on your heels. So, um, it's gonna be very interesting now, especially what do they do with traffic. They have quite a bit of traffic right now around themselves. So still at least two cars, uh, at least right now, that they have to lap those two. And then you also have, I think that's Mivano right behind them. They look rather fast and it seems like they, they're nearly being held up here by the stricken Kuanda car. Stricken in the sense of the time, of course. Yeah, yeah exactly. Not much to do right now for them. Just got to try and make sure that they stay where they are and not lose too much time to redline, which can be quite the hard ask right now in this case as well. Quick check up on where the other manufacturers are as well. Of course, Ferrari for redline, Porsche for VRS Coanda Simsport. Where is the first BMW? First BMW is with William C Sports and P8, who frankly have been doing a wonderful job of keeping that BMW right there. The Lamborghinis are up there with Apex Racing Team. And, and Apex, Apex were disadvantaged in a way by BOB somewhat. But I'm amazed that they're just the best Lamborghini by far and away. There's just nobody close to them. Yeah, very much so. And uh, yeah. I mean, you can already see Kuanda is starting to lose out on Team Redline here. Uh, starting to drop off quite a bit at the pace here that Team Redline is putting out, not being able to follow it by Kuanda. And also, if, if Mivano is able to overtake Kuanda, that will be even worse because then that yeah. car will drive away and they're going to lose more and more time. That part of the race where strategies are evolving, battles are turning up. And speaking of the manufacturers, the first Audi is the Beale Racing Team Euronix. 46 machine champions of the 24 HE Sports this past season. A team that's absolutely stunning in the way they operate, but just not able to make sure how things are working out. So, where do they go then? Where can they make this didn't end up eventually for Bila because it's been a it's been a constant question that we we're asking ourselves. Where could Bila be had they not started from the pit lane? There's a genuine chance they might be somewhere in the top five, but not enough time to wonder about that as this race matures and goes on up ahead. But hey, I know I know something fun as we approach the last ten minutes of our commentary stint with Stefan and myself, with with Conry Maddock, David Haynes, and Lorenzo Bonda joining in in a few minutes. Let's speak about a few fun facts about Spain and you know. There's an actual upgrade coming in very, very soon, Stefan. Uh, some 80 million euros of upgrades that are going to come in at Spa. That's actually going to make sure that Spa can host motorcycle races and it will have a grandstand on top of Orusian Radio. That's yep. going to come up in a, in a year or two. And, and that'll be mad. With, with gravel traps at La Source, Radio, Blanchimo, Lecombe and Stavlo as well. Yeah, very much so, and that's going to be really interesting. Also, it's going to make uh, the spa racing a little bit safer in that uh, area, because especially, uh, I don't know if you guys mentioned that, but uh, the real-life Spa 24 saw an incredibly huge crash 
uh, right there at the top of Ravignon where two drivers had to uh, be brought to the hospital. Nothing uh, uh, very serious in terms of injuries, but uh, two drivers had to go to the uh, hospital, which uh, were Aitken and Regan, if my memory serves me. David Regan, no. And it's so good to hear they're okay. So good to hear they're okay. We, we often end up uh, taking safety for granted, don't we? Yeah, and I mean, uh, you know, that, that good news comes with a little bit of a bad taste because we also had a horrible crash uh, today at Brands Hatch uh, where one car rolled over the Amco barrier and hit a no. Marshall Post in turn one uh, where sadly uh, one of the marshals that got hit by the car uh, has passed away uh, 30 oh, minutes ago. No. Oh no. Oh. So, a little bit of a terrible day today for a racing in general with the uh, loss of a track marshal's uh, marshal at Brands Hatch. But yeah, it's those kind of things that you have to forget about and concentrate because you yourself have a very important race uh, ahead of yourself. Yeah, no, this is uh, a bit overwhelming. This. Firstly, uh, I mean, I know there's a good chance they might not be watching this one, but a hundred percent strength to their family. It's such a such a hard yeah. situation to be in. You, you can't even imagine what that feels like. You're obviously not right there. So full full strength to them, and I hope they're able to hope they're able to get back on track very very soon. But that that's just such such sad news coming in from Brands Edge. But folks. I think in, in the memory of that track, Martian, we can focus on this race up ahead and hope that we can put up a good show because that is just just atrocious to hear. But a reminder of how dangerous motorsport can be. And, and I'm, I'm genuinely so grateful that in the world of sim racing, yeah, we might not be able to experience those G-forces, but safety-wise, things are 100% perfect. Well, then. I mean, the, the good thing is in, in, in sim racing, uh, that the worst thing that can happen to you is that you either set your drive, drive wheel to the full 20 newton meters or somebody comes up behind you and throws a pillow at your face when you crash. Um, and that's a good thing about sim racing because that's the most horrible thing that can happen to you um, in that kind of sense. And I think that that's also why sim racing is so popular for, you know, just keeping your feel, uh, your, your senses warm. Uh, in, in the names of Max Verstappen and Lando Norris, uh, we all know that they do sim racing. Yeah. Uh, and that's just the point of it. You can keep your senses sharp, you can keep your uh, your hands quick uh, without needing to put yourself at risk of getting an injury if you crash. Because sim racing, you don't have any worries about that uh, because your car crashes only virtually and you can step out to your seat and grab yourself a coffee. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, this is just heartbreaking news, really. It's just so hard to digest this one. All things are happening right now, but hey, uh, I think I think it's good that we focus more on this race. And uh, I mean, it's hard to put that beyond us because it's such an emotional moment. But I just hope that the family of the Martian are able to uh, get up from this and are able to recover very, very strongly. But I'll tell you who's recovering well right now. It is MSI Esports. They, they've been closing up to the number 72 red line, but is it good enough? Is it what they wanted? Not quite, to be honest with you, uh, because MSI were in the fight for P number two. MSI just haven't quite been able to save fuel in the same way. And that has been one of their primary downfalls so far in this race right now. And I mean, of course, I'm having a lot banged up on them because they were my pick to win this race eventually. But seriously, it, it just, they need a lot more from that Ferrari. I don't think it's more of a car thing. It's just that they're not able to do what Redline are doing. And, and just puts into perspective that Redline are just being superb with the way they're racing today. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, sixth place, I, like, if, if it stays just like this in sixth place, I mean, they have been up there. Uh, fighting for second and third, uh, but that was also because of pit strategy. I don't think that MSI is going to be very upset with where they are right now. Um, however, obviously we know that they are on, I think, the same strategy tire-wise yeah. as the 71 
if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, so that technically also puts them on the forefront against both uh, Kwanda cars. And those Kwanda cars are only, what is that, 9 and 13 seconds up the road from them. So, quite honestly, for MSI, that podium, it's not out of reach whatsoever. It certainly isn't. They need a little bit more though. With the 92 car slightly damaged, they're not losing any time by the way after their big spin, the number 92 Lego Technic car. But yes, they are getting closer uh, bit by bit. And yeah, I think on the whole, it, it will take a little bit more. Apex have also shown out to be such strong competitors so far today. And they're pushing the Lamborghini to places where ideally you wouldn't end up seeing because of POP. So full shout out to them on how they have been working it on with that. But yes, still, still some fun battles. TV1 Triton has to be commended though. They've just raised the entertainment levels and all times. Constantly in a fight with someone. This time they're fighting with Pure Sims right now for this position. And getting past is Pure Sims for number 14. Is that a slowdown I see right there? TV1 are much, much slower. Yeah. And Arnage will also get past. I think that's a slowdown for them. Oh boy, and so DB1, instead of being in P15 where they should be, they're now in P number 16. The, the perils of a slowdown, just how close the competition is right here in the spot 24 hours is evident. One slowdown penalty, you end up losing the two teams in one shot. Yeah, and, and I mean, they're also quite close to Logitech G Altus right behind them in 17th place, so uh, they might even be under threat a little bit of losing that 16th place to Altus Racing as well. Yep, exactly. And I'm very intrigued, Steph. Why has Altus not been able to challenge for higher positions so far today? I mean, we normally end up seeing them fighting very well in the top 10, but is that a case of them perhaps just not able to get the grips with the car as well? It might as well just be the Lamborghini, because if you think back seven days, um, the Lamborghini in the iRacing Spy 24 also hasn't been very competitive there as well. I mean, we saw the 450 of Bila Racing. Uh, that Wars was able to drive inside the top five, uh, but in the end, that was all they had, and that was also a little bit of luck with strategy and traffic. Um, so, in all reality, I don't think that that it's much about them, but just much more about what the Lamborghini is able to put out here at Spa for uh, especially with those prolonged. Uh, fast corners, that's just not the, where the Lamborghini is strong. That's a little bit more for the Audi, but the Lamborghini is struggling there a little bit more. Uh, and, and so, because you have a lot of corners at Spa that are exactly of that characteristic, mid to high speed, fast yeah. sweeping corners, uh, it, it's just against all the strength of that Lamborghini. Things are not working out well right now for the Lamborghini, but Apex Racing are just able to make it work. Which is absolutely amazing, considering how this race has gone so far for all the other cars in the Lamborghinis. Things are fun, reaching the R mark again. Just the last couple of minutes until Stefan Schlacker and myself, Samuel Aurora, will be in the commentary booth. But we will be joined by David Haynes, Conry Maddock and Lorenzo Bonda. That's a while later. Here comes Altus Esports and not making move on Triton right now. But as we, as we approach the end, Stefan, the first quarter has gone past. The pit window will be starting in the next couple of minutes. Your thoughts? Your thoughts on what the race has been like so far and, and what we can expect to see later on? Because honestly, it may look like a bit of a red line walk away right now, but, but there's genuinely a potential for Kwanda to, I wouldn't say pull off the upset, but do what they usually do with red line, push them hard to the edge. Yeah, it most definitely has been intriguing six hours thus far. Strategy play has been incredible from the start of this race, obviously, Kuanda. Uh, not taking double stints until uh, this very stint here, and then only on the number 91. Uh, it, it, it's been a little bit of a weird story. 92 taking, uh, not, uh, taking the tires and not being able to be as fast as the 91 is also very strange on that regard so a lot of things to still work out Kuanda is a little bit out there in terms of strategy really don't know what to think about them and what their pace really says about them right now as so we have a little bit of a contact between them in 16th place 
that got crazy. Alt is on the way to pass. The DV1 tried on team. They just made a slight bit of contact and honestly, a little bit more and you could have seen a huge accident all the way at the end of Ploshing but thankfully they are okay and this means that the battle resumes. Ring the bell, ding ding ding. It's time for round number two of Altus versus DV1. A send down the inside of the source. Is it overcooked this time? Not quite, but the cutback could be on the cards right here for DV1 Triton. This is amazing. Look at the swerving. Look at the moving. This is just ridiculous defending right now by the Altus team. And the Triton team is just not discouraged on the back bumper of the Altus car. This is the place that could favor the Triton car because right now they get the draft and they could have the position at the end at Lecom. Seriously though, that weaving was just quite something else and the aggression levels, they have been turned up to 11. Right, yeah, that was trying. most definitely... Sorry. Uh, yeah, that was most definitely to show the disagreement with what the people want in there, but uh, that... That was quite the shot in the foot there by uh, Logitech G Altus right there for 16th place. I don't know who is driving right now behind the wheel of that 43, but I'm very sure that they have just inquired themselves a protest for weaving. <laughs> they certainly have, and and, and Piotr will certainly be <laughs> not amused. Let's put it that way. There, there's there's such a crazy move that one and, and of course you might expect him to say well that's that's unfair that is too hard and aggressive defending but thankfully we've got live race controls they will be giving their answers on that as things happen but that was i like this you know i, I don't think we've seen this level of intensity so far in the race right now Stefano. this is awesome to see uh, that uh, teams are willing to defend it to another level i i, I quite honestly yeah, we have seen that. Now we don't need to see it again because that yeah, was exactly. just complete stupidness uh, from Logitech G Altus. I mean, it was already stupid to go for the inside right here before Blanchimont at Curve Path Rare uh, because, quite honestly, there was not enough room to fit one Lamborghini Huracan to the inside of that Audi R8. And they nearly did spin around the DB1 Triton car. So, most definitely not something that I want to see ever again from anybody on this track. Yeah, a bit too hard defending right there from Altus, but they got the position, and for them, all that matters. So, watch out right now. In a couple of minutes, you might see pit stops coming all the way through. Bina coming up to lap. Uh, is that the Phoenix Racing car, isn't it? So, yeah, that'll be, that'll be fun. And they've been tagging along with Williams all the way through in this race so far. Easy, nice and clean for them. Suddenly, the intensity has become slightly less. Which is nice to see. I mean, that got a bit too crazy in the last couple of moments. That that really did. And now, it's all about pit stops, who boxes. Of course, uh, time for a quick bet. Our G Sports are going to be the first one to box. Hey, hey, in the next couple of minutes. Yes. They, they should soon pit here, uh, Logitech G Altus. So that's going to be a little bit of a weird story uh, to follow how that's going to play out for these guys. Um, do, 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 con do continue on what I was saying uh, about how this race has shaped out and will shape out, or how I think it will continue to shape out. Um, as I said, Kwanda, very weird strategy right now, not being able to go for double stinning for so very long, where Team Redland has been uh, double stinting quite efficiently up to that point. Uh, obviously, we have the Wild Horses uh, with Apex with MSI, where we don't really know how they're going to shape up. MSI, the 41, uh, 47, is on the same strategy as the 71 of the red line. And if they continue on their tracks and Kuanda continues to struggle kind of with their strategy uh, play out, then MSI could swoop around and take away that second place that Kuanda right now is holding and if that would be happening I think the 98 of the Apex Racing Team has also the chance of swooping away that um, the podium from a VRS Kuanda same sport as there we go uh, Roman Groshaw goes into pit lane they are the first ones to pit uh, with the Williams Esports 25 on the immense fuel saving strategy always the last one by quite some margin to pit uh, each and every stint so lots of things to consider 
going into the next 18 hours. Exactly. So that's going to be interesting. RAG, of course, coming in with the Porsche. They've had a bit of a crazy race so far. Not exactly what they wanted. And they got tag team so many times. They lost positions. But I think it's just a case of they're not just being able to find that rhythm in uh, from the very beginning. Uh, we know that RAG sports are a team to contend with and always to fight for the win. But right now, not been working on Apex Racing, by the way. Swooping ahead of the Lego Technic car before Blanchimo. Now, that is... Very, very interesting. They've been closing up on that gap consistently, Apex Racing Team, but to make that move before Bloshimo and to move into the podium places is huge. Remember though, Lego Technic car has got damage, so they can be excused slightly. That's a good move. Apex are just, just making that Lamborghini work so, so well. Well, yes, and... No, I mean, yes, they're right now in third place, but uh, the really telling story will be that nighttime racing, um, where we have seen Vila also be very strong in the uh, racing 24. So uh, I, I think that, uh, the, and that's why I'm saying yes and no here. Uh, they are in third place, which is already quite good, but I think. Uh, that Apex Racing Team still has more to come in the night stint, so uh, if, if you're planning on staying uh, awake for these 24 hours, or at least very long into the night, I think that 98 will be the car to watch. I think it will be as well. Uh, the 98 has been pushing hard and has been consistently pushing the limits of what you might expect to see with the Lamborghini and it's been fun to see them on their journey so far. And rightly mentioned, Bila is also a very, very good car in the night. They won the 24 HG Sports Championship early on this year in a very, very tough fight and their strategies was what made them so, so strong. So keep a keen eye on them, keep a keen eye on Williams because they've been going on an ultra, ultra, uh, what can I say, frugal saving strategy and that's been working out so, so well for them. Meanwhile, good defending again. And now I'm interested to see how the LEGO Technic car responds. Because right behind them is the MSI Esports car. And this will be for the first time in this race so far that the LEGO Technic car will drop down to P number 5. The worst they've been in is in P number 4. If this happens, if MSI are able to get past, which they will at Blanchiment, don't you try that right there. But some good respect being given by the LEGO Technic team. And so MSI cleanly swoops past into P number four and gives Lego Technic their worst position of their worst position so far in this race. They, they've not gone worse lower down. So now it's all about how do they bounce back? The double stinting now, they'll be coming into the pits for a fresh set of rubber. And traditionally that Porsche has shown greater greater pace in this stint in relation to the other cars, but it's more on how you can sustain that pace that matters so much in a situation like this one. Have they got that in that car? Have they got enough pace in that car after that damage and that crash? Yeah, that is the big question. They do have, it seems like, a little bit of air damage. They are a little bit slower than uh, what they are capable to do right now. Obviously, it's going to be the big question how much damage they have in option repair soon. We're all going to find that out, but you're not going to find it out with Summer and I. Exactly, folks. Here we are at the end of the first quarter of the race. And this just means that it's the end of the commentary stint for myself and Stefan Schlacker. It's been fun. It's been fun commentating for you here on Racebot TV. And as we leave, it's an interesting talk. Just think about it. How can Coanda bounce back? How can the Lego Technic car come up in this next stint with fresh rubber? Do they have enough picks? Well, folks, it's been myself, Samuel Arora, and Stefan Schlacker. Time for a Racebot TV fan immersion. Stay right here as we switch streams. And you'll be joined in by Conry Maddock. David Haynes and Lorenzo Bonda. And I'm going to be listening in because I love listening to all three of them all together at once. So stay right here and we shall see you soon.